Now, Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes, is proud to present Gunsmoke. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It's easy to do your whole tribe a big favor, Mother. Just for every big and little Indian in your camp, a breakfast bowl full of Post Toasties. Post Toasties, you know, are the heap good cornflakes. They're the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Fresh as fresh can be. Say, Post Toasties are crackling crisp. Sweet kernel corn flavor. Toasted. That's Post Toasties. Post Toasties are packed with nourishment, too. A bowl of Post Toasties with sugar and milk helps your big braves and little Indians start the day right. Get Post Toasties soon. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. <laughs> You're a stranger in Dodge, Marshal. Well, I've only been gone a week, Sam. Hey, you got any rye left? Kitty over there has got the last bottle, Marshal. Oh? I'll have some tomorrow when Santa Fe gets in. Good. Meanwhile, I'll see if I can talk Kitty out of a drink. Sure. I heard you were back, Matt. How are you? Hey, uh, you've been saving that bottle for me, Kitty? You know, I never drink rye. <laughs> Thanks. Well, it's the closest I've been to civilization in a week. Did you find what you're after? Yeah, I found him. Yeah. What's that stuff you're drinking? First? Oh, here. Keep the bottle on the floor. It looks better. Now, let me see that. Professor Bone's Wonder Medicine. Celebrated vegetable pulmonic detergent. Well, I hope it tastes better than it reads, Kitty. <laughs> Tastes fine, Matt. Makes you feel fine, too. Essential oil of worm seed, a new and valuable curative. Professor Bone, Ph.D., and Pulmus. Professor of Practical and Medical Botany, Natural and Civil History. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Why the world you get a hold of this? Well, everybody's taking it, Matt. Oh, I forgot you were away when Professor Bone arrived. Huh? You mean he's here in Dodge? Sure. Came last Thursday. Got a fancy wagon they lectures from every day. But this time, as a matter of fact, you should hear him, Matt. He's great. Yeah, yeah. He must be. No, he really is. Well, what's in that tonic, Kitty? You're kind of misty already. Makes you feel great, Matt. Try some, here. Uh, no, 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 thanks. I, I don't need any worm seed oil. Liquor does me all the harm I need. You'll buy some once you've heard him talk. He's awful smart, Matt. Yeah, yeah, he must be. He's a professor. It says so on the bottle there. I don't care if he's a professor or not. He makes wonderful tonic. Yeah, I can see he does. Oh, uh, Matt? Oh, I'm glad you're back. Yes, you come with me. Oh, uh, hello, Doc. Sit down. No, you? you come with me outside. I want you to see this spectacle. Huh? Oh, well, what are you talking about? By this red-nosed old scarecrow, Loot Boom. He ought to be tarred and feathered, that's what. 
Oh, look. Look right there. There's a bottle of... Kitty, that's yours. It's good, Doc. Real good. I'm going to smash this bottle in the street. No. And if I find you drinking any more of it, I'll paddle you. That's what I'll do. Really, Doc? Oh. Oh, you see. You see what it does to people? Come on, Matt. Okay, Doc. I might as well find out what this is all about. You'll excuse us, Kitty? You, not Doc. I mean what I said, Kitty. Boy. Yeah, let's go, Doc. Uh, There, there's his wagon. And look at that crowd of fools. Well, what's so wrong with it, Doc? I'll tell you later. First, I want you to hear him talk. The man's demented, that's what. Uh, there he is, Matt, yes. You see, standing in the back of his wagon there. Yes. He's finished entertaining them now. We're just in time for the serious part. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. I discovered the formula for this famous elixir while serving as personal surgeon to the king of Santo Del Rio. Oh, that liar. Is he, Doc? Yes, time, Professor Bones' wonder medicine has cured more than 3,000 cases of ague, 2,500 of chronic inflammatory rheumatism, 2,000 of green sickness, 1,000 of mercurial diseases, 1,500 of liver infections, and 6,000 of general debility. Matt, he ought to be hung. It purifies, cleanses, and strengthens the fountain springs of life and infuses new vigor throughout the entire body. In fact, my friends, Professor Bones' wonder medicine will cure all disorders incident to the human race, without exception, no matter what the age, circumstance, or place of residence of the afflicted patient. Hey, Professor, I live on this stinking springs. Will it cure me? <laughs> You're drunk. What a day ever since I was weaned, Professor. I pity you, my friend. Professor, when I was 12, I got drunk and went to sleep at a hackerberry tree. I never did find out how I got down. <laughs> oh, don't laugh. Ladies and gentlemen, don't! Don't laugh! Pity the poor man, the poor wretch. Whiskey has him crushed in its foul trap. His eyes roomy, his brains awash, his manhood's gone. Are you shut up? Whiskey, I tell you. Whiskey did it. Any more talk about me, I'll put a bullet in you, Professor. Evil man, drunken specter. I'm telling you, no more. No! No more. No. Ladies and gentlemen, about to appear on the wagon beside me is a man you all know and respect. One of your finest and most worthy citizens. A man whose very presence contributes mightily to the progress of your fair town. A man whose soul is pure, but whose body... Ah, whose body has been the host of five separate diseases, any one of which would soon have been fatal. But now he is saved. Three bottles of Professor Bone's Wonder Medicine has done it, and, and here he is to tell you of this miraculous cure in his own words. Step forward, sir, and speak. Speak for the sake of your fellow man. Great heavens, Matt! It's Chester. Chester! Mr. Dunn. Get on from there. Why, yes, sir. But my dear sir, you've got to talk to the people. Hurry it up, Chester. Well, who are you, sir? Where are you going now? I'm going to no, come back here, you. Come back. Just go on with your lecture, Professor. Never mind about him. You should pick the wrong fine citizen, Professor. <laughs> hey, Professor. Yes, what? This here stuff of yours will cure anything? Anything, my friend. Every disorder known to the medical faculty. Well, my old man is 80, and he's got a beam stuck in his throat. Oh, <laughs> Don't I shut up all of you, it's for true. How about it, Professor Willis? I'll come to see your father, sir. I'll visit him as soon as I'm able to pass a few bottles down among the good people gathered here. Uh, thanks. Hello, Mr. Dillon. Doc? Come on, let's get out of here. Yes. Of all people. Let me give me some. 
I suppose he's got you all doped up with that stuff, too, Chester? Oh, it makes you feel great, Doc. Is that why you were up there? No, sir. I got a deal with the professor. He pays me $2.50 a day and gives me all the medicine I can drink. Free. It's idiots like you that made it possible for such quackery, Chester? Now, here, Doc, I'm not an idiot. You've been acting like one, but that's not what's important. Matt, I've analyzed some of Bone's so-called medicine. It's got opium in it, for one thing. Well, do you think it's dangerous, Doc? Of course it is. People can get in the habit, and what's worth is something is wrong with them, and they're taking the stuff they wouldn't find out until it's too late. You've got to stop this business, Matt. Yeah, I suppose you're right, Doc. Either you stop him or... Or by heaven, I'll shoot him. Now, I'm serious, Matt. All right, Doc, all right. I'll talk to him a little later. And meantime, you stay away from him, Chester. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Mr. Dillon. I didn't know. Unhappy wives, empty larders, naked children, lost cows, leaky roofs. That's enough, Professor. Bloody, bloody noses, broken shins, flat purses, and bad reputation. I said that's enough of that, Professor. Now get out of here before I break a bottle of good whiskey over your head. You, you are a destroyer of men. Agent of the devil. Oh, shut up. Nobody's going to preach against liquor in my place. I'll fix you. All right, hold it, Sam. Hold it. Uh, Professor Bone, I'd like to have a word with you. Uh, who are you, sir? I'm a U.S. Marshal. Mm. Now, uh, let's sit at a table over there, huh? Mm. Come on. I'm at your service, Marshal. Uh, uh, Watch you sit down. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, to what do I owe this honor, sir? It, uh, isn't exactly an honor, Professor. I want you to stop putting opium in that stuff you're selling. Oh, well, come now, Marshal. Surely you don't believe... Doc me. Adams has analyzed it, Professor, and either you make it harmless or I'm going to run you out of Dodge. <coughs> yes, yes, I believe you would. Now, you're free to sell it and you're free to do all the talking you want, but that's all. I'm, I'm a lonely old man, Marshal, and I'm tired of wandering. I'll do what you say. Good. I, uh... Hope you don't get into trouble with your preaching about liquor, Professor. I have been fighting against drink ever since I was a youth. Oh? Well, what about opium? Isn't that just as bad? Well, I don't sell enough to do any harm, Marshal. Maybe, but why are you so strong about whiskey? When I was a child of 12, my grandfather got drunk and threw a pet owl onto a horse that was standing nearby. What? And he did. And it frightened the horse into kicking an orphan boy broke the rim of his belly. That boy died, Marshal. Oh, oh, I see. Professor Bone? Ah, Mr. Reeves. Welcome, sir. And how is your good father? Marshal, I'm glad you're here. Oh, what's the trouble, Reeves? This here now, Professor, he's a trouble. I'll tell you. My old man, he had a bean stuck in his throat. The professor told me to give him a steam bath and then throw cold water on him. And I was doing it. Oh, what for? I well, suppose he'd catch cold and get a cough and bring up the bean. Oh, well, of all... But it didn't work, Mr. Reeves? It killed him. It what? My old man is dead. Dead? Good heavens, poor fellow. Now, I'm going to kill you, Professor. No, you're not. No, but no man can die of a mere cold, Mr. Reeves. Some, something must have gone wrong. Something went wrong, all right. Uh, come on. We'll get dark and go see what this is all about. And you'll get the idea of shooting anybody out of your head, Reeves. Maybe I will. What goes on at your house at breakfast? Well, you can take it from me. The best thing that can go onto your breakfast table is post-toasties. 
Yes, sir, Post Toasties, the heap good cornflakes. Those golden crisp cornflakes are the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. You know how to prove it? Just pour out breakfast bowlfuls of Post Toasties for your whole tribe. Then watch how they enjoy them. Post Toasties are crisp and tasty. From the first bite down to the last spoonful, that sweet kernel corn flavor makes your breakfast. So always ask for Post Toasties, the heap good cornflakes. Post Toasties, heap good cornflakes. The best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Heap good cornflakes. Post Toasties, heap good cornflakes. Remember, Post Toasties is one of the famous triple wrapped Post cereals, guaranteed fresh or triple your money back. Now back to Gun Smoke. Professor Bone wasn't a normal, everyday type citizen. But he wasn't a murderer, either. And whatever had gone wrong and killed Reeves' father couldn't be blamed entirely on him. Reeves had been a fool to follow his advice in the first place. Doc told him so, too, in as many ways as he could think of. We found the old man still lying in the steam bath Reeves had made. All he'd done was to dig a big hole in the ground with a fire pit in the middle and then stretch some canvas across the top for a roof. Doc climbed down into it, and after a few minutes, he came back out again. Uh, well, Reeves, all I can figure is your father died of a heart attack. I don't believe it, Doc. That old man was strong as a bull. Well, I know that, but there's nothing else that could have caused it. How long did you have him in there, Reese? Oh, maybe half hour, Marshal. He was having a fine time when I left him. He poured a whole jug of vinegar on them rocks. I went up to the house to get some more. Oh, wait a minute. What'd you say? Uh, vinegar? Sure. Professor here said it'd help him to sweat. Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yes, I thought so. Well, it's the vinegar that killed him, Reeves. What do you mean? That's limestone you used in there, isn't it? Well, limestone is All right. You put vinegar on hot limestone, and it'll make acid gas. Well, and that's what suffocated your pa. I'll be... A... I, I didn't tell you to use limestone, Mr. Reeves. No, you, you can't blame me for that. No, but the vinegar was your idea, Professor, and I still say you murdered him. Now, wait a minute, Reeves. You're not being sensible. This thing was an accident, that's all. Huh? I'm not a murderer. I never hurt anybody in my you life. You don't even know what you do, you old fake. Selling that slop of yours loaded with narcotics. Did you tell him to stop that, Matt? Yeah, yeah, Doc. He said he would. My medicine is as pure as the dew, gentlemen. A newborn babe could drink Don't it. let me catch you giving Sandy newborn babes. I'm going to analyze it every day you're here. And I hope that won't be much longer. Oh, I'm a lonely old man, sir. The only home I have is in my wagon. Well, then go live in it somewhere else. Huh? You've caused enough trouble around here. Doc, take it easy on him. Am I to be banished from the face of the earth? Am I not a man like any other man? Do you think I have no heart, no feelings? No soul? Oh, why don't you just shut up and get out of here? I want to bury my old man. I would gladly help you in that task, Mr. No, Reed. sir. No, sir, not you. Not by a long sight. You are unkind, sir. Gentlemen, I take my leave of you. Good day. For some reason, the three of us stood there in silence and watched Professor Bone walk away. He stopped once and glanced back at us for a moment. Probably 
way, that'd be the last that we'd see of him. Dodge was fairly quiet that night. And when somebody reported seeing a fire of some kind out on the prairie, I decided I might as well ride out and have a look. There's no flames left, Mr. Dillon. I guess it must be all burned out. I don't remember a house of any kind around here. I wonder what it was. Well, maybe just a prairie fire that didn't get really started. Yeah. Oh, there's something, Chester. Over there. Yeah. I can see a few coals. Why, it's a wagon, Mr. Dillon. It's all burned up. That's Professor Bones' wagon, Chester. I can only see you're right. That's his horse, too. Professor! Professor Bones? Now, let's take a look here. Where in the world could he be, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. Uh, uh, look out now. I'm going to move some of this. Yeah, I'll help you. Look. Look right there. Yeah. You think that's a professor? I'm afraid so, Chester. Poor old fella. He must have been asleep and his wagon caught fire. Maybe. Funny he couldn't get out, though. Unless he was drunk or something. Professor Bone didn't drink, Chester. That's right. I forgot. He sure didn't. Say, you think maybe somebody did this, Mr. Dillon? Well, he had two or three men pretty mad at him. Yeah, or, or maybe it was Indians. Oh, not this close to Dodge. No. No, I guess not. I don't know, Chester. A lot of things can happen to people who get too lonely. Oh, come on, let's get out of here. We'll take care of him in the morning. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's adventure on Gunsmoke. Say, exciting things happen to breakfast when there's sugar crinkles at every place. Sure, new sugar crinkles make breakfast more fun than a circus. You know why? Sugar crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Not too sweet, the way some sugar-coated cereals seem to be, and not like others that aren't sweet enough. Sugar crinkles, every golden crisp nugget of them, is just right sweet. So try starting your day off just right with new sugar crinkles. And don't forget, when you're listening to the radio or watching television, sugar crinkles make great snacks. From the bowl or from the pack for your breakfast or a snack, sugar crinkles are more fun than a circus. Try sugar crinkles soon. They're the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. So better get several packages. Smoke under the direction of Norman MacDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Barney Phillips, Paul Dubob, and Lawrence Dobkin. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, avenges a killing during his fight to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Listen 
next week at this time when Gunsmoke will be brought to you by Sugar Crinkles, the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Now, Sugar Crinkles, the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet, is proud to present Gunsmoke. In the territory on the west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Take it easy, Mom. You know your young folks are going to eat when you give them sugar crinkles for breakfast. Yes, boys and girls love sugar crinkles. And no wonder, it's the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Makes breakfast more fun than a circus. Now, the reason sugar crinkles suit young folks to a T is this. Some sugar-coated cereals they've tried seem too sweet. Others don't seem sweet enough. But when they dip their first spoonful of sugar crinkles, mmm, they've discovered a sugar-coated cereal that's just right sweet. And say, those young folks of yours love to dip into the pack and eat sugar crinkles as a snack, too. So better get several packages. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. I got a horse to saddle, Mr. Dillon. I'm so hungry I could eat a whole hog. Well, all the hog you got this morning is cooking on that stick right there, Chester. Is it done? <laughs> that depends on how hungry you are. It's done. <laughs> sure will be good to get back to Dodge tonight and sleep in a bed again. Well, civilization's made you soft, Chester. Mm-hmm. Maybe so, but I get mighty tired of using my back for a mattress and my belly for a covering. <laughs> Obviously, Chester, you were born for greater things than rooting around on the prairie and living in the rain. It hasn't been raining, Mr. Dillon. No, no, it hasn't. But it will, Chester. Sooner or later, it'll rain. Yes, sir. Wish we brought some more bacon. Say, don't old man Granby live around here? Maybe we could borrow a little from him. Well, according to what I've always heard, old Granby wouldn't loan anybody anything. Mm. You really think he's a rich miser, like to say? Oh, I don't know, Chester. 
Sometimes a man's entirely different from his reputation. I only met Grampy once or twice. He seemed like a nice enough old fellow, though. Well, I wouldn't want to live out here all alone with nothing but a few horses for company. Oh, he's used to it. Well, even if he does have a lot of money hid away, there's no place to spend it out here. Grampy's pretty old for the pleasures Dodge has to offer, Chester. Well, I hope I am never that old. At the rate you're burning yourself out, Chester, you never will be, so don't worry about it. Oh, now, Mr. Dillon, I live mighty quiet for a young fellow who's free and still full of blood. <laughs> sure. Hey, look over there. Huh? Now, that string of dust laying right on the ground there. Yeah, I've been watching it, Chester. It's not on the ground, though. There's a dry wash runs along there. Somebody's driving stock down it. Maybe it's old man Granby. That may be. Let's go say hello, huh? All right, sir. If it is old man Granby, we might just ask him about a little bacon, huh? Well, we can ask. There's no harm in that. Oh. Hello. Now, that's horses down there, Chester. Yes, sir. I can see their heads now. I don't see anybody driving them. Now, they'll be along in a minute. Now, let's wait here. There he comes. Yeah. Hello! He stopped. That's not old, Granby. Let's ride down and say hello anyway. That's Granby's brand on those horses, though. He must have hired him a hand. Yeah, maybe. Hello. Hello. Are you working for Granby? I ain't working for nobody, mister. Oh? And where is he? Where is who? Granby. I don't know no Granby. Well, those are his horses you're driving. Oh, they are? Yeah. I ain't driving them. What do you mean? They got ahead of me in the wash here, that's all. I see. You a cowboy? Yeah, sure. I'm a cowboy. Well, you don't look like one. You don't ride like one, either. You're asking the questions, mister. No decent cowboy would run another man's horses down a dry wash just because he didn't want to get up on the bank and ride around them. I told you, they got in front of me, is all. How come you're not carrying a gun? Does a man have to carry a gun? No. I'll bet you're the only man within a thousand miles of here who isn't carrying one. Maybe I got a better conscience than the rest of you. Maybe. Look, mister, you've run those horses about five miles off of old Granby's place. You want to give us a hand, we'll run them back. I'm in a hurry. It won't take long. And the old man might be a couple of days finding them if we don't. You worry about him. i got to get in to Dodge. We'll ride in with you. Afterwards. I ain't going to do it. Look a lot better if you did. I, uh, I'd like to, mister, but I can't wait. I'm leaving now. So long. You gonna let him go, Mr. Wait Dillon? a minute, Chester. I'll let him hear what lead sounds like. Now, don't shoot! Don't shoot me! All right, then ride back here. Don't kill me, mister. I'm not gonna kill you. Unless you try to run away. Why would I try to run away? You just did. Chester. Yes, sir? Ride down the bank and have those horses off. Start them back up the wash. We'll be out of here by the time they're back. All right, Mr. Dillon. You stay right close to me, fella. Don't try anything smart. 
When we get to Granby's, if he says it's okay, then you can go wherever you like. I don't know Granby. Never been there. Well, we'll show you the way. Come on, let's get up on the bank. Old man Granby can find his horses all right now, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. But I want this cowboy here to meet him. We'll see if he's in the house. I'll wait for you. Get off that horse, fella. Go on. That's better. Come on. We'll take a look. Well, what are you waiting for? Nothing. You go ahead, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Looks like I'll have to herd this man in. You've been kind of balky ever since we ran into you, mister. I don't like being dragged around. I never did. I just want you to meet old Granby. He'll be grateful for you. Help him run his horses back here. I know what you think, mister. You think I was stealing them horses. Well, I never heard of the old man. I was never near this place. Yeah, so you told me. But you're here now. I ain't afraid of you or nobody. Then let's go into the house. Come on. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? Old man Granby, he... He's in there. Well, what's wrong? Right in the room there, Mr. Dillon. He's hanging there. What? Somebody's gone and hung him right in his own house. I, I don't want to see him anymore. You go take a look. Pull your gun and hold it on this man, Chester. If he makes a move, shoot him. Yes. Now, you just stand there real quiet like. I ain't going to do nothing. You sure ain't. Just because I happen to be in the country don't mean I killed nobody. Mr. Dillon will decide about that. Who is this Mr. Dillon, anyway? He's a United States Marshal, that's who. A Marshal? Looks like you run into the wrong people, fella. I'll hold your gun, Chester. Search him. All right, sir. Here. Get around. All right. Turn around. The house is all torn up. He must have been looking for old Granby's money. I was never in that house. There's nothing on him. Not a thing. All right, Chester. Here's your gun. Catch it. Thank you. All right, now, what's your name, fella? Tremble. Joe Tremble. Where are you from? Up north. Up north where? All over. What are you doing down here, Trimble? Making a change. Yeah, sure. And some cowboy you ran into told you about Granby being rich. So you came here and kicked the old man around and hung him. And then tried to find the money. That's a lie. This is the first time I was ever near the place. I'm sure you did it, Trumbull, but I wish I had more evidence. A court of law just might not convict you the way things stand. You gonna let me go? No. I'm arresting you. And you're gonna stand trial. And I'll do my best to see you hung. I didn't do it, I tell you. And I'll go free, too. You'll see. There's something mighty wrong about you, Trumbull, and I can't figure it at all. But I'll sure find out. Mother, it does your heart good, I know, when your young folks eat all of their breakfast cereal. That's why I'm so happy to tell you about new Sugar Crinkles. Sugar Crinkles, you know, is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. 
Crisp golden nuggets of sugar-coated rice. They make breakfast more fun than a circus. Why, young folks love sugar crinkles so much, they disappear like magic. Now, you've had experience with sugar-coated cereals that seem too sweet to you, and others that just don't seem sweet enough to the youngsters. Well, what a wonderful surprise sugar crinkles will be to your whole family. For new sugar crinkles really are just right sweet. Remember, sugar crinkles make great snacks, too. And there's even more good news about sugar crinkles. Right now, there's a full-size package of Charms, that wonderful fruit-flavored candy, in every special package of sugar crinkles your dealer has. Ten delicious fruit-flavored Charms, free of extra cost to you. So hurry. Get sugar crinkles soon as you can. Now back to Gun Smoke. <laughs> Joe Tremble dig a grave up behind the house. Then we laid old Granby in it and covered him with dirt. I was pretty sure now that the old man had never had an extra dollar in his life and that he'd been killed for no reason at all. Anyway, Tremble had done a pretty thorough job looking for the money and he'd found nothing. On the ride into Dodge, I tried to figure out just what he was. But he didn't seem to fit anywhere. He wasn't a cowboy or a hunter or a gambler or even just a drifter. After we got him locked up in jail that night, Doc and I went over to the Texas Trail for a drink with Kitty. And I was telling him about it. Now then, uh, this fella Trimble, uh, how old is he? Oh, around 25, I guess, Doc. Mm -hmm. Then he couldn't be running away from home. (laughs) No, he's a little old for that, Kitty. Well, anyway, they'll hang him. Well, I hope the judge agrees with you, Doc. Why shouldn't it? All I got so far is circumstantial evidence. But then you should have shot him out on the prairie. It's a good thing you're not a lawman. Well, maybe if I were, there'd be fewer killings around here. Uh, I, I doubt that, Doc. You going up to Hayes for the trial, Matt? Yeah, I'll have to, Kitty. That'll take a week, I suppose. Oh, Bob. What do you ask? Nothing, only you've just been away for ten days. Well, I have to earn a living, Kitty. You could make more money gambling right here in Dodge. Oh, no, Kitty, don't start that. Good evening, Marshal. Oh, Major. Ah, Good evening, Doc. Good evening, Major. Oh, I do, Major. I'd like a word with you, Marshal. Uh, sure, Major. <laughs> so we can go over to the bar then. Right. Uh, I'll be back, Kitty. Doc. Uh, no hurry, Matt. Doc's got a lot of money. Oh, I, now I'll buy you one drink, Kitty. Just one drink, and that's all. Well, it's a start, Doc. <laughs> Let's go, Major. I had to come to Dodge on other business, Marshal. But I wanted to pass the word to you that we're looking for a man. Oh, the army? Yes, a deserter. Oh? Not from Fort Dodge. Where was he stationed, Major? He was with the 7th Cavalry at Fort Lincoln. Oh, up in the Dakotas. Yeah, and for some reason they think he headed south. Now, I don't have much of a description of him, just that he was a private about... Four twenty-five, curly blonde hair, and uh, he had a scar on his left hand. Yeah, that fits. What's his name, Major? He enlisted as Joe Gould, but he's known to have used the name Trimble. Uh-huh. Well, he's right here in Dodge. What? I got him locked up in jail. <laughs> well, uh, that's fine, Marshal, but how did you know? I think he murdered an old man who lived a day's ride north of here. I'm going to have him tried for it. Well, that won't be necessary now, Marshal. I'll take over custody of him. No, no. Then he'd be tried at Fort Lincoln for desertion. I want him tried for murder. And i got to be there to present the evidence. You could go up to Fort Lincoln. No, the Dakotas are out of my territory, Major. Besides, this is a civil crime. The Army wants that man, Marshal. I'm sorry, Major. 
He's going to be tried in Hayes first. He is still a soldier, even if he did desert. Well, if the judge lets him off, you can have him. But not otherwise. Major, he tortured and hung an innocent old man, and I'm going to do my best to see him punished for it. Well, I'll have to take this up with my superiors, Marshal. Uh, you better hurry. I'm going to Hayes with him tomorrow. I hope you won't regret this, Marshal. I won't, Major. Not if Trimble is properly punished. I won't. I didn't wait till morning, but started off for Hayes with Joe Trimble that night. The trial lasted a week. And in spite of all the arguments I made, the judge finally decided that there wasn't enough real evidence to convict him. I even tried to make Trimble confess, but he was too smart for that. So there was nothing to do but bring him back, turn him over to the Army. I sent word to Fort Dodge, and the next morning the Major himself appeared to take him into custody. Well, Marshal, it looks as though you didn't have much of a civil case after all. Uh, he killed old Granby. I know he did, Major. But after all, the law's the law. Yes, and in the Army, orders are orders. I'm just sorry your judge didn't convict him after all. Oh, is that so? Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? Bring Trimble out, huh? All right, sir. Major, I'll give the Army credit for one thing. Mm -hmm. What's that? Tribble and I rode back some 80 miles yesterday, and when we got here, he <laughs> wanted to sit up and play cards with Chester. Well, well, there may be some bad men in the cavalry, Marshal, but they're all tough. Here he is, Mr. Dillon. Well, he's yours, Major. Private Trimble, sir. You're under military arrest, Private. Not privileged to salute. Besides, you enlisted as Private Gould, not Trimble. Yes, sir. Report to the guard outside. Yes, sir. Uh, just a minute, Trimble. You uh, know that you're mighty lucky, don't you? You should have died for what you've done. I told you I'd go free, Marshal. It'll catch up with you someday, Trimble. It always does somehow. That's all I wanted to say. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Marshal. I'll be getting along. Oh, uh, Major, hmm? uh, you said that uh, you were sorry that the judge didn't convict him. <laughs> Why have you changed your mind? Well, I have orders from General Terry to return him to the Dakotas, to Fort Lincoln. Well, he'll be tried there, but he won't be hung for just desertion. Now, oddly enough, Marshal, he won't even be tried. For some months, anyway. He won't? No. It seems that the 7th Cavalry needs every man available. They're leaving Fort Lincoln on an expedition against the Sioux in the northern Cheyenne. Oh, the Sioux, huh? Yeah. I wonder if old Sitting Bull is still the chief medicine man with him. Sitting Bull? Yeah. Well, I never heard of him. But I expect the Seventh will be heading into Montana Territory. Well, if they're after Sitting Bull's tribe, they will. He's always had a large camp over on the Little Bighorn. That's so? Yeah. Oh, by the way, who's in command of the Seventh Cavalry now? Oh, an officer I served under a couple of years. I never did care for him. A General Custer. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's adventure on Gunsmoke. You know, what you are tomorrow depends on what you eat today. So, Mother, be sure the big and little Indians at your house always eat a good breakfast. And tell me, what could be better for breakfast than post-toasties? Post-toasties, you know, are the heap-good cornflakes. 
the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. But all of the talking in the world couldn't tell you how downright delicious post-toasties are. You have to taste those crackling crisp flakes. Yes, you have to taste that sweet kernel corn flavor toasted. Then you'll know how perfectly wonderful breakfast can be. Put post-toasties on your shopping list right now, Mother. Just watch how your whole tribe goes for them. Remember, post-toasties are the heat-good cornflakes. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Next week at this time when Gunsmoke will be brought to you by Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes. Now Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes is proud to present Gunsmoke. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Say there, next time you hear a crackling noise in your kitchen, better get up and investigate. Maybe somebody just couldn't wait for his breakfast of crackling crisp post-toasties. And that's a treat you shouldn't miss. Post-toasties, you know, are the heat-good cornflakes. Why, after one taste, I'll bet anything you'll agree with me. Post Toasties is just the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. There's nothing quite like sweet kernel corn flavor when it's toasted right in. Toasted into crisp, fresh cornflakes. Man, oh man, that's Post Toasties. Heat good cornflakes. Better try them. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. figure it'll take us to drive this herd into Dodge after we cross the Cimarron, Larson. Well, depends on how hard you want to push him, Bryant. I hired you because I ain't been up here before. How far is it to Dodge? Oh, 50 mile, maybe. Uh, five easy days, then. I don't want to bring them steers in too poor. It's the men that's got poor this trip, not the steers. Uh, there's a lot of juice left in the men. Too much, maybe. Look at him. Oh, it's that old Indian that rode in a while ago. They're just having a little fun with him. They better take it easy. No telling how many warriors he's got waiting somewhere. Hey, Cotton! Yeah! 
Tell that Indian to come over here. I want to talk to him. Sure, Brent. Yeah, he probably just wants a steer out of the herd. Well, I'm tired of giving good beef away. You, boss, my name is Tobiel. Tobiel, huh? What do you want, Tobiel? I guide cattle on trail to Dodge. We don't need any guide, Chief. I know the trail. I have letter from men in Dodge. Yeah. You read. Letter tell you how good guide Tobiel is. Let's see your letter. Yeah. Old time guide. Many years with Army. Big scout. Well, why ain't you still with the Army then? Too old now. What can guide cattle on trail to Dodge? Very cheap. <laughs> Why, you old liar. Tobiel never lie. No? Listen to this, Lysen. To whom it may concern. The name of this noble red man is Tobiel. He's a liar, a beggar, and a thief. What he wouldn't steal, a hound pup couldn't pull out of a tan yard. Give him some cold grub or a three-cent drink, if you have any about you, and then run him out of camp. <laughs> Signed, R. Durbin, J.C. Weiser. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they sure wrote him a good letter. No, no, no letter can say that. They, my friends, they write letter, help me get job. What'd you try to steal off of them? Tobiel never steal. No? Well, I'll take the word of a white man any day. Larson, you heard what the letter says. Have the boys run them off. Wait, let her lie. They fool me. Tobiel, man with much honor among white men in army. This ain't the army. Run them off, I said. Come on, chief. I leave. I leave. Alone. You leave, all right. And get going. Yeah. But these men die for this. If anybody dies, it'll be you. Here he is, boys. Let's send them down the trail. Here comes Miss Kitty. Ah, so it is. Hello, Kitty. Hello, Matt. Chester. Miss Kitty? You're going to work a little early, aren't you? No, I'm just getting a breath of air. <laughs> sure is going to be a nice evening, ain't it? For you, maybe. Oh, is there anything wrong, Kitty? Just that trail hurt across the river. Dodge will soon be full of drunken cowboys, all looking for trouble. <laughs> we'll handle them, Miss Kitty, don't you worry. Er, <clears throat> at least Mr. Dillon will. Shooting them's easy. I gotta talk to them. Oh, you can always quit, Kitty. Sure. You do what? Teach Sunday school? <laughs> Boy, you might. You talk like a Texan yourself, Miss. You know what one of them told me once? He said I reminded him of his mother. He really said it. Well, that sounds nice, Miss Kitty. I thought so, too, Chester. Till he got real drunk and told me his mother was the first woman to be hung south of San Antonio. She was? Who hung her? Probably he did. Oh, now, Miss Kitty, no man would hang his own mama. Why, it just ain't... Marshal? Yeah? We come to warn you. Oh, uh -huh. Warn me about what, mister? My name ain't mister, it's Weiser. My partner's name here is Derby. I can tell him my own name, Weiser. Shut up. No. Marshal, that Indian's going to get himself hurt. What are you talking about? That Indian, across the street there. See him? Uh-huh. Now, that's Tobiel. You know him? What's the trouble, Weiser? He keeps following us around. Says he's going to kill us. Tobiel? That doesn't sound like him. Well, it's true. Tis, you, you asked me. 
He's been haunting us for four days. Just stands around staring at us and saying we're going to die. I'd have shot him long ago, but I hear that's against the law around here. Where are you men from? Wyoming Territory. Where'd you know Tobiel? We've been in Dodge a couple of weeks. Seen him around here. Now, what's the trouble between you? Well, we... <laughs> we played a little joke on him, is all. Made him mad, I guess. We told him he could get a job guiding trail herds into Dodge. Give him a letter. Yeah. He thought the letter said how good he was, but it really said he was a thief and to run him out of camp. <laughs> I see. And he tried to use your letter, is that it? I guess so. Went away for a couple of days, and since he got back, he keeps saying he's going to kill us. It's getting on my nerves, Marshal. I'll shoot him, sure. You'll shoot anybody, and you'll hang for it, wiser. Now, wait here. I'll go talk to him. I got to go to work, Matt. Okay, Kitty. I'll see you later. And you two heroes. You're pretty funny. I hope he does kill you. Why, you... Hold it. Wiser. Watch him, Chester. Yes, sir. Hello, Tobiel. Hello, Marshal. Tobiel, those two men over there say that you threatened to kill them. Is that true? They die. They told me the story, Tobiel. I'm sorry it happened. But uh, you can't kill men for that. Tobiel, old but still proud. You know what'll happen if you do kill them, don't you? You'll go to jail and probably hang for it. No. Tobiel, never in jail. Man with much honor. Look, uh, Tobiel, I got no use for Wiser and Durbin. Neither one of them could be much good, but the law is the law, and... Tobiel no kill. Tobiel's medicine kill. Make very strong medicine against them. Well, you work all the medicine you want, but don't you do any killing yourself. And stay away from them, Tobiel. You're making them jumpy. There might be trouble if you don't. Tobiel, not afraid. They carry guns, Tobiel. All you've got's a knife. Remember that. Yeah. I remember. All right. Tell him, Marshal? Yeah. You men didn't understand him. He's not threatening to kill you himself. He's making Indian medicine against you, that's all. Well... Well, then why does he keep say, saying we're, we're going to die? And why is he always following us around? He thinks his medicine will kill you. I guess he wants to be there when it does. There's no harm in it. And I'm warning you again, both of you, you leave him alone. You do anything to that old man and I'll throw you in jail. Look, Marshal, that letter that started all this, that was Weister's idea, not mine. It sure was. Any idea we've ever had's been mine. Oh? I never did need you, Derby. Oh, is that so? Who who did your dirty work up to Cheyenne? You did. Yeah. You fool. I sure did, and you still owe me for it. Ah, shut up. So you ain't gonna do nothing about that Indian marshal. I know Tobiel pretty well, and I'll personally guarantee his word. Nobody's gonna do anything about him, including you. Good day, gentlemen. Oh, good morning, Chester. Uh, good morning. Uh, m- Mr. Dillon, they just carried that fellow Weiser up to docks. What? Well, what happened to him? I don't know. Well, let's go see. Did you see him, Chester? No, sir. I just saw a couple men coming downstairs, and they said I'd better go get you. That's all they said. Oh, hello, man. What happened to Weiser, Doc? Well, for one thing, he's been stabbed, Matt. Oh? Bad? Bad enough to kill him. The men who carried him up here said they found him lying in an alley this morning. He's been dead, oh, three, four hours, I'd say. And there's something else, Matt. Take a look here. Why, somebody hit him on top of the head, Doc. No. No, they didn't hit him. 
He's been scalped, Chester. Indian style. Say, how are morning appetites at your house? Well, if they're pretty drowsy, here's a real good way to wake them up. Set a bowl full of Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes, at everybody's place. Just watch your folks take notice when they see how crisp Post Toasties are. And wait till they taste that sweet kernel corn flavor toasted in. Bet your whole tribe will agree with you. Post Toasties are the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. And here's a thought if you'd like to make a good thing even better. Try topping Post Toasties with your favorite fruit. You'll find that's a mighty good way to start the day. Fact is, it's a downright delicious way. So next time you shop, be sure to ask for Post Toasties. They're the heat good cornflakes. You'll see. Post Toasties heat good cornflakes. The best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Heat good cornflakes. Post Toasties heat good cornflakes. Now back to Gunsmoke. It was pretty hard for me to accept the idea that Tobiel had murdered and scalped Weiser. But the evidence seemed plain enough. The old Kiowa had been a highly valued army scout for over 30 years. And then had moved into a little hut at the edge of Dodge when he grew too old for active service. He'd lived quietly. And had never given anyone any trouble at all before... But Weiser and Durbin had injured his pride with their so-called joke. And Tobiel had evidently reacted in the only way he knew. Now I had to arrest him. Chester and I walked out to his hut. And just as we reached it, Durbin came running up. We told you, Marshal, didn't we? We told you that engine was going to kill somebody. Did you see it happen, Durbin? No, no, I, I went to bed. Why, sir, he, he was doing a little gambling. That dirty red skin, he got him on the way home. It hasn't been proved, he did it. Well, of course he did it. Who else would scalp a man? I don't know. Well, here, look at that here, Marshal. Look, he's right here. Red. Hanging right onto his hut like, like he was bragging about it. Well, Mr. Dillon, that's a scalp. Yeah. He's dying it in the sun is what he's doing. What a murdering devil. You two stay here. I'll see if he's inside. Yes, sir. Come outside, Tobiel. I've got you now, Tobiel. Let's string him up, Marshal. Right here. Shut up, Devin. Tobiel, did you kill Weiser last night? Weiser? Kill? Stabbed with a knife and scalped. He died. Durbin there, he died too. You see, Marshal? He even admits I told you to stay out of this, Durbin. Now tell me straight, Tobiel. Did you kill him? Tobiel, no kill. Tobiel's medicine kill. And what's Weiser's scalp doing there? Scalp? Right there. Yeah. Weiser's scalp, all right. Where's your knife, Tobiel? Here, my knife. Look out, Marshal. He'll use it. No, he won't. Give me your knife, Tobiel. Yeah. Yeah, That looks clean to me. Wait a minute. Well, of course, he's had plenty of time to get it clean. You think I kill Weiser with knife? Did you? Medicine kill Weiser. Tobiel no kill. Now, Tobiel, I'm going to have to arrest you. 
He'll have to go to jail. Jail? No. Tobiel, man with too much honor for jail. I'm sorry, Tobiel, but you'll get a trial. Well, let, let's hang him now, Marshal. Indians don't need no trial. I'm the law here, Durbin, and don't you start anything like that. Big disgrace. Tobiel in jail. Yeah, I know, but I... I can't help it. Chester. Get that scalp. We'll need it for evidence. Yes, sir. to go to supper, Matt? Yeah, I'll be right with you, Doc. Uh, Chester, you better stay here and watch Tobiel, huh? All right, Mr. Dillon. Uh, you can go eat when I get back. I'll see you later. Yes, sir. Well, I hear Tobiel's pretty unhappy about being locked up, Matt. Yeah, I had a long talk with him, Doc. I'm afraid he's going to be locked up for a long time. Oh? Why is that, Matt? Well, no judge will hang him on circumstantial evidence. But he'll probably go to prison. He hasn't any kind of an alibi, Doc. None at all. And if I know Tobiel, he'd rather hang than be in prison. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right. What's that? It came from the jail. Come on. Mr. Gillen? What happened, Chester? Somebody shot Tobiel right through the bars. Is he dead? He sure looked it. Let me take a look at him. All right, Doc. Get out the front, Chester, and come up the alley. Yell if you see anybody. I'll cover the back. Yes, sir. Mr. Dillon? All right, I'm coming, Chester. What is it? I saw Durbin. Oh? He ran out of the next alley and went into the Alpha Ganja there. All right, let's go get him. It must have been him that done it. Sure looks like it. There he is. Over at the bar. Get out of the way, Chester. Yes, sir. Darvin! You're under arrest, Durbin. Unbuckle your gun belt and drop it on the floor. What for, Marshal? For shooting Tobiel. I seen Chester standing there when I come out the alley. Should have shot him, too. Never mind the talk. Drop your gun. No. Shooting Tobiel was a bad enough mistake, Durbin. You finding out I did it was. Uh, see... I figured Tobiel must have saw me get wiser, and at the trial, he, he, he'd, he'd have started talking. No. He was home, alone, making medicine against you. He had no alibi at all. Then I, I killed him for nothing? If you hadn't killed him, he'd have probably been convicted. And you'd have gone free. Uh, look, Marshal, you can't prove that I, I killed Weiser. No. Well, and I ain't going to hang for shooting no Indian, not me. Don't try it, Durbin. Why not? You... You hit him both times, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Want me to take care of it? No. Somebody else can do it. Let you and me go give Tobiel a real fine burying, huh? I figure we kind of owe it to him. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's adventure on Gunsmoke. 
Say, Mother, want to see your small fry eat a better breakfast than ever? Well, may I suggest that you dish him up some sugar crinkles to start with? Sugar crinkles, you know, make breakfast more fun than a circus. Sugar crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. It's high time to forget these sugar-coated cereals that seem too sweet to you and those others that don't seem sweet enough to the kids. Just pour out crisp golden sugar crinkles and see how just right sweet a sugar-coated cereal can be. Just right sweet. Be sure to get several packages of sugar crinkles because they're great for snacks. Kids love them that way. Kids love them anyway. Try sugar crinkles and you'll love them too. Remember... New Sugar Crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Ralph Moody, Byron Kane, Frank Gerstle, and Harry Bartell. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gun Smoke. Listen next week at this time when Gunsmoke will be brought to you by Sugar Crinkles, the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Now, Sugar Crinkles, the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet, is proud to present Gunsmoke. City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Say, if there ever was a cereal designed to boost a family's breakfast morale, it's new sugar crinkles. Why, that sugar rice treat that's just right sweet makes breakfast more fun than a circus. Come breakfast time, just pour on milk, and you've got a breakfast main dish as you like it. Those golden nuggets of sugar-coated rice we call sugar crinkles are really special. Not too sweet, the way some sugar-coated cereals seem to be, and not like others that don't seem sweet enough. Sugar crinkles really are the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. And whether you eat them from the bowl for breakfast, from the pack as a snack, or both ways, you love sugar crinkles. Try them soon. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. mail, Mr. Dillon. Oh? That looks like official stuff, Chester. Yes, it is. All for you. Every bit of it. <laughs> Were you expecting a letter? Oh, no, sir. If I ever got a letter, it'd just mean trouble of some kind. Well, that's what my mail usually means. Yeah, not this time, though. No new wanted notices? Yeah, not a one. Looks like all the bad men have had a change of heart. Mm, sure does. There hasn't been a reward posted for anybody in over a month. Well, not that we know of, anyway. Mm. Uh, Mr. Dillon? Hmm? 
I think I'll go see if there's any beer left over at the Alphaganza. You join me? <laughs> no, thanks, Chester. Okay, sir. I'll see you later. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Hey, mister. Well, hello. Tell me, is it all right to tie my horse here? Well, of course it is. Well, sometimes they don't like strangers being too bold. Well, there's mostly strangers in Dodge. It's a pretty big town. Heard a lot about Dodge. Good or bad? Bad, mostly. No offense to you, mister. Well, I don't own Dodge. <laughs> I'll, uh, buy you a beer. Well, I, I was just going into the Alphaganza here. You know, a fella feels funny when he don't know nobody in the place. Oh, I've been that way many a time. Uh, where are you from, anyway? Colorado Territory. A lot of country out there. Sure is. Bartender? Wait a minute. Sure. Hello, Chester. Hello, Sam. Now, what'll it be, stranger? We'd like two beers, please. You must be buying. Yeah, I am. Why? Well, you don't look like you got any more than the price of two beers on you. Oh, don't mind Sam, mister. He gets spells like this. That's all right. It's all right, he says. And if it wasn't all right... Oh, leave him alone, Well, Sam. I hate My these gracious. saddle bums that ride a hundred miles to a fine saloon and then order a glass of beer. One thing I'll say for the Texans, they may cause a little trouble now and then, but they drink right. Well, I don't take whiskey myself, but I'll buy you one, mister. Oh, beer's good enough for me. Sam, you stay up too late night. It sours you. It'd sour anybody. Waiting on a lot of riffraff. Hey, Sam. Sam, you better take it easy how you call this fella. I had, huh? You sure had. You know who this is? What do I care who he is? You're a Lou Medellin, ain't you, mister? Lou Medellin? Why, sure it is. I seen him three months ago over at Colorado, at La Hunter. He was right across the street, and he just shot two men. Fastest thing ever happened. I'd sure hate to dangle with him. You really Lou Medellin, mister? I seen you right at the start, Medellin. That day at La Hunter. You sure built yourself a reputation since then. Oh, yeah, I've heard talk about you. <laughs> you don't look like a gunman, though, nor act like one neither. Well, they always said he was real soft-talking and polite-like. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm proud to know you, Medina. Uh, my name is Casey. How do you do, Mr. Casey? <laughs> Mr. Casey. Imagine Lou Medellin calling me Mr. Casey. I, I sure would like to buy you a drink. No, wait a minute, Casey. I sort of owe this man an apology. The drinks will be on the house, okay? Where? That's kind of you, bartender. Sure, sure. I just want you to feel welcome here, anytime. Uh, Mr. Medell, uh, how come you're wearing your gun in the holster now? I always heard you carried it loose in your belt. I can handle it both ways. Yeah. Uh, Maybe you thought people wouldn't recognize you so fast wearing it different. It, it kind of marks a man right off carrying his gun in his belt. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it does. Say, I, 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 I'm I, sure proud to know you. I never got real acquainted with a, a man of your breed before. My pleasure. My, you sure are polite, Mr. Medellin. No need to be otherwise, I figure. Well, one thing, you make a lot of friends mighty fast. Well, then I guess that's easy for a man like you. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes it is. Well, let's uh, move over to the table, gentlemen. We'll have our beer there. Uh, Sam. Sam, Mr. Medellin wants the drinks brought to a table. You bet. Be right there. <laughs> Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? Say, I've been looking all over for you. Oh, uh, trouble? No, sir, but there sure could be. Did you ever hear of Lou Medellin? 
Is he in town? Yes, sir. He was right in the Alphaganza there about an hour ago. I had a beer with him. Well, what's he doing in Dodge? You find that out? Well, he didn't say, Mr. Dillon, but he is about the nicest, politest fellow you ever met. All I've heard about him is he started killing people a few months ago up in Colorado Territory. Yes, sir. He's a gunman, all right. Casey saw him in a fight in La Hunter. He's with him right now. Casey's a fool, Chester. Don't you be. No, sir. It's just that I never met nobody like him. Oh, he's so quiet and easygoing. Sure. I think I'll have a talk with him, Chester. Come on. Say, you think he's here looking for trouble, Mr. Dillon? A man like that's always looking for trouble. Well, yes, sir, I guess that's true, all right. That's him. Sitting right over there is Casey. I've got three more days here in town. And before I quit La Hunt, I said to him, I want to know sure that you... <laughs> Hello there, Marshal. I guess Chester told you who this is, huh? This here's Lou Medellin, Marshal. Hello, Medellin. Greatest gunman in Colorado Territory since Clay Allison went to New Mexico. Yeah. I've heard a little about you, Medellin. Pretty new at this game, aren't you? Yes, sir. Pretty new. Casey didn't mention it, but my name's Dillon. I'm a U.S. Marshal. I represent the law in Dodge. Glad to know you, Marshal Dillon. Are you planning to stay here long? Well, I don't make plans much, Marshal. I thought maybe you were here for some reason. Oh, no. No reason. None I can think of, anyway. I see. Yeah, I'd hate to be in your shoes. You try to run Lou Medellin out of Dodge, Marshal. I told Chester that you're a fool, Casey. Now I'm telling you. Medellin's a, a friend of mine. You better talk easy to uh, me. Shut up, Casey. Medellin, this is just what I came to tell you. Trouble breeds around a man like you. Somehow it can't be helped. And I'm hired to keep trouble out of Dodge. Don't worry about me, Marshal. I'm not worried about you. Well, no, sir. Ain't nobody going to take Lou Medellin. Yes, there is. No matter how good he is, somebody will kill him one day. It always happens sooner or later. You may be, Marshal? Maybe. If he starts any trouble. There's nothing to worry about, Marshal. Don't you tell him a man like you ain't afraid of him, Medellin? Tell him. I think he knows that. Don't you, Marshal? I'm an old hand at this game, Madullin. You're new. But if you live long enough, you'll find out that being afraid isn't what counts. No? Well, what does? Worrying about it. The way you're worrying right now. I have a feeling you've been playing lucky so far, Madullin. But don't count on it lasting. I know what I'm doing, Marshal. What are you doing in Dodge, Madullin? I wanted to see the town. Isn't that all right? Yeah, that's all right. But the first sign of trouble and you're through here. Sure, Marshal. Sure. If your family's getting weary of the same old breakfast cereal every morning, time to retire it and introduce them to New Sugar Crinkles. Say, New Sugar Crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. And I'm here to tell you, Sugar Crinkles make breakfast more fun than a circus. Golden crisp nuggets of sugar-coated rice and every nugget in your breakfast bowl just right sweet. Forget your experience with sugar-coated cereals that seem too sweet and with others that don't seem sweet enough. Treat yourself and your favorite family to new sugar crinkles at breakfast time and snack time, too. For your breakfast or a snack, you love sugar crinkles. Sugar crinkles can't be big. Sugar ice cream best just right sweet. With milk for the breakfast joy. And a snack from the pack, oh boy! Can't be beat, just like sweet sugar crinkles. Good. 
to eat. Now back to Gunsmoke. I'd seen a lot of gunmen and killers in my time, and some of them were mighty peculiar people. But the strangest I'd ever run across was Blue Medellin. It wasn't his quiet, polite manner that bothered me, but the feeling I got that he wasn't very sure of himself or of what he was doing. I didn't see him again that day or the next until along toward evening. I was sitting in Doc's office when Chester came up and told me he'd heard Ab Fisher was in town. I'd known Fisher some years back, and I had heard a lot about him since. So I set out at once to find him. Having one gunman around was bad enough, but having two meant certain trouble. You going to look in the Texas Trail, Mr. Dillon? I might as well try it first. It's closer. Yes, sir. Oh, why does everything have to happen at once? Uh, nothing's happened yet, Chester. See him? No. Over well, there's Lou Madullin over there. Well, he's sitting with Miss Kitty, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Uh, stay here, Chester, and keep your eyes open, huh? All right, sir. Kitty, I'll tell you what I'll do. Oh, hello, Matt. Hello, Kitty. Uh, Dolan. Pull up the chair, Marshal. Oh, thank you. You look worried about something, Matt. Maybe it's because I'm sitting with his girl. You're sitting with me because you got the price of a drink, mister. That's not very nice of you, Kitty. Never mind, Madeline. Tell me, do you know Ab Fisher? Ab Fisher? No, I don't, Marshal. Ever heard of him? Never even heard of him. Good. So long. Goodbye. He's sure worried about something. I know he is. Ah, don't pay any attention to him, Kitty. Have another drink? Where'd you get all the money? You didn't have much last night. Casey over there lent me some. Till mine gets here. I've heard that story before, too. (laughs) (laughs) Who's this? I never saw him before. So you're Lou Madellan. Who are you? Ab Fisher. Oh, I'm beginning to understand this. You gentlemen will excuse me. What do you want, Fisher? Told me you were in town. Thought I'd like to meet you. Oh, well, I'm glad to know you. I heard about you in Denver. Oh, sure, sure. They say you're pretty fast. Yeah, I guess I am. But, Dylan, it makes me uncomfortable to be around a man who thinks he's better than I am. Huh. Don't feel that way. Here, I'll buy you a drink. Put your money on the table. All right. There it is. There's mine. I... I don't understand. One of us gets four drinks. The one that lives. What? Drama, Dylan. Go on, draw. No, wait. Listen, then I will. You... You killed him. You killed Lou Modellin. He ain't dead yet. But he didn't even draw. He never even tried. He had his chance. If he lives, I'll give him another one. Anytime. Right now, I'm going to have me four quick drinks. Hold it, Ab. Matt Dillon. Well, so it is. Don't try anything. Why should I, man? You're under arrest, Ab. What for? For killing Lou Madellan. 
They say you drew first. He was kind of pokey about it, and I had to. But you can't arrest me, Matt. It's murder, Ab. Guess you haven't heard. Lou medellin has got a price on his head. He's wanted in Denver for shooting a few citizens while he was robbing a bank. Dead or alive, Matt. I'll get $1,000 for this. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. You're no good anymore, Ab, but at least you never tried to lie your way out of anything I know of. If it wasn't true, Matt, I'd have tried to shoot you. I'll telegraph about it. But meanwhile, you'll have to sleep in jail. Sure, Matt. Save me the price of a room. Oh, Casey, don't stand there. Get Medellin over to Doc's. finally answered your telegraph, and Ab Fisher's right. $1,000 for Luma Dillon, dead or alive, and it's signed by the sheriff up in Denver. Will I tell Fisher about it? Uh, no, let him wait a while. He isn't worried anyway. I'm going to go up to Doc's and see if Madellan's still alive. Yes, He's alive, Matt, but not for long. Can he talk? Oh, he can talk all right, but when he goes, he'll go fast. There's nothing more I can do for him. Where have you got him in the back room? I thought he'd be quieter there. Come in with me, Doc. Huh? Sure, Matt. Sure. Marshal Dillon's here, Madellan. Hello, Marshal. How you feeling, Madellan? Poorly. I ain't gonna make it, Marshal. That fella shot me up bad. Yeah. Uh, Madellan, I want to ask you something about last night. Oh. Then you found out. No, I haven't found out, but maybe you'll tell me. Why didn't you draw on Ab Fisher? I... I was too scared, like you said. I tried to tell him about everything, but he shot me before I could talk. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. How could you have killed all the men they say you have acting the way you do? Marshal, I never killed a man in my life. What? No, sir. I'm just a poor cowboy. I got fired my last job, and I thought maybe I'd find something to do around here. What are you talking about? It's the truth. I ran into them fellas at the bar. They thought I was a big gunman. And they gave me a lot of respect, Marshal. I never had no respect before from nobody. Now, well, uh, what is your name? Coots. Dubby Coots. Eh, uh, Dubby Coots. Well, I thought something was wrong. Yes, I, I look like that Lou Medellin, don't I? Are you fool Casey anyway? <laughs> but I sure couldn't act like them. No. I'm in bad shape, Marshal. I'm sorry, Coops. It's all right. First time in my life I got me respect. But I first... Sad, Matt. Yeah. It's going to be kind of sad for Ab Fisher, too. Now I got to go tell him that he killed an innocent man, and he'll probably hang for it. You 
you're going to be mighty disappointed. Just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's adventure on Gunsmoke. If you want to be a real good scout, Mom, tell you what to do. See that your whole tribe sits down to post toasties for breakfast in the morning. What a way to start the day for every big and little Indian in your wigwam. You see, post toasties are heap good cornflakes, spankin' fresh, crisp, with that sweet kernel corn flavor toasted right in. It's a feather in your cap to serve them. Sure, because Post Toasties are not only the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it, Post Toasties are the best thing that ever happened to breakfast. And say, if you want to make a good thing even better, add your favorite fruit to that bowl full of Post Toasties, sugar, and milk. Mmm, it's mighty delicious nourishment. Get Post Toasties, the heap good cornflakes... Next time you shop. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Neston with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, Lauren Stobkin, Harry Bartell, and Herb Ellis. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Listen next week at this time when Gunsmoke will be brought to you by Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes. Now, Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes, is proud to present Gunsmoke. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It's easy to do your whole tribe a big favor, Mother. Just pour every big and little Indian in your camp a breakfast bowl full of Post Toasties. Post Toasties, you know, are the heat good cornflakes. They're the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Fresh as fresh can be. Say, Post Toasties are crackling crisp. Sweet kernel corn flavor, toasted. That's Post Toasties. Post Toasties are packed with nourishment, too. A bowl of Post Toasties with sugar and milk helps your big braves and little Indians start the day right. Get Post Toasties soon. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. <laughs>
Yeah. Nice day, man. Uh, the wind's gone down anyway. Yeah, it sure was blowing last night. Uh, where were you, Doc? Uh, out at the Caldwell place. Mrs. Caldwell's expecting. Still? Uh, there was a false alarm last night. Oh, you ought to get some sleep while you can, Doc. Yes, I know. That's right where I'm headed. Doc Adams. Oh, hello, Ruth. I've been looking for you, Doc. Uh, Matt, this is Ruth Tucker. Sheely Tucker's son. Oh, hello, Ruth. Well, we ain't met before, Marshal. No. How's Sheely these days? Uh, he's just like ever. But it's Ma I come to get Doc for. Well, what's the matter, Ruth? You know, she swallowed a nail, Doc. And it's hurting her bad. Mm, swallowed a nail? Did she? Uh, how'd she do that? I told her not to, but she was fixing the chicken house anyway, and she had some nails in her mouth. Oh, you say it's hurting her. It's her stomach. She's got a terrible pain in her stomach. Oh, that's bad. I, uh, I'll, I'll write out with you right away, Ruth. As soon as I get my tools, may have to operate. You know Pa, Doc. You know how he is. Oh, yes. I forgot about him. Sheely doesn't like doctors, does he? He hates them. But he ain't there now. He's been out on the prairie the last couple of days. Oh? When'll he be back? I don't know for sure. But Ma said to get you anyway. She doesn't want to die. She needs to cause trouble if he found me there, wouldn't he? He sure would. He'd beat you half to death. Well, maybe I better ride out with you, Doc, just in case Sheely comes home while you're there. Uh, good idea, Matt. I... Uh... Think you better? Yeah, uh, Ruth, uh, go over to the Alafraganza and tell Chester I want him to go with us, will you? Sure, Marshal. Chester. Doc's still working on her. Well, there's no sign of Sheely anyway. Oh, that's some help. What's the matter with a man like that, Mr. Dillon? Hating doctors the way he does? I don't know, Chester. Probably there weren't any doctors around when he was young. And what was good enough for his father is good enough for him. Some fool notion like that, maybe. Sheely always was a mean old cuss, except for his horses. He's always treated horses like they're human. Did you ever notice that? Oh, Sheely isn't really a bad man, Chester. He's just ignorant and prejudiced because of his ignorance. If he'd have been here, he'd let Miss Tucker die rather than have Doc operate on her. Yeah, probably. Well, that's bad. To me, it is. Maybe if Doc saved him someday, he might get over his ideas. Oh, Sheely's never had a sick day in his life, I know of. Oh. Doc, you all through? Huh? Oh, Yes, yes, I'm all through, Matt. How is she, Doc? She's dead. Dead? I guess her heart couldn't take it. I I don't know. I I had to operate, though. She'd have died sure if I hadn't. Oh, it isn't your fault, Doc. You did all you could. I know, but I always feel maybe if I'd have done it better, things like this wouldn't happen. You're not to blame, Doc. You, uh, want me to tell Ruth? Yeah, I've already told him. He's in there with her. Oh, how'd he take it? He didn't say a word, Matt. Well... We better be getting back to Dodge, I guess. Yeah, you must be plumb wore out, Doc. Yeah, I am. Doc. Hey. Eh? Hey. Uh, yes, Ruth. And you too, Marshal. You're gonna have to help me. Well, we'll help you, Ruth. What is it? It's about Pa. I don't know what to tell him when he comes back. Hey, yeah, that's right. I, I. Kind of keep forgetting about him. Just tell him the truth, Ruth. Doc tried to save your mother, but he wasn't able to. Nobody could have. 
You don't know Paul very well, I guess. He just won't stand for it. Well, there's nothing he can do about it now. It's all over. Not for him, it won't be. And, uh, what do you mean, Ruth? Well, when Paul says a thing, he means it. And he said none of us was ever to go near a doctor. Ruth, do you agree with your Pa's thinking? No. And neither did Ma. But we didn't dare cross him when he was around anyway. I'm afraid of him, Marshal. You'll have to stay here and tell him. Yeah, well, I, I can't stay. I have to get over to the Caldwell place. That baby's due any time now. But you can't go uh, on. All right, Ruth, all right. I'll stay here till he comes back. Um, Chester, you better ride into town in case anybody's looking for me, huh? All right, you, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it's a funny thing. How a doctor can lose one life and maybe bring another into the world all on the very same day. Well... Come on, Chester. We can ride partway together. That ought to do it, Ruth. I want her buried good, Marshal. How about a, a cross? You want to put up a cross? Now let Pa decide that. Uh, oh, my gosh, Marshal. Here he comes now. Yeah, looks like he's been riding pretty hard. And pa always rides hard, but he takes mighty good care of his horses all the same. He's never hurt one yet. I know. Oh, oh my horse. All right, Marshal. How are you, Sheely? What are you doing out here? What's this? Sheely, uh, y your wife died. Ruth and I just finished burying her. She died? Uh, just a few hours ago. We didn't know when you were going to get back, so we went ahead and buried her. What's she die of? Uh, she was holding some nails in her mouth, and she swallowed one of them. Oh. Roof, take this horse into the barn and dry him off. Sure, Paul. Rub him good now. I will, Paul. Don't let him near no water yet. I won't. What are you doing out here, Marshal? I came out with Doc. With who? Doc Adams. He did everything he could to save her life, Sheila. He cut on her, didn't he? He tried to get the nail out, if that's what you mean. She'd have died from it if he hadn't. Cutting on her, that's what killed her. Look, Sheila, your wife was dying and Doc tried to save her. That's how it happened, no matter what you think. I've got no use for doctors. They're all croakers. That's what my old man called them, croakers. I kind of figured that's where all this came from. Julie, have you ever thought that your old man might have been wrong? Not about them, he wasn't. Hey, how'd Doc get here anyway? Who told him to come? Your wife wanted him. After all the times I've told her to stay away from Doc... I guess she didn't want to die, Sheila. She wanted a chance to live. Yeah, sure. And he'd come out here and killed her. Poor defenseless woman... Doc Adams will pay for this, Marshal. I'm telling you right you now. You lay a hand on Doc, and I'll run you out of the country, Sheely. Maybe it won't be a hand I'll use, Marshal. Try anything like that, and you'll hang for it. I'll find you no matter where you go. He killed my wife with his bungling butchery. He's a murderer. There isn't a man in Kansas who'd believe that. Doc's a pretty valuable citizen around here, Sheely. Not to me, he ain't. It's an eye for an eye, Marshal, like it says in the good book. You even try it, and I'll throw you in jail. I don't try nothing. Then you'll hang. Will I, Marshal? Say, 
what goes on at your house at breakfast? Well, you can take it from me. The best thing that can go on your breakfast table is Post Toasties. Yes, sir, Post Toasties, the heap good cornflakes. Those golden crisp cornflakes are the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. You know how to prove it? Just pour out breakfast bowlfuls of Post Toasties for your whole tribe, and then watch how they enjoy them. Post Toasties are crisp and tasty. From the first bite down to the last spoonful, that sweet kernel corn flavor makes your breakfast. So always ask for Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes. Post Toasties, heat good cornflakes. The best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Heat good cornflakes. Post Toasties, heat good cornflakes. Remember, Post Toasties is one of the famous triple wrapped Post cereals, guaranteed fresh or triple your money back. Now back to Gunsmoke. I left Sheely Tucker standing by his wife's grave, and I rode back to Dodge. There was no use trying to convince the man that doctors aren't bunglers and murderers. I figured he'd have to experience the truth himself somehow. And there wasn't much chance of that, the way things stood. But what really worried me was his threat to get Doc. Ordinarily, Sheely was peaceable enough, but there was no telling what he might do now. Doc stayed at the Caldwell place that night. And the next day, too. I thought he'd be safe there, and I didn't worry about him. Till the next evening. Kitty and I were having supper at the Dodge house. Matt, for a town that lives on the cattle trade, you'd think we'd be able to eat decent steaks. <laughs> you should have had the prairie chicken, Kitty. You didn't have to walk all the way from Texas. <laughs> that steak I had got carried. It was too old to walk. <laughs> I've never eaten prairie chicken, Matt. What's it taste like? Oh, a little chicken. A lot of prairie. <laughs> if I didn't know you better, I'd say you've been drinking. If I know you, you'll order a steak next time anyway. I don't give up easy, Matt. Yeah, I know. Remember it, then. Sure. You don't know much about women, do you, Matt? Well, I'm learning. Yeah. But at the pace you've set, I'll be in my grave before you're out of first grade. Well, it took me ten years to learn how to handle a six-gun. Well, that's the nicest compliment I've had all day. <laughs> Drink your coffee. i got to get out of here. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Oh, here's Doc. Oh, hello, Matt. Kitty. How's Mrs. Caldwell, Doc? Yeah, we gave birth to a 12-pound boy this afternoon. Ah, oh, that's fine. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, that's not what I came to talk about, Matt. Somebody tried to shoot me on the way back from the Caldwell place. What? Who was it, Doc? Yeah, I didn't see him, and since I didn't have a gun, I rode straight ahead. Uh, fast? Where'd this happen? Yeah, about a mile the other side of the grove. I should have come out and ridden back with you, Doc. You should have, huh? Well, then, uh, you know something about this? Yeah. Sheely Tucker, huh? He came back after you and Chester had left, Doc. He made some threats. Yes, I might have known it, but... I'm not going to be a target for Sheely every time I go on a call in the country. I'm going out and see him, Matt. We'll have this out face to face. I don't think you can change his mind, Doc, but I'll go with you. And if he admits shooting at you this afternoon, I'll bring him back to jail. Maybe I'll bring him back anyway. Well, I should hope so. People around here would be in an awful fix without Doc. Well, then there's me too, Kitty. Oh, sure, Doc. I was thinking of you. We'll ride out in the morning, Doc. Yeah, good. There's somebody in the corral there, man. Yeah, it looks like Sheely. Yes, him and Ruth both. Hello. Oh, oh. Well, let's leave them here. They'll stand. Okay. 
Hmm. We got a horse tied down in there, Mr. Dillon. Now, he's down, Chester, but he isn't tied. No, by golly, he ain't. Oh, say, look at that. Yeah, I broke his leg. Now, that's too bad. Oh, here we are. Uh, oh, uh, Doc, I, I'll go first in case Sheila gets excited. Oh, all right, man. Yeah. Go ahead, I'll close it. Hello, Sheely. Roof. Hello. You bring that crooker out here to kill my horse for me, Marshal? Uh, now, Sheely... Wait a minute, Doc. I'm sorry about your horse, Sheely. What happened? That bay's the finest animal I ever owned. I was just topping him off when he fell and busted his leg. No, blame it. Uh, that's too bad. It sure is. Roof. Go on up to the house and... Fetch me my rifle. Okay, Pa. A terrible thing to lose a horse like this. Sheely, if you like, I'll do the shooting. Oh, thanks. I'll kill him myself. It's my job. You know, it's a funny thing. We always shoot a horse if it breaks a leg, but we wouldn't think of shooting a man when he does. You croakers got other ways of getting rid of people. Yeah, I'll overlook that, Sheely, but... I'll tell you something. I don't want to hear nothing from you. Well, you like that horse, don't you? Of course I do. Well, then, don't shoot him. What? Well, look, Shelly, that horse is done for anyway, so it won't hurt to let me try to fix his leg the same way I would a man. It just might work. You mean put a cast on him? I do. I never heard of putting a cast on a horse, Doc. <laughs> Neither have I. It's crazy. I don't like it. Hmm? up to you, Sheely. Well, I wouldn't have let you near my wife if I'd been here. Why should I let you fool with my horse? All right. All right, Sheely. Shoot your horse. Then I'm taking you back to Dodge. What for? You're going to jail for trying to kill Doc yesterday. At least that's what Doc told me. Yeah, now, Matt, I didn't exactly Shut say... up, Doc. I ain't going to jail. I can't... Yes, you me. are. Unless maybe Doc changes his mind about charging you with attempted murder. Then I couldn't put you in jail. Oh? Yeah. No. No, yeah, he couldn't then. Uh, you know, Sheely, I might get so busy working on this horse, I'd, I'd plain forget about everything else. I might even save the animal to boot. Well, make up your mind, Sheely. I got to get back to Dodge. Well, all right. But you better make it work, Doc. I said I'd try. That's the best I can do. Ever. No matter who the patient is. Okay, Doc, you try. But try real hard, will you? I always do, Sheely. Real hard. <laughs> and Roof made a fast trip into Dodge for a plaster of Paris and some muslin to go under it. And when they got back, Doc went to work. An hour later, he had a heavy cast on the horse's leg. And after giving Sheely some final instructions, he was finished. He promised to come back in a couple of weeks and put a lighter cast on, and then we left. Sheely didn't say much, but I knew if anything went wrong with that horse, he'd be after Doc again. However, six weeks went by before anything happened. Doc and I were hiding out in his office with a game of chess we'd started a few days earlier. Yeah, doggone rook of you sitting there, Matt. If, if I move my bishop, you'll be right in on that queen. That's the only move you got, Doc. All right. There you are, Matt. See what you can do with it. A <laughs> couple more of those and I'll get that queen. Doc. Well... Hello, Sheely. Doc, I've been looking everywhere for you, Blast you. Why'd you put a sign on your door saying you were out? How come you're wearing a gun, Sheely? Man, it'd be a fool not to wear a gun in this town, Marshal. He'd be a worse fool to try to use it. Don't rile me. I'm in a bad enough temper already. What's wrong, Sheely? Uh, how's your horse? My horse is tied up right outside, Doc. What? Yeah, I took that second cast off myself. Then I rode him in here. Of course, I took it easy with him, Doc, real easy. 
And he ain't even limping. Well, what do you know? <laughs> By heaven, it worked. Oh, that's fine, but uh, what are you so heated up about, Sheila? Well, you'd be heated up too, Marshal. You've been carrying a rotten tooth in your jaw as long as I have. You mean you're looking for a doctor, Sheely? Uh, I'm man enough to admit it, Marshal. Uh, well, now, Sheely, uh, you just sit down right over there and I'll see what I can do. Okay, Doc. Hey, this is the one right here. Uh, Try to get it out, will you? I'll try, Sheely. That's the best I can ever do. Ever. That's good enough for me, Doc. Just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's adventure on Gunsmoke. Say, exciting things happen to breakfast when there's sugar crinkles at every place. Sure, new sugar crinkles make breakfast more fun than a circus. You know why? Sugar crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Not too sweet, the way some sugar-coated cereals seem to be, and not like others that aren't sweet enough. Sugar crinkles... Every golden crisp nugget of them is just right sweet. So try starting your day off just right with new sugar crinkles. And don't forget, when you're listening to the radio or watching television, sugar crinkles make great snacks. From the bowl or from the pack, for your breakfast or a snack, sugar crinkles are more fun than a circus. Try sugar crinkles soon. They're the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. So better get several packages. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards and Tom Tully. Harley Bear is Chester, Georgia Ellis is Kitty, and tonight Paul Freeze played Doc. Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Listen next week at this time when Gunsmoke will be brought to you by Sugar Crinkles. The sugar rice treat that's just right. Now, Sugar Crinkles, the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet, is proud to present Gun Smoke. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Take it easy, Mom. You know your young folks are going to eat when you give them sugar crinkles for breakfast. Yes, boys and girls love sugar crinkles. And no wonder, it's the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Makes breakfast more fun than a circus. Now, the reason sugar crinkles suit your folks to a T is this. 
Some sugar-coated cereals they've tried seem too sweet. Others don't seem sweet enough. But when they dip their first spoonful of sugar crinkles, mmm, they've discovered a sugar-coated cereal that's just right sweet. And say those young folks of yours love to dip into the pack and eat sugar crinkles as a snack, too. So better get several packages. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. You're not Marshal Dillon. Well, no, surely I ain't, mister. Then please find him for me. He's busy. All right, I'll wait. Sure. You wait. Good heavens, man. You like it? No. Then listen to this one. Chester! Yes, sir? Put that comb away. I can hear it clear out back. Oh, well, all right, sir. I'll go out back and play it. But if I can hear it from there, I can hear it from here. All right, Mr. Dillon, if you feel that way, I won't play it at all. No worries. Good. Marshal Dillon. Yeah. I'm Philip Locke from Philadelphia. I arrived on the Santa Fe this morning. Now you're a long way from home, Mr. Locke. Unfortunately, yes. But I came here for a purpose, Marshal. Oh, and what's that? I'm looking for someone. A girl, as a matter of fact. Well, there's lots of girls in Dodge. You shouldn't have much trouble. If you please. Shut up, Chester. Yes, sir. This girl wrote her mother in Philadelphia that she was teaching school here, Marshal. However, she's never been heard of at the school. Well, maybe she's moved on somewhere. But they say she was never at the school. I'm afraid something's happened to her. Well, a lot of things can happen to people out here. That's precisely why I've come to you. I want you to find her immediately. <clears throat> You're not in Philadelphia, Mr. Locke. But I'll keep an eye open for her if you'll tell me your name and what she looks like. She's about five feet four, and she's blonde... A very pretty girl. Uh -huh. Her name is Laura Simmons. Laura Simmons? Yes, do you know her? Uh, no, 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 no. He doesn't know her. Neither do I. But uh, I'll see what I can find out for you, Mr. Locke. Wh where are you staying? At the Dodge House, and I must say I've been in better hotels. Well, bad as it is, you wait there, huh? I'll come to you if I have any news. It's most urgent that I find her at once, Marshal. Uh, sure. Good day. <laughs> Marshal Dillon. Hello, Laura. Well, uh, come in, Marshal. Come on in. Uh, thank you. Hello, Matt. Uh, or, or Kitty, uh, I didn't expect to find you here. No, this is Laura's room, not mine. How'd you know I lived here, Marshal? You've never been here before. Well, I asked Sam downstairs. It's a wonder he told you. I think Sam's sweet on Laura. <laughs> Kitty. Well, I do. You two can gossip about all that later, huh? Right now, I've got some news for you, Laura. You have? Yeah, there's a man here looking for you. His name is Philip Locke. Philip? Hmm. In Dodge, oh no. I figured it might be bad news. Well, I can't have him find me here. Well, he went to the schoolhouse first, and then I told him you'd probably moved on, but uh, 
He still thinks you're here somewhere. Well, he wrote Mother I was teaching school. He must have gone to see her. Well, if you don't want to see him, honey, you don't have to. I can't see him. I can't have him know I work in a... a saloon. It's nothing to be ashamed of. I know, but... Well, you see, I... I was engaged to Philip once before I left Philadelphia. We were about to be married when his family found out that my father had been a riverboat captain. I, I should have told him before, I guess, but... Well, anyway, they called off the wedding, and I was so ashamed I ran away. Came out here finally. What about Philip? What'd he do? <laughs> the Locks are a very aristocratic family, Kitty. I guess he had to do what they wanted. Not much of a man, if you ask me. Aristocrat or not. I was in love with him. And I think he was with me. Are you still? I don't know. How can I know? But he mustn't find me here. This is exactly the sort of life they said I was best suited for. His mother herself told me so. I've known nicer people than that on canal boats. I've got to hide somewhere. He'll go back and tell my mother, and it'd just break her heart. I, I just can't face any of it. Uh, look, Laura, why don't you go out to Ma Riley's until he leaves town, huh? She'll be glad for a little company. That's a wonderful idea, Matt. Come on, honey, I'll take you out myself. It's only a few miles. Oh, you're very kind. You might kind of spook him back to Philadelphia, Matt. <laughs> well, I'll try, Kitty. That's mighty warm beer for a nickel. I paid for that beer, Doc. I know, and I thank you for it, Chester, but I hate to see you not get your money's worth. Get it? When you decide it's time to buy us a beer? Oh, I'll buy. I'll buy. It's almost time, Doc. Sure. It's a good time. Oh, tell me, Matt, is Laura still out at the uh, Riley place? You're shying away from the problem. But anyway, she's there. Doc isn't likely to leave town this soon. I saw him last night, and I told him I'd heard Laura had gone to Denver. Ah, uh, did he believe you? I don't think so. But I warned Sam to tell him the same thing in case he came snooping around here. Uh, oh, it's a sad story. Poor girl. Well, she's better off without the like of him, if you ask me. Women are strange, Chester. They fall in love, and that's that. I sometimes wonder if it has anything at all to do with a particular man. Why, of course it has, Doc. Oh, I remember what a little Kyle girl told me once. She said, Chester, she said... I didn't know you spoke Kyle with Chester. Well, I don't exactly. We used a kind of a sign language, you know. Yeah, I can guess. Uh oh, oh, oh. Who's this? Marshal Dillon? Uh, hello, Lark. I want to talk to you, Marshal. Uh, you've met Chester here, and this is Doc Adams, Philip Lark. Mm -hmm. How do you do? Marshal, I think you lied to me about Laura. Oh, is that so? Most certainly is. There's something mighty strange going on here, and I think you're mixed up in it. Now look, maybe Laura doesn't want to see you, if you thought of that. I'm going to see her if I have to kill you to do it. Kill me? Mister, you ain't even wearing a gun. I don't have to. What do you mean? I've hired a man who'll shoot anybody I say for $500. Ah, Philadelphia must be quite a town. You have until this time tomorrow to produce it, Marshal. And remember, I'm a man of my word. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you are. Well, of all the nimby nambies. Uh, he's probably one of those who hired someone to fight in the war for him, Doc. It's all he knows. Look, Mr. Dillon, he's talking to Pete Noonan at the bar there. Pete Noonan? Is that his gunman? Well, looks like it. And of all the evil, no good, drunken crook, he ain't even much of a gunman. No. I always took Pete Noonan to be a little off in the head. He is, Doc. You never know what Noonan might do. He isn't like other men. 
That's what makes him really dangerous. It does your heart good, I know, when your young folks eat all of their breakfast cereal. That's why I'm so happy to tell you about new Sugar Crinkles. Sugar Crinkles, you know, is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Crisp golden nuggets of sugar-coated rice. They make breakfast more fun than a circus. Why, young folks love Sugar Crinkles so much, they disappear like magic. Now, you've had experience with sugar-coated cereals that seem too sweet to you and others that just don't seem sweet enough to the youngsters. Well, what a wonderful surprise Sugar Crinkles will be to your whole family. For new Sugar Crinkles really are just right sweet. Remember, Sugar Crinkles make great snacks, too. Better get several packages. For your breakfast or a snack, you love Sugar Crinkles. Sugar Crinkles can't be big. Sugar ice cream that's just right sweet. With milk for the breakfast joy. As a snack from the pack, oh boy. Can it be beat? Just right sweet. Sugar crinkles. Good. To eat. Now back to gun smoke. <laughs> Philip Locke first hit Dodge looking for Laura. I didn't think he'd cause any real trouble. I felt sorry for her, of course, but I wasn't hired to settle love affairs, good or bad. And it wasn't until he hired Pete Noonan for a gunman that I began to get worried. Noonan was off in the head and about as predictable as a loco steer. With him around, it made for a bad situation. But there was nothing I could do except wait and see what happened. Locke had given me 24 hours to produce Laura. It was getting close to the deadline when I went over to the Texas Trail. I saw her this morning, Matt, but she didn't say much about anything. The poor kid. Well, she can't stay there forever. And Locke hasn't shown any signs of leaving. Maybe she ought to go on to Pueblo or Santa Fe or something. Give her time, Matt. Yeah, sure. Well, I got nothing to do with it. Uh, Kitty. Oh, you too, Marshal. Now, what is it, Sam? Uh, one out back, both of you. Huh? What for? You'll see. I gotta go take care of the bar. Sam must be drunk. No, he's sober. Come on, let's have a look. All right. I still say he's drunk. Oh, Sam doesn't drink his own liquor. I don't blame him. I wish I didn't have to. You don't? I wouldn't. I lived on a little ranch somewhere, Matt. Had chickens and things. Uh, Sam's liquor isn't that bad, Kitty. Laura, what are you doing here? I made up my mind. Hello, Marshal. Laura? I didn't want to go inside just yet, so I've been sitting out here talking to Sam. You mean you're coming back to work? I've been thinking a lot about everything, and I'm going to face it out. No matter what anybody says. Are you sure you're right, honey? There isn't any other way to do it. Philip came here because he wants me back, and I won't lie to him. Well, I guess it's up to you. Where do you want to talk to him? Marshal, would you find him and bring him here? Out here? No, just take him to the bar inside. I'll meet him there. place to meet her. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sam, mm-hmm. bring us a drink, huh? Sure, Marshal. Uh, we'll wait here. She'll be along. Well, Laura always was rather different. Here you are, gentlemen. Oh, thank you, sir. Good evening, Marshal. Laura. Hello, Philip. Laura, that dress. You like it? What are you doing here? 
you'll buy me a drink, Philip, I'll tell you. A drink? Of course. This is how I earn my living, Philip. You work here? Yes. Now, will you buy me a drink to start with? No. No, no. Oh, never mind him, Laurie. He don't mean nothing. He'll get used to it. Oh, no. It's just like what his mother said about me. It's true. Philadelphia. Oh, what do they know in Philadelphia? Lace on their pants. Here, Laura. Hey. Have a drink, huh? Thanks, Marshal. I need it. you go home, huh? I'll get Kitty to take you. All right. Wait. Laura? Yes, Philip? Laura, I can't leave. I started to, but I can't. I came to find you, and I'm going to take you back with me. You are? Yes. This is quite a shock to me, of course, seeing you here in this place, but... I can forget about that. I'll try, Laura. Will you, Philip? Yes, I promise. Then we'll never mention it. Ever. To your family, you mean? To anyone. It'll be a secret. It will? Always. If nobody knows, perhaps it won't matter. I'm not sure, Philip. I think it'll always matter. To me. I don't understand. Hmm. You wouldn't understand, mister. Laura, let's get out of here while we can talk. No. What? You heard her. She don't want to go. Will you keep out of this bar? No, I won't. What kind of a man are you anyways? This little girl's done nothing to be ashamed of except earn her living, which is probably more than you've ever done. What makes you think you're good enough to judge her anyway? That's enough. You try to forget about it. You ever think of anybody but yourself? You're no good, mister. Lori here's worth a hundred like you. I'm proud of her. I don't care what she's done or, or who knows it. You're proud of me, sir? Of course I am, Laura. I won't hear any more of this. Are you coming, Laura? Oh, tell him, Lori. Go on, tell him. Well? No, Philip. I'm not coming. I'm going to stay here. Mister, you heard her. Now get out before I break the bottle over your head. Goodbye, Laura. And you, bartender. You'll die for this. Don't try that, Locke. Keep Noonan out of this. Nobody tells me what to do, Marshal. Noonan? What's Noonan got to do with this? Locke's hired Noonan's gun. Oh, no. Well, he'll kill you, Sam. Well, that Noonan, he's crazy enough, too. Yeah. He is, Sam. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? I've been waiting outside, like you said. Well, why aren't you there now? Well, because he's coming to right up Front Street. Noonan? Yes, sir. He's alone, though. I figured he would be. All right, Chester, after he comes, keep an eye on the door. Huh? Yes, sir. Sam. Well, what did you have, Marshal? Noonan will be here in a minute. Get out of sight. Well, I ain't afraid of him. You heard me. Now get out of sight. Okay, Marshal. I come for Sam. Where is he? What do you want him for, Nolan? Well, I've been paid to shoot him. That's what for. You want to hang, Nolan? <laughs> I was born to hang. Where is he? Look, I'm going to throw you in jail for a couple of days. Maybe things will be clearer to you then. Come on. Huh? No, Marshal. Don't do that. 
I've got to earn my five hundred dollars. All right. But you'll have to shoot it out with me first. With you? What you got to do with it? I, I want nothing to do with you. There's a law against murder, Nolan. I know that. And what makes you think you can shoot Sam and get away with it? Well, I got $500. Right here in my pocket. Want to see it? Look, Noonan, to see if you can understand this, either you take your money and you get out of Dodge, or you're going to jail. I ain't going to jail. You want to draw on me? I'm no fool. All right, then get out. Fast. Now go on. Move. You don't leave a man much choice, Marshal. Guess I'll have to go. Bye. So long. <laughs> well, you sure got rid of him, Marshal. Well, I hope so. But he wouldn't have had much of a chance at you anyway. What? <laughs> Look at Laura there. I wouldn't have uh, missed him, Sam, even if he had got the Marshal. Well, I'll be it. Lori, where'd you get that shotgun? Sure. The one you keep upstairs, I borrowed it. <laughs> There's blood in this girl, Sam. Did she ever tell you her father was a riverboat captain? <laughs> well, I'll be... uh, Marshal... Huh? Well, I, I'm closing bar. You, you have to do your drinking somewhere else tonight. It'll be a pleasure, Sam. Yeah. Come on, Laurie. I, I, I want to hear more about your old man. Sure, Sam. Sure. Just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's adventure on Gun Smoke. You know, what you are tomorrow depends on what you eat today. So, Mother, be sure the big and little Indians at your house always eat a good breakfast. And tell me, what could be better for breakfast than post toasties? Post toasties, you know, are the heap good cornflakes. The best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. But all of the talking in the world couldn't tell you how downright delicious Post Toasties are. You have to taste those crackling crisp flakes. Yes, you have to taste that sweet kernel corn flavor toasted. Then you know how perfectly wonderful breakfast can be. Put Post Toasties on your shopping list right now, Mother. Just watch how your whole tribe goes for them. Remember, Post Toasties are the heap good cornflakes. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Joyce McCluskey, Terry Bartell, Vic Perrin, and Lawrence Dobkin. Farley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Listen next week at this time when Gunsmoke will be brought to you by Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes. And now Post Toasties and Sugar Crinkles wish all of our listeners a very Merry Christmas. Now, Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes, is proud to present Gun Smoke. Around 
dark city and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Say there, next time you hear a crackling noise in your kitchen, better get up and investigate. Maybe somebody just couldn't wait for his breakfast of crackling crisp post-toasties. And that's a treat you shouldn't miss. Post-toasties, you know, are the heat good cornflakes. Why, after one taste, I'll bet anything you'll agree with me. Post Toasties is just the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. There's nothing quite like sweet kernel corn flavor when it's toasted right in. Toasted into crisp, fresh corn flakes. Man, oh man, that's Post Toasties. Heat good corn flakes. Better try them. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. You sure are slow with that beer, Doc. I'm ready for another. You had enough last night, Chester. Matt told me you were still asleep at 9 o'clock this morning. Oh, I was. And it was mighty kind of him not to wake me up. Say, are you sure he said he'd be back this afternoon? That's what he told me. So I... Oh, 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 oh. oh. Now, what in the world was that fella? Who? I just came in the door there with, with Tyler and Short. Oh, him. That's Weed Pendle. He rode in on a mule a couple days ago. Oh, well, which has the bigger ears? Him or the mule? <laughs> oh, he is funny looking, all right. And he acts peculiar, too. That's a mighty scrawny mule, Pendle. I seen you on him this morning. Pendle, he was kind of scrawny yourself, Short. Maybe some beer would fatten him up a little. I'd like some beer, all right. But I got no money. Why don't you sell that guitar of yours? Sell my guitar? No, I'd never do that. You must have a nickel, at least. Last money I had got stole. Now, who dare steal money off a tiger like you, Pendle? I was asleep. I started to wake up, but they kicked me in the head. You call that a head? Looks to me more like your neck just growed out and haired over. <laughs> I ain't very handsome. You sure ain't. Hey, what'd your old lady think of you when she saw you, Pendle? I don't know. She died. Yeah. Laughing, I'll bet. Oh, uh, <laughs> now that's enough, Tally. That's too mean. <laughs> Pendle's a harmless little fella. Ain't nobody talking to you, Chester. Well... Bartender, three beers. You buying, Tyler? I'm proud, too. A fine old soldier like Weed Pendle. How'd you know I was a soldier? I didn't. Where was you a soldier, Pendle? Third Illinois Cavalry. Illinois? You was with the Yankees. Well, I never done much. We had hard luck and never got to see no real Confederates at all. Just a bunch of ragged-tailed bushwhackers in South Missouri. They was led by an old chicken thief named Klein. Yeah, so they was. Tell me something, Pendle. Did you ever kill any of uh, Klein's men? A few. Oh. Before I got shot myself. They caught some of them after and hung them. But I never did see a hanging. You never saw a hang? Nowhere. I never did. That's so. Well, Pendle, you're in luck. Since we was kind of in the war together, so to speak, I'm going to show you a hanging. Uh, you're about ready, ain't you, Short? My rope's on my saddle. I'll get it and meet you out back. They going to be a hanging? Real hanging? It sure is. You're lucky, Pendle. You run into us just in time. What are you talking about, Tyler? Who are you going to hang? It's a kind of surprise, Chester. You can watch, too. 
Uh, here, you know it's against the law to hang people around here. I saw Marshal Dillon ride out town this morning. When he gets back, it'll be all over. And don't you try to buck me in short, Chester. You'll die if you do. Come on, Pendle. You don't want to miss it. Sure. What do you suppose they're up to, Doc? And I don't know, Chester, but I'd like to find out. Yeah, I guess we'd better. <laughs> I sure do wish Mr. Dillon was here. I never did think much of Tyler and Short. They play no good. I'm worried, Doc. There they are. Why, it's Pindle. They got a rope around his neck. Of course, you won't see all the hanging, Pindle, just the start of it. What are you hanging me for? I ain't done nothing. You was in the 3rd Illinois Cavalry. Well, sure. We was fighting under that old chicken thief, Klein, in South Missouri. It's a real pleasure to hang a Yankee like you. But I only done what they told me to. I didn't kill nobody on purpose. All right, now, wait a minute, you two. You've gone far enough. Shoot him, Tyler. You go shooting anybody, and you'll be the ones to end up on a rope. Doc ain't armed. He never is. Go on, Tyler. All right. You can try it. But you're sure going to have to kill me before you hang anybody. I'll kill you. You'll have to kill me, too, Tyler. Mr. Dillon. Now, where'd he come from? Take your rope off that man's neck, Short, and do it quick. Sure, Marshal. Sure. I told you you shouldn't hang me. Oh, we was just funning the Marshal. We wasn't going to hang him. What's this all about, Short? Well, he's a Yankee, Marshal. Killed a lot of us in Missouri during the war. We was going to scare him and then run him off. Well, you forget about that. And forget about the war, too. It's over. The next time I catch you up to anything like this, you're going to go to jail. Go to jail? Over a dumb Yankee who don't own nothing but a skinny mule and a guitar? Get out of here, Short. And you, too, Tyler. Okay, Marshal. But this Yankee better get out of here, too. Out of dodge. Shut up, Tyler. I got moving. Sure. See you later, Kendall. Kendall, Marshal Dillon's here. He wants to see you. I sure do thank you for letting me sleep in your jail last night, Marshal. Where you been sleeping before, Pendle? With my mule. I always do. Uh I, uh, hear you broke. What do you do for a living? I never did nothing much, Marshal. Just ride around on my mule. Well, what about your guitar? Don't you ever play and take up a collection or something? Oh, no, Marshal. I wouldn't do that. Well, why not? Can't, can't you play well enough? I don't know, Marshal. I never played it for nobody to hear, except me. Ah. All right. Uh, Chester, take him over to the Texas Trail, huh? Maybe Sam can give him a job of some kind. Well, it wouldn't be steady, would it? Well, I don't know, but uh, why shouldn't it be? Because I'll be leaving in a day or two. Oh? Where are you headed? Nowhere. Nowhere? Just ride around on my mule. I always do. And where are you from, anyway? I was born in San Benito. Oh, on the Rio Grande? Yes. I left soon after. Took my guitar with me, though. Never did go back. Well, if you're from Texas, how come you fought in the Union Army? I don't know. One army is just like another, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you're right at that. Uh, Chester, take him over to Sam's. Huh? All right, sir. I left my guitar back. I'll go get it. He sure is a peculiar little fellow, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, pretty helpless, too. You think Short and Tyler will bother him anymore? Well, knowing them, I believe they'd have hung him yesterday if they could have. Uh, you tell Sam to let me know if they even start talking to him again, huh? Yes, sir, I will. They're about the meanest pair of men I ever knew. Yeah, they are. And they'll think of something. Well, Pennell said he's leaving in a day or two. I hope that's soon enough, Chester. morning appetites at your house. If they're pretty drowsy, here's a real good way to wake them up. 
Set a bowl full of Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes at everybody's place. Just watch your folks take notice when they see how crisp Post Toasties are. And wait till they taste that sweet kernel corn flavor toasted in. Bet your whole tribe will agree with you. Post Toasties are the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. And here's a thought if you'd like to make a good thing even better. Try topping Post Toasties with your favorite fruit. You'll find that's a mighty good way to start the day. Fact is, it's a downright delicious way. So next time you shop, be sure to ask for Post Toasties. They're the heat good cornflakes. You'll see. Post Toasties heat good cornflakes. The best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Heat good cornflakes. Post Toasties heat good cornflakes. Now back to Gunsmoke. Sam gave Weed Pendle a job sweeping up the saloon and let him live in a tiny shack out back. He tried to get him to play his guitar, but Pendle wouldn't do it. And we all began to think that he probably didn't even know how. It's hard to believe that anyone as simple as he was could learn to do anything. I looked up Short and Tyler and warned them again to leave him alone. And they did. Until one morning a couple of days later. Chester and I had just come out of Delmonico's and were walking up Front Street. Look at there, Mr. Dillon, across the plaza. Yeah, I saw them. Let's go over there, Chester. Here's Pendle and his mule, all right. Yeah. And Tyler and Short, too. I told them to keep away from him. What are they laughing at? Now, they're laughing, but he isn't. What do you suppose they've done to him now? Look at his mule, Chester. Well, that's what they've done. Oh, my goodness, Mr. Dillon. He's lost the ear. I thought he'd empty his life there and you was that way short. At least all an urge they did. I guess they're just no pleasing to some men, Tyler. <laughs> you shouldn't have done that to my mule. Well, it's the marshal again. Did you men do this? Now, Marshal, we ain't done nothing to Pendle. Did they do it, Pendle? I tried to stop him, but Tyler held me. And they gave me my mule's ear, Marshal. Right here. See? Yeah. Turn around, both of you. Turn around, I said. Now take their guns, Chester. Yes, sir. Can't do nothing to us, Marshal. We didn't hurt Sandal. No. I don't like what you did to his mule. I got him, Mr. Dillon. Now that you can turn around again. I ought to cut an ear off of each of you. But I can't do that. So I'm going to do the next best thing. Now look here, Marshal. You... Now leave him there, Chester. Pendle, I'm sorry about your mule. He ain't much of a mule anymore. Well, you better go take care of him. And maybe these two will leave you alone now. Poor mule. told me yesterday, Matt. Well, it could have been almost anything knowing him, Kitty. No, this kind of makes sense. I asked him if he was ever lonely, and he said, no, he never stayed anywhere long enough to get to know anybody that well. Uh, he's a little strange, all right. Mm. Now what are they up to? Who? Tyler and Short. They just came in with Kendall. Oh? Look, Matt, he's got his guitar with him. Yeah. Hey, listen, everybody. Hey, Listen, everybody. Little Yankee's gonna play his guitar for us. At least he's gonna try. Ain't you, Yankee? Don't shoot my mule. We ain't gonna shoot your mule. 
Not if you play good enough. Go on, get started. If you know how. They threaten to kill his mule, Matt. You gotta stop him. No, wait a minute, Kitty. <laughs> Go on, Pendle. Go on, play. All right. <laughs> Yankee. Hello. You've been playing that guitar a long time in there, ain't you, Pindle? They wanted me to. They liked it. Well, me and Short been waiting to tell you how we liked it, too. Yeah. Let me see that guitar, Pindle. No. You hurt my mule. Give it to me. I got a gun in your belly, Pindle. Don't move. I want my guitar. You can have it. I just want to sort of tune it for you first. Please, Dad. Please don't do that. Another thing that's wrong with this guitar, it's a little bit too big for a man like you. But I can make it smaller. <laughs> hey, you are a Yankee soldier. Maybe this will learn them. Let's go short. <laughs> Are they both dead, Doc? Oh, my, yes. Real dead. For several hours, at least. Why, they must have been asleep when it happened, Doc. It looks like Short there struggled a little. I guess Tyler got his first, but it woke Short up for a minute. He wasn't awake very long, man. Uh, Just long enough to see who was cutting his throat, probably. Hmm. Well, he can't talk now. No. I guess I'm all through here. What do you want to do with them? Well, we'll let the hotel worry about them. I guess it's Weed Pendle I want now. My, and him such a mild little fellow. Uh, any man can take just so much, Chester. I sure hate to see poor Pendle hang for killing these two buzzards, man. Chester, wait for me at the jail, huh? I'll bring him over as soon as I can find him. Where's Weed Pendle, Sam? Oh, I just sent him out back for a bucket of sawdust. What do you want him for? Short and Tyler got their throats cut early this morning. Good. I guess their smashing this guitar was too much for Pendle. That's so. Oh, here he is now. Pendle, come over here. Morning, Marshal. Good morning. Pendle. Where was you last night? I don't know. Here, I guess. You don't know. Now, wait a minute, Marshal. Bindle, where was you after they wrecked your guitar? Well, I sat in the alley a while, and I come back here. Yeah, that's right. 
And he was so broke up about his guitar, I didn't want to leave him alone, so I <laughs> took him up and let him sleep on the floor of my room. Isn't that right, Pindle? Well, go on, tell him now. Sure, Sam. That's right. Are you trying to alibi for him, Sam? I know, Marshal Dillon. But I care about him. Some people care about me. Who, Pendle? He's just talking, Marshal. Who cares about you, Pendle? Tell me. Those men. What men? He means some of the boys that was here when he come back with his busted guitar, Marshal. He just told him how sorry he was, that's all. I see. They liked his music, didn't they? Yes, they did. They liked to hear me play. Who was in here then, Sam? Well, now, Marshal Dillon, you know how it is. I'm busy pouring drinks, and I don't pay no mind to who's here and who ain't. I, I couldn't rightly say it all. Okay, Sam, I guess I can't beat the truth out of you. Oh, now, Marshal Dillon, who cares about Tyler and Short? Dodges is better off without us. There's him. a law against murder, Sam, and it's the same for everybody. And I'll be back later. What are you going to do now, Mr. Dillon? Well, I've done all I can, Chester. The whole town's just plain quit talking. Nobody knows anything. Well... I guess they're all trying to protect Pendle. Yeah, they are. But he didn't do it. Well, who did then? Well, if I could prove who did it, Chester, I'd have him in jail. But... Say, come over here. Well, well, I declare, Mr. Dillon, it looks to me like he's leaving town. Yeah, I told him he could go. He looks funnier than ever on that one-eared mule. Yeah. Now, Dodge treated Pendle pretty rough. It sure did. Poor little fellow looks kind of empty like that his guitar, don't he? Well, maybe you'll find another one somewhere. Anyway, they sure like to hear him play in this town. And a couple of the boys in particular, I guess. Yeah, they liked it just fine. Mother, want to see your small fry eat a better breakfast than ever? Well, may I suggest that you dish them up some sugar crinkles to start with? Sugar crinkles, you know, make breakfast more fun than a circus. Sugar crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. It's high time to forget these sugar-coated cereals that seem too sweet to you and those others that don't seem sweet enough to the kids. Just pour out crisp golden sugar crinkles and see how just right sweet a sugar-coated cereal can be. Just right sweet. Be sure to get several packages of sugar crinkles, because they're great for snacks. Kids love them that way. Kids love them anyway. Try sugar crinkles, and you'll love them too. Remember, new sugar crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. <laughs> Smoke under the direction of Norman MacDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, and Harry Bartell. Polly Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Special guitar effects by Al Hendrickson. Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West 
in Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke was brought to you tonight by Post Toasties and Sugar Crinkles. with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The trip from Hayes City to Dodge was long enough horseback, but by stagecoach, it seemed endless. There were only two passengers besides me, and after the first hour on the road, we stopped talking. Just sat there in silence, waiting for the ride to be over. I'd been up late the last few nights, so I braced myself into one corner of the coach and fell asleep. I vaguely remember the stage pulling to a stop and somebody shouting... But I came fully awake when the door was jerked open and a man behind a bandana stuck a shotgun in my face. Get out of the coach. Hands in front of you. Uh, It'll be a pleasure to blast you open. All right. Take his gun, Charlie. Yeah. Now... Stand over there with the driver. You two next. Now get on out and don't try nothing. Just go. How come you didn't start shooting when they stopped me, Marshal? Well, I was sound asleep, Hank. Well, I'm sure glad of that. If we put up a fight, that fellow with a shotgun would have blowed me clean off the seat. Yeah. yeah. How many of them are there? Just these two. That's all I've seen. Uh, could be somebody with a rifle hiding in that clump of elder over there. Could be. Uh, that'll learn him, Charlie. Hey, look. He killed him, Marshal. Yeah, the man was a fool to try that. Go get the box down, Charlie. Right. Take this one to help you. Oh, come on. Here. I'll keep an eye on these two here. Oh, you're a marshal, huh? I am. Well, that greenhorn got himself killed. He shouldn't have tried to shoot Charlie. No, he shouldn't. Not with a little derringer. Charlie got hit. Right now. Yeah, I saw it. I just don't want nobody chasing us for murder. Under the circumstances, it was murder. It was, huh? Well, then the only thing to do is shoot the whole bunch of you and have done with it. No, you can't do that. Mister, I got a wife and two kids in Dodge. What I hear, Dodge ain't a very good place to raise a family anyway. Look, you're in enough trouble already. Besides, you didn't kill that man. Your partner did. Yeah, that's right. It's Charlie they'll be after. How much money is there in that box, driver? Yeah, I don't know. They never tell me. Well, we'll find out. He's got it open now. Load it in them saddlebags, Charlie. Yeah. I got an idea. You're new at this game. Look, 
if a man was holding a shotgun on me and I was unarmed, I wouldn't have no ideas about nothing, Marshal. Do you always carry a shotgun, mister? Why? Well, we might meet sometime when you don't have one. You're going to make me shoot you yet. Hey, look, your partner's ready to go. Okay. Uh, don't you make a move till we're out of sight. We'll ride back and kill every one of you. You understand? I guess there's nothing we can do but stand here. That's all, Hank. For right now, anyway. What'd you do, Kitty? Burn your mouth oh, again? Oh, darn it, yes. What do you mean again? Well, it seems like you always do. If the coffee's hot enough. Thanks for the sympathy. <laughs> as much as you gave me about the stage holdup the other day. All I said was I'm glad you were asleep. You're a lot safer that way. Well, being safe isn't exactly my main goal, Kitty. Yeah, I know. How much money was there, Matt? $2,000. You'd think they'd have paid a man to ride shotgun. Have you any idea who did it? No, they were both masked. I hear Wells Fargo put up a reward for him. Yeah, there's a thousand dollars for the one who killed the passenger, dead or alive. They must want him real bad. That's not good for business. People getting murdered. What about the other one? Uh, Three hundred for his capture. And uh, if you recover the stolen money, Kitty, well, they'll give you half of it. If I found that money, they'd give me all of it. <laughs> You'll end up in jail yet. Well, the Texas Trail isn't far from being a jail. For me, anyway. I gotta get back there pretty soon, Matt. Sure. Hey, you. Waiter. Come here and take this money or I'll throw it at you. Another gentleman in town. Uh, Kitty, I, huh? I don't want to turn around. What does he look like? Well, I, I think it's the one with the black beard. You over there. heard me, waiter. Get over here before I bust your neck. Yeah, that's the one, all right. Is there anybody with him? No. He's alone. And he's leaving now. Oh, good. No, no, don't huh? stare at him. I don't want him to see me. Well, he's not even looking this way. He's going out the door, man. Uh, all right. Huh? Come on. I want to follow him. Okay. Is that him ahead of us there? The big man, yeah. Who is he, man? I'm not sure. But he sounds an awful lot like somebody I want. You gonna arrest him? No, not till I'm sure. Maybe not even then. Look, he's going up to docks. Yeah, so he is. Uh, Kitty, I'll leave you here. Okay. Thanks for the supper, Matt. Sure, anytime. Tomorrow? Well, I might be real busy tomorrow. I figured that. So long, Matt. Goodbye, Kitty. Well, that's a serious thing. It sounds like his arm is infected to me. Uh, how'd he do it? Well, he, he just tore it on some wire. Well, why didn't you bring him into town? It might be gangrene. Is that bad? And bad. Well, he could lose the arm, or even die. Where is he, anyway? Out on the prairie, in the camp. Ain't there uh, some medicine or something I could take back with me, Doc? Oh, oh. Oh, hello, Matt. Good evening, Doc. Uh, uh, oh, go, go right ahead. I, I just came up for a smoke. Oh, sure. Sit down. Sit down, Matt. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Now, look, mister. There isn't a medicine in the world. Never mind. But Doc. I'm telling you... Forget it. I'll... Talk to you tomorrow. Everything's okay. Yes. You better not wait too long. I'm warning you. I won't. We'll take care of everything tomorrow. So long. Ah, that man's crazy, that's what. No, he's not crazy, Doc. No, you should have heard him. I did. What do you mean you did? I was outside the door, Doc. Well, he's going into the Oliver Ganza. I guess he isn't too worried. 
What's this all about, Mac? Uh, Doc, I'll explain it to you later. Right now, i got to find Chester. Oh, Chester, yes, he's down in the office. I just left him. Oh, good. I sure hope he's had a lot of sleep lately. What's that? He's going to be pretty busy tonight. I'll see you later, Doc. Did you follow him all night, Chester? Oh, Mr. Dillon, I'm about ready to drop. Everything's getting hazy. Where is he? In the restaurant there? Yes, sir, that's where he went. He gambled the entire night. I swear I don't know how he stays awake. I can't hardly keep my eyes open. Oh, rub a rouser or tobacco juice on him, Chester. That'll help. Oh, my goodness. He just come out the door. Yeah, he's seen us. Stand steady. Yes, sir. Marshal, I, uh, I got a complaint. Now, is that so? It sure is. I had an idea this man's tracking me all night had something to do with you. Oh, how'd you know I was following you? Mister, you might as well have been wearing snowshoes with cowbells tied on them. Now, that's not true. That's a dog on Never mind, now, Chester, I... never mind. What is your complaint, mister? Well, you... Can't a decent citizen ride into the Dodge and do a little gambling without being haunted by your man here? Well, that depends on how decent the citizen really is. What name do you go by, anyway? My own. Jermo. Jermo? <laughs> is that all there is to it? That's all. Yeah. Well, Jermo, I just didn't want you to leave town without my knowing about it. Why not? I ain't done nothing. Well, Doc told me about your partner. The one who tore his arm on some wire. What about him? Well, I'm curious to see if you're going to take care of him, that's all. Well, of course I am. He'll die if you don't hurry. Well, I... I'm going after him. When? Well, it's no business of yours, when. And anybody following me is likely to run into trouble. From a shotgun, Tremo? I don't use a shotgun, Marshal. Your partner's dying, Jermo. You're wasting time. And he's dying. He's my partner, not yours. I'll take care of him. Sure. Sure, Jermo. But you better hurry. Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, since 1910, the work output of each of us has more than doubled, and the average annual income has gone from $2,400 a year to about $4,000. Yet about 18 hours has been cut off the average work week. These facts add up to the better we produce, the better we live. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. <laughs> Chester had been up all night, so I sent him to bed, and I hired a Kiowa Indian I knew to keep an eye on Jermo. But even though his partner was dying of gangrene from the bullet wound he'd received at the stage holdup, Jermo didn't leave Dodge that day, or the next. He knew I'd track him to their hideout into the stolen money if he did, and he wasn't the kind of a man who'd risk his own neck just to save his partner's life. And since I had no real evidence yet, there was no use arresting him. So, all I could do was wait. That Indian is a wonder to behold, Mr. Dillon. He hasn't slept a wink in two whole days, and he don't even look tired. No, but Jumbo looked tired the last time I saw him. Oh, he's been sleeping regular. Yeah, I know. But all this is wearing him out just the same. 
Yeah, he's getting pretty spooky. Well, I should think he would, with what he's got on his conscience. I better ask Sartank if he knows another Kiowa who could spell him for a while. I think he's got a cousin around here somewhere. Oh, it makes my bones ache just to think about him not sleeping at all. Marshal, uh, I, I I got something to tell you. Huh? Well, who are you? Well, my name is Verd, but I, I'm nobody, Marshal. Just a cowboy. Well, there's nothing wrong with being a cowboy, Bert. Sometimes there is. Like yesterday. Oh, uh, what's the trouble? Uh, I found a dead man, Marshal, out on the prairie. How'd he die? Well, it looked to me like he got shot. That's why I come to you. Did you bury him? No. No, I, I wrapped a blanket around him, though. Uh, where is he, Bert? Not far from here. Maybe... Fifteen miles? Yeah. Chester. Yes, sir? Get our horses. We'll ride out and have a look. Yeah. yeah he's still there, Marshal. Nothing's been eaten on him. He sure got himself hid out here. My, it's a wonder anybody ever found him. Uh, Bird, you, uh, you, you want to take the blanket off of him? Sure. There. Yeah. Um, uh, how did you know he'd been shot? Well, his arm, it's all... Roll up, Marshal, and then you see here, I noticed that bullet hole in his sleeve there. Yeah. Well, looks like you've made yourself a thousand dollars, Bert. What? Wells Fargo offered it for this man, dead or alive. He robbed the stage a few days back. He did? Well, ain't I in luck. And there's another thousand for whoever finds the money he stole. It's probably buried around here somewhere, don't you think, Mr. Dillon? Hey, that reminds me. I noticed uh, something funny over there in the mant hills. Like the ground being dug up. Show us, Bert. Yeah. Sure, Marshal. Right over here, ways. There. See it? Right there? Right by that big one? Yeah. Well, I declare. Huh. By golly, I think he's right, Mr. Dillon. There's something been buried here, all right? Yeah. I think I can... Yeah, there, there it is. There, I got it. Hey, look you there, Marshal. It's, it's a money bag. And I found it, didn't I? Yes, sir. That's right, Bert. Here, look at that. It's real money, all right. Marshal... I found it, so I, I, I get the reward, won't I? Because I, I knew where it was. Yeah, you sure did, Burton. We dug up the rest of the money and then made the hole into a grave. And we buried the dead man right there. On the way back to Dodge, I told Verd he could talk all he wanted about finding the bandit's body and the reward he'd collect for it, but that he wasn't to say a word about the money we'd recovered. He couldn't understand why, and I didn't explain it to him, but I warned him he'd never get a penny of either reward if he didn't do as I said. Back in town, I didn't let him out of my sight for the next two days. I figured it'd make Jermo pretty worried. And it sure did. <laughs> you know, it, it's mighty good to get off of that prairie just for change. Mm, should think it would be. <laughs> you don't come to town much, do you? i never seen you around here before. Well, I, I've been too broke, Chester. Well, sir, it sure takes money to see the elephant in Dodge nowadays. <laughs> I'll be able to afford it soon enough. Ain't, ain't that right, Marshal? Yeah, it looks that way, Bird. Yeah, you've been mighty lucky. <laughs> So far. What do you mean, so far? Nothing. Nothing. Evening, Marshal. 
Ah, uh, hello, Jumbo. Uh, this the fellow who found your bandit for you? Yeah, I was just telling him how lucky he is. Yeah. Yeah, all that reward money. Thousand dollars, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Is that all you're getting, mister? What do you, what do you mean, is that all? Well, there was more reward than that offered. Oh, you mean the stolen money. Oh, it's too bad about that, wasn't it, Bert? We, we didn't, we didn't find no stolen money. You didn't? Oh, but look everywhere. There'd been some digging nearby, but, uh, <laughs> there was nothing in the hole. Well, well, now, what do you make of that? Just plain disappeared, huh? Yeah, yeah. Looks that way. Well, that's sure too bad, ain't it? But you can't have all the money in the world, mister. I ain't got all the money in the world. I'll see you later. Marshal, I, I, I did like you told me. I, I, I didn't say nothing. You did fine, Ferd. Just fine. <laughs> When we left the saloon a little later, I noticed Germo standing in the darkness of the alley, waiting. I was pretty sure he'd follow us as we crossed the plaza and walk up Front Street. When we reached Kelly's stable, Bird wanted to go in and see if his horse had been fed, so we said goodnight and left him there. Chester and I walked on a little ways. Then we turned off the street. We went back entered the stable from the rear. Inside, we could hear voices. And we sneaked up from stall to stall until we were close enough to make them out. Tell me where the money is, Bert. What did you do with it? I told you, Jim. The marshal's got it. We dug it up. You're lying. Now, who turned in $2,000 to collect $1,000? You stole it and hid it somewhere else. No, I didn't. I tell you. The marshal himself said there'd been some digging nearby. Now, what'd you do with it, Bert? Now, tell me before I kill you. No, no. Listen a minute, Jermo. Look, when you didn't come back, see, I, I figured you got caught. And then Charlie died and... I got scared. Uh, you always was a coward. That's why we left you in the bushes with a rifle when we stopped the stage. No, that don't matter. But look, Jeremy, don't you see this way? We're both safe. Because I'll, I'll split both the rewards with you. You know I will. You're lying. And I'm going to kill you for it. No, now don't. You're... Hold it. Come on. Come on. Uh, you're next, Marshal. <laughs> You should have had your shotgun, Jermo. I should have killed you with the holder. That was my big mistake. No. If you'd have trusted Verd, you both could have got by with us. He was telling me the truth? He was. And you'd have never been convicted on what evidence I had. Well, I guess every man's entitled to, to make a few mistakes. Marshal? <laughs> Jermo? Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, John Daner, and Lawrence Dobkin. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, 
fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. This Monday night, Frank Lovejoy stars on CBS Radio's Suspense. Remember, Monday night, Frank Lovejoy in On a Country Road, presented by radio's outstanding theater of thrills, suspense over most of these same stations. George Walsh speaking. For mystery mixed with merriment, join Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. horse over here, Benson. Sure, Jake. Wait till we get him up on his horse before you tie that rope to wall. There'd be too much slack otherwise. Yeah. It couldn't hang you very good with your feet touching the ground, could we, Tim? No, Jake, you couldn't. We've been neighbors a long time, Tillman. If I could figure some way to make the noose bust your neck, I'd do it for you. It's all right. But you get to hanging, I could put a bullet in you. I'd be beholden to you. Okay, I'll do it then. Yeah. Would you drop by and tell my wife on your way home, Jake? Sure. I figured on doing that anyway. Thanks. I always liked you, Tillman. It's kind of too bad about this. Sure. You're mighty calm for a man with a noose around his neck. You men got your minds made up. Wow, we can't have no man stealing horses around here. We'd none of us feel safe less than we caught and hung them. I reckon I'd feel the same way, Jake. Of course you would. You'd hang me just as fast if I'd done it. I would. Only difference is I'd want to be awful sure it was you that done it. Oh, I'm sure. Heck, we caught you red-handed, didn't we? I told you a hundred times I found them horses running wild. I was driving them back to you. Now, Tillman, you was headed in the other direction. He got away from me. I was trying to turn him back. Except we don't believe you. None of us do. Well, ask Jennings. He saw me rounding them up for you. Jennings ain't here. Well, why don't you find him? Can't take the time. You delay a hanging, the first thing you know, the man's got loose. It just encouraged horse thieving. Like I said, you got your minds made up. We got to protect ourselves, Tillman. Here's his horse, Jake. Get him out of Tillman. Sure. Okay, Duval. Take up the slack and tie it. Hey, hey, look out there, Jake. Someone's coming. So they are. Let's get this done. 
You might have trouble. He's a long way off yet. We got time. You want to slap his horse, Benson? No. You do it, Jake. Okay. So long, Tillman. So long. Hello, Jay. Hello, Miss Tillman. Come on inside. Oh, thanks, ma'am. I'll stay out here. Suit yourself. My husband ain't here, Jake. He's out in the prairie someplace. I know. Clay's around, though. Want to see him? No. I want to see you. Me? What about? About your husband, Miss Tillman. Something's happened to him. Well... It was like this, ma'am. You know, me and Duval and Benson's been losing some horses lately. I heard. But Tillman ain't, somehow. And when we caught him driving a bunch of mine this afternoon, we figured it was him who's been stealing them. I don't believe it. My husband's an honest man. I know that. Now, Jennings saw him rounding them up where he found them running wild on the prairie. I guess whoever had stolen got scared and left them there. Where's my husband, Jake? That's what I want to explain to you, ma'am. Jeannie's come and told us about it. But he got there too late. Too... Too late? We'd already hung him. Hung him? Yes, ma'am. Clay, Clay, come out here. What is it, Mom? Well, hello there, Jake. Hello, Clay. Tell him what you done, Jake. Done? Clay, we hung your old man this afternoon. You what? We hung him for stealing horses. Pa? They found out he didn't do it. After. Yeah. I uh, guess the joke's on us, all right. Wait, Ma. He's kind of upset, Clay. You better go with her. Somebody ought to kill you, Jake. Now, don't talk like that. I said we were sorry. I got to get home. It's kind of late. Cheer up, Matt. Spring will be here in a few months. Yeah, sure. You're still bothered by the Tillman hanging, aren't you? He was lynched, Kitty. All right, lynched. You'll never find out who did it. Now, that was nearly three weeks ago. Well, I got a pretty good idea who did it. That I can't be sure. No? Who? Probably some of the ranchers out there who've been losing horses. Benson and Duval and Jake Kaiser in particular. Benson? I heard he got shot the other night, right in his own house. Yeah, I did. Just a week ago. Maybe his conscience was bothering him, Matt. No? What do you mean? Well, maybe the other two killed him to keep him from talking. Uh, maybe. Or anyway, had it coming to him. It's still murder, Kitty. You feel worse about Tillman, don't you? There's nothing I hate more than a lynching. And knowing Tillman, my guess is he was completely innocent. What about Mrs. Tillman and the boy? Do they have any ideas? Well, if they have, they didn't tell me. Well, you've done all you can, Matt. Yeah, yeah, sure. Huh. I might 
as well be in St. Louis. Huh? I like St. Louis, Matt. Well, why don't you go, then? I don't know. I guess I'm afraid of the dark. What? What are you talking about? Never mind, Matt. Oh, Matt. Oh, hello, Doc. Oh, hello, Kitty. Sit down, Doc. Oh, thank you. Yeah, don't mind if I do it. Say that fella Duval, Matt. Yeah, what about him? He's over in my office. What? Oh, what for? He's been shot, Matt. Shot. Dead. What? His hired hand brought him in. What did this happen? Well, early tonight he said, you know, it's a funny thing, Matt. Duval was shot through the window of his house. With a fifty caliber rifle. I dug the bullet out. Just like Benson. Yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting myself. That makes Jake Kaiser the only one left, Matt. Why, you think Jake didn't? I don't know. Well, he's been sitting right over there in a card game since noon. Uh, are you sure of that, Kenny? Well, I was gone for an hour, but he was there when I left, and he was there when I got back. Well, he couldn't have done it in an hour, Matt. No. Um, Look, Matt, he's leaving. Yeah, uh, excuse me. I'll be right back. Oh, uh, Jake. Hello, Marshal. Uh, uh, Jake, uh, let's sit on a minute, huh? I, I want to talk to you. Sure, Marshal. What's it about? Ah, uh, here's the table. Kind of late getting out home. Uh, Jake, Duval was shot tonight. He was? Yeah. Killed the same way Benson was. Same way? Uh-huh. You, uh, know anything about it? Well, I'm beginning to, Marshal. Is that Tillman boy, Clabe? I know it is. Why would he do it, Jake? Oh, he's crazy, that's why. Marshal, I'll tell you. Clabes took it into his head that we hung this old man. Oh? How do you know he has? I saw him right here in town this morning. And he was here last Saturday, too, come to think of it. You talk to him? Sure. And he keeps saying that we done it. Why? Don't you believe anything he says, nor Miss Tillman either. They're both liars, Marshal. I've known them a long time to be liars. Jake, did, uh... Clay threatened you. Sure he did. You go arrest him, Marshal. Well, there's not much evidence. I just told you. Yeah, I know. You mean you ain't going to arrest him? No. Not yet. Well, he ain't going to shoot me. I'm going to go kill him on the way home. Right tonight. You're talking to a U.S. Marshal, Jake. Oh. Well, yeah. Well, all right, then you do something about it. I will. But you got any ideas of shooting him out of your head? If you'll arrest him, I will. And don't you forget what liars they are out there. You leave it to me, Jake. You hear? Sure. Not for long, Marshal. Not for very long. <laughs> Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, a reminder to you Western fans. America's favorite singing cowboy, Gene Autry, rides to new adventure and sings plenty of songs with the Melody Ranch Gang tomorrow night. You'll want to follow Gene's latest exciting adventures of the wide open West. And you'll enjoy the offerings down Melody Ranch Way, too, when CBS Radio sends the Gene Autry Show galloping your way tomorrow night on most of these same stations. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Jake Kaiser was a senseless kind of man. And I knew he'd probably go kill young Clay Tillman the first time it happened to occur to him again. Still, I couldn't arrest Clay for two murders just on Jake's word that he'd threatened him. 
I needed a lot more evidence than that. And the only way of getting it I could think of was from Clay himself. So the next morning, Chester and I rode out to the Tillman place. It was only about 15 miles from town, and we got there early. I just don't understand these people, Mr. Dillon. Oh, what do you mean, Chester? Well, sir, if young Clay was sure enough about Duval and Benson to kill him, why didn't he come to you and have him arrested? He's taking an awful chance this way. Well, nobody came to the law when they hanged Tillman. But maybe someday they'll learn to. Well, they won't if they can go on murdering each other and get by with it. Now, let's tie up here, Chester. Hold on. Oh. Nice place Tillman made here, ain't it? Well, he worked hard on it, Chester. <laughs> now, come on, let's see if Clay's around. All right, sir. to have me a place like this. Well, he didn't build it on gambling money, Chester. No, sir. Hello, Marshal. Chester. Morning, Miss Oh, hello, ma'am. Come on inside. Oh, thank you. Sit down. Thank you. Well, uh, I I don't want to bother you, ma'am. No bother. Well, I was looking for Clay, but I'd like to talk to him. He's out back. He'll be here in a minute. Oh, good. Good. Uh, Miss Tillman, have you heard about uh, Duval? He was killed last night. All right. Uh, well, don't you care? Several people have been murdered around here lately, Marshal, including my husband. You think Benson and Duval were in on that? I didn't say they were. What about uh, Jake Kaiser? You're prying, Marshal. That's the trouble with the law. It's always prying. What do you want Clay for? Well, I thought he might tell me what he knows. You won't. We don't know nothing. And Clay ain't shot nobody. He was in Dodge yesterday. Yeah, I know he was. I wouldn't put it past Jake to have shot Duval himself. Well, I've thought of that, too. Do you have any idea why he might have? No. Here's Clabe now. We got visitors. Hello, Clabe. Marshal? Chester? How are you, Clabe? You, uh, been hunting this morning? No. Put that rifle back where it belongs, son. Okay, Ma. I was shooting hawks with it yesterday. Left it in the barn. You should have brought it in last night, son. Sure. But, well, it was dark when I got back, Ma. I didn't see it out there. Yeah. I should have brought it in myself. What are you doing here, Marshal? Duval was murdered last night, Clint. He was? Yeah. Shot, same as Benson. Well, what do you know? Uh, Jake Kaiser thinks that uh, you did it. He does, huh? Uh Uh-huh. He also said that you threatened to kill him next. Maybe I ought to. Clay, don't talk like that. Okay, Ma. How are you going to prove I killed anybody, Marshal? Well, if you have, I'll find out somehow. Go ahead. There's a law against murder, Clay. They murdered my pa. Where was the law then? I'd have had him in jail right now if I knew who they were. Too bad you weren't there, Marshal. Well, I could still arrest Jake. We don't know nothing about Jake. Do we, son? No. No, we don't know nothing. Leave us alone, Marshal. We got trouble enough. Okay. Okay, Clay. But you'll hang for murder if you kill Jake. Come along, Chester. Uh, 
I just saw him, Mr. Dillon, walking right up Front Street. Oh, Clay? Yes, sir. It's Saturday, and he's back in town, just like you said he'd be. Well, I wasn't too sure, Chester. Jake might have killed him during the week. It must have slipped his mind somehow. I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dillon. Clay's gonna ride past Jake's place on his way home, ain't he? Oh, the man's been killed each Saturday the last two weeks. It could happen again. You gonna stop it? Get our horses, Chester. We'll ride out to Jake's. Now? Hadn't we ought to follow Clay when he leaves? No, it's Jake I want to keep an eye on. I don't understand. Just get the horses, Chester. Yes, sir. And uh, be sure there's a roof on my saddle, huh? We gonna hang somebody? No, now get going. Yes, sir. Jake's just sitting in the house there. Plum unconcerned, Mr. Dillon. Somebody just got off a horse out there by the corral. I thought I heard a horse. Gosh, I wish there was a moon tonight. Oh, it's better dark. Stay out of the way of my rope, Chester. You gonna rope it? Quiet now. Now, Chester. All right, grab the rifle, Chester. Yes, sir. I, I got it. No. No, let me go. Why, he's a woman, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, that's why I used the rope. All right, stand up now, Miss Tillman. Come on. You shouldn't have stopped me, Marshal. It won't do any good. Two murders are enough, aren't they? I was saving Jake for the last. I wanted him to sweat. And I'll kill him yet. Who's out there? It's Marshal Dillon, Jake. Now put the gun down. What's going on here? Why, well, it's Ms. Tillman. Yeah. She wants to kill you, Jake. A woman? That's a 50 caliber sharps. I think that'd do it. You sure would. You killed Benson Duval with it, didn't you? I'll kill you if I have to use a knife, Jake Kaiser. A woman? Going around killing people. That's terrible. You hung my husband. One of the best men that ever lived. I told you it was a mistake. I said we were sorry. That's what I've been waiting to hear, Jake. <laughs> no. All right, get his gun, Chester. Here it is, Mr. Dillon. All right, throw it away. With pleasure. Now, you're both under arrest, Miss Tillman. Well, as long as Jake hangs, too. He'll hang. What will Clay think? He knew about this when he found your rifle in the barn last week. And I guess he figured there was no way to stop you. You found the only way, Marshal. I guess maybe I should have told you everything from the first. Yeah. Yeah, but it's too late now. I'm sorry. Don't you feel bad about it, Marshal? I don't mind. I don't really mind at all. I know you don't, Miss Tillman. And that's the worst part of it. Smoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Helen Klebe, Sam Edwards, Ted Bliss, and Herb Ellis. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in gun smoke.
transatlantic telephone call with Ingrid Bergman about her plans to tour as Joan of Arc, a preview of the London Company of Kismet, and an introduction to Renee Jean Mayer, star of the forthcoming Broadway production, The Girl in the Pink Tights. All this and more takes place on Mike Wallace's Stage Struck, now heard Sundays on most of these same CBS radio stations. Tomorrow at its new Sunday afternoon time, go Stage Struck at the star's address. George Wall speaking. Lionel Barrymore's Radio Hall of Fame is great Sunday night drama on the CBS Radio Network. Smoke. Transcribed earlier today from CBS. Around that city and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. <laughs> William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moves west with young America, the story of a man who moves with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. ahead there, Mr. Dillon. Somebody's gone and left his wagon right out on the prairie. Now oh, there's a man down in front of it, Chester. It sure looks like his team went off and left him. Now, uh, what would he be doing out here with a busted wagon and no team? Well, I expect he'll be glad to tell us. Come on. Get up. Mike Blocker. Yeah. Hello, Mike. Hello there. Well, it's a perfect for a man to be in the day before his wedding. Mike. <laughs> it sure is. Well, it'll keep me sober, Marshal, and Matilda will appreciate that even if I don't make Dodge tonight. <laughs> what happened, Mike? Where's your team? Oh, Chester, we hit a hole back there and the whiffle tree busted and that team... <laughs> They just run off like they was glad to get shed of the whole dang thing. Well, that must have been quite a hole you had to do this. No, not much. <laughs> Look at here, Marshal. Uh, the bar's been sawed, happened too. Sure. It's them boys again. What boys? Them two crazy cowboys I hired on last fall. Uh, Plumber and Webb, you mean? Yeah. yeah. They've been funning me a lot lately. You mean this is just a joke? <laughs> it's what they figured, I guess. Well, it ain't much of a joke when you're a man stranded on the prairie this way, especially when he's trying to get to town to be married. <laughs> now, this ain't so bad. Just yesterday, they cut the stinks on my saddle. <laughs> but thing the bronze got loose and bucked it off before I could get mounted. I wish I were as even-tempered as you are, Mike. Well, Marshal, it, uh, it don't pay to get mad. no. But it seems to me Plummer and Webb are going a little far with their jokes. <laughs> don't they want you to get married? I don't know. I never asked you. Now, where are they now? Oh, they rode into Dodge this morning. Oh. Now, they'd see me at the wedding. I had to bring the wagon so they could carry Matilda back to the ranch. Well, we'll find your team for you. Maybe we can rig up a whiffle tree of some sort. You can buy a new one in Dodge. Oh, I'd be beholden to you, Mark. Ah, right, you'll get to town in time for a drink yet. We'll ride along with you to see what you do, Mike. <laughs> Well, no, sir. If you don't mind, Mr. Dillon, I think I'll go on down to the depot. 
The Santa Fe is about due, and I like to watch it come in. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll leave you here, then. So do thank you, though, old thing. Well, uh, I didn't say that I was buying. You'd have had to. I'm broke. <laughs> Man has to be mighty careful of what he says around you. I'll see you later. Okay, sir. Bring me a beer, Sam, will you? Hello, Matt. Hello, Kitty. Sit down. Yeah. I'm uh, here if it hadn't been for you and Chester. Mike Barker never would have got the town today. Wrote in an hour ago, and you already heard about it? Matilda told me. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about you and Matilda. She's the only lady in this town who is my friend. Is your beer? Oh, thanks, man. Ah, you going to the wedding, Kitty? He insists that I do. Uh, you're pretty close friends, aren't you? Pretty close, man. I guess it's partner so she can talk to me about things she wouldn't even dare mention to her nice friend. Now, they're no better than you are, Kitty. Maybe not. But there are more of them in the long run. That makes a difference. Why do you want to know about Matilda and me? Well, I've been wondering if there's any reason why either of those cowboys who work for Mike Blocker wouldn't want that wedding to come off tomorrow. Plumber and wet? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You must have some reason for wondering about it, man. Well... Man's friends always treat him a little rough before he gets married, but these boys have carried it pretty far. There's jealousy, Matt. No. Which one? Plummer. He and Matilda used to see each other once in a while. Till she met Mike and fell in love with him. No. Has the uh, plumber threatened her? Or Mike? He's afraid of Mike in spite of his gentle temper. Yeah, he should be. But he told Matilda he'd make as much trouble as he could. What kind of trouble? Anything that'll embarrass her, I guess. Like a chivalry, but real unfriendly. Now, they started their chivalry a little early. They even tried to get Mike crippled up a couple of days ago. Oh, I didn't know about that. Oh, nothing came of it, but I sure don't like to see anybody's wedding day spoiled. I think I'll look those two up and have a talk with them. I swear I've been in every saloon in Dodge, Mr. Jones. Maybe they ain't in town after all. Well, we'll try the hotel, Chester. Why don't you just throw them in jail till the wedding's over? I'd like to. Now, wait a minute. There they are. Yes. It's him, all right. I saw Mike over the Longhorn taking on a few. Well, even marrying a good woman makes a man nervous. Oh, it sure does. Well, just the thought of it, and I want to go live with the Comanche. <laughs> well, you can't let other men do all the marrying. Why not? I don't know, just even if what they say. On your mind, Marshal. I seen you come all the way across the plaza. Well, I wanted to talk to you about the, the wedding tomorrow. Oh? You ought to be talking to Mike Blocker. He's the one that's getting married. We ain't, are we, Webb? No, we ain't. Did you think we were? All right, that's enough. You're not dealing with Mike Blocker now. You're dealing with me, and my temper's a whole lot quicker than his. No offense. Marshal, that didn't mean nothing. No, I didn't mean nothing. We're just in kind of good spirits. <laughs> On account of the wedding and all. For sure, you know how it is, Marshal. You call it good spirits to try to get a man hurt two days before his wedding? How? Cutting the cinch on his saddle. Oh, Mike told you. He did. He didn't seem to mind as much as you do, Marshal. Don't be fooled by that. If Mike ever does get mad, there's going to be trouble. But I'm telling you to leave him alone. Oh, we ain't going to do nothing. Maybe a little chivalry after the wedding, that's all. I don't want either one of you anywhere near that wedding. Oh, now, Marshal, we were divided. The invitation's off. You understand me? Oh, but Marshal... Shut up, Webb. He's the law. We won't go near the wedding if he says so. I say we won't go nowhere as near it. 
That satisfy you, Marshal? Joe, 
I'm the bartender. Well, what happened here, Joe? Why, man was crazy. He's still here, Marshal? No, he's gone. Who was he, Joe? The fellow that plum and web worked for Mike something. He was awful mad, Marshal. Awful drunk, too. Where'd Plummer go? I don't know. I tried to stop it, but they hit me. Knocked me out. Was anybody else in here? Just them, and then Mike come in. Now, Joe Webb's lying on the other side of the bar. He's dead. Dead? Yeah. Do you see who killed him? He pulled a knife on Mike. He was going to use it, too. Somebody killed him, huh? Was it Mike? I got hit about that, Marshal. I didn't see no more. All right, Joe. You do something about Webb there, huh? Look what they did to my place. It's ruined. Who's going to pay for all this? I don't know, Joe, but I'll try to find out. I didn't find out. Not that night, anyway. We looked around the oasis inside and out, and then I sent Chester down to wait for Mike and Casey showed up at Matilda's place. So I scouted the town again. But shortly after daybreak, we both gave up and met back at the office. Miss Kitty was down here, Miss Dillon. She stayed with Matilda all night. Oh, good. How's Matilda taking it? Well, I don't think she cares about her clothes anymore. She's so worried about Mike. Uh, you uh, didn't tell her about Webb being killed, did you? Oh, my goodness, no, sir. I wouldn't do that. She'll find out soon enough, poor thing. What's Mike? Yeah, Mike. Come to turn myself in, Marshal. Where you been, Mike? Sleep, sleep. Oh, it's coming. Oh, I don't know. I was so drunk and so mad, I, I don't remember much of anything. Think he knocked me on the head while I was finishing off Webb. I know I ain't seen Plummer since. I've just been down to the Oasis. Joe ain't seen him neither. Well, nobody has, I know. But where were you? Oh, I was awful drunk, Marshal. I must have got as far as Kelly's stable. Crawled into a stall there. At least that's where I woke up this morning. Well, I'm going to have to lock you up, Mike. Yeah, that's why I come. Marshal, that was a bad thing they done to Matilda. Yeah, it was. But you shouldn't have killed anybody for it. Well, uh, maybe. Lock him up, Chester. Yes, sir. Um, I'll bring back some coffee. This way, Mike. My, I sure am sorry to have to lock up a man like you, Mike. Uh, if you didn't, Chester, I'd just go find Plummer and kill him. There you are. Yeah. Mr. Dillon be back directly. Then you can have some coffee. I don't want nothing. What for? 
So they'd hang you for it. Well, then what are you doing here now? I've already admitted to killing him. I got to thinking, that's why. Thinking what? Well, when Doc gets a look at Webb, he'll know you couldn't have hit him that hard. Anyway, I figured you'd remember about it all. Uh, they'll hang you, plumber. Not me. I'm going to kill you, and then I'm going to be gone to Texas. You shoot me, or I'll hear you. I ain't going to shoot you. Less than I have to. I'm going to cut you, Mike. And you won't look very good when Matilda sees you. Matilda? <laughs> we was friends once, Mike. Real good friends. You know the kind. You uh, and Matilda. I, I'll tell you what it was like while I'm cutting your throat. Get out of that cell now. <laughs> I got... Chester. You all right? It was... It, it was Plummer, Miss Lillian. He uh, hit me. I'm okay now. Well, come on, then. Come on. The mic's gone. Plummer must let him out. Let him out. Not on his public killing. Let's look out back. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Doggone if Dodge ain't grown a heap since I was here. It is very big, stuff. 
Front Street must have seven, eight saloons. A lot of towns I've seen don't even have that many houses. We are going to stay here? Now, Nina, I told you not to fret yourself. Nobody's going to bother you. Well, look there. The Longhorn Saloon. You know, a man might find whiskey fit to drink in a place like that. Just drop your reins over the rack, Nina. Your old pony ain't about to go nowhere. I will wait right here, Scott. Here in the dust and heat? Come on, get down off that old horse. You've been riding so long, you need to walk around some. All right. Anyway, it's cooler inside. If they got a ladies' parlor, you can sit in there. Well, sit on the porch. Come on. Father, there's a side door over there, Nina. You go on in and wait. Glass of rye, bartender. Hold that drink, bartender. Maybe you picked the wrong place to drink, mister. That's so? Places down along the river let next women come in and sit. I've heard tell. Maybe that's where you better go. Bartender, I ain't got my drink yet. Mister, you don't understand what I said. That bartender ain't gonna give you no drink. Maybe he is. No, he ain't. This place don't serve nobody that walks in with no dirty Mexican. All right, hold it. Very well, thank you. Hold it. All right, you men, take Lawson out to our horse trough and soak his head for him. The rest of you get about your business. Go on. You busted up what could have been a man-sized fight. Well, fights like that lead to killings. <laughs> Down if they don't. Now, you're a cool one, mister. You get that way in my profession. Oh, what's that? Army scout. I'm on my way to Fort Wallace. What's yours? United States Marshal. My name's Dillon. I noticed they paid you a heap of attention. I'm Cuff Peters and proud to know you. Marshal, I want you to meet somebody. This here is Nina. She's my wife. How do you do? Ma'am? God, I... Nina and me have been traveling quite a spell. Oh? Where'd you ride from? Come up from Texas. Figured we'd stay over here in Dodge if I can find a place. Nina's been feeling poorly. How long do you figure on staying in Dodge, Cuff? Can't rightly say, Marshal. Why? Well, you uh, made trouble for yourself when you hit Hank Lawson. That right. It'll bother him, Cuff, and he'll be after you. I know you can't make Fort Wallace, so it uh, might be better if you and your wife rode out to Fort Dodge and stayed there. He's right, Cuff. We should go on right now. We don't want no trouble. You've been riding enough, the way you feel. Besides, I got things to do. Look, uh, Cuff, I don't want any trouble here. I sure don't aim to cause any. Now, how about joining me in a drink, Marshal? I still got a glass of rye coming. Dodge was real quiet for the next week, except when a drunk-up cowboy tried to burn the town down because he lost at a faro table. I kept an eye on Hank Lawson, but the trouble I'd been expecting between him and Cuff Peters seemed to blow over. Chester heard somewhere that Cuff had found a room for Nina and himself at the Widow Helgerson's place out at the edge of town. I didn't see Cuff again except once when he drove the Widow's buckboard into town loaded it up with food and supplies and drove back out. Then one morning while Chester was cleaning up the office, Cuff walked in. Morning, Marshal. Oh, hello, Cuff. I never did get a chance to pay you back for that drink you bought me. The time will come, Marshal. <clears throat> oh, uh, Cuff, this is uh, Chester Proudfoot. Cuff Peters. 
Well, sir, I'm that proud, Mr. Peters. Howdy. <laughs> Mr. Dillon told me how you knocked old Hank Lawson across the bar at the Longhorn. I sure do wish I'd seen that. Uh, Chester isn't too fond of Hank. Well, if I'm going to hit him again, I'll let you know. Well, thank you. Marshal, what I come for was to get your help. Oh, what is it, Cuff? Well, I don't know much about doctors and all. They say you're a good friend to the one in town. Oh, I've known Doc for a long time. What do you need? Well, I'm not ailing, but Nina's feeling real puny. Oh? I think maybe someone should have a look at her. We ain't been married but five, six months. I don't understand much about women folk and their ailments. Uh, Chester, run up and get Doc, will you? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. You see, Marshal, the thing that bothers me the most is that I got to start out for Fort Wallace right soon. I already stayed here longer than I intended. Well, if your wife's sick, you can't take her with you on a ride like that. That's what I want to know from the doc. Is she too sick to ride? Oh, you, you could leave her here. She could come on later. Mm hmm. I'd just pure hate to leave her behind if I didn't have to. Oh, uh, hello, Matt. Mm -hmm. Where's the patient? Uh, Doc, this is Cuff Peters, uh, Doc Adams. How do you do, Mr. Howdy. Uh, Mr. Peters wants you to have a look at his wife. I'm ready. My bag's by the door there. Doc, maybe you ought to know, before you come with me, my wife's Mexican. Well? The only reason I mention it, some folks here seem to take exception. Oh, for heaven's sake, standing here talking isn't going to help Mrs. Peters any if she's sick, you know. You ready to go, young fellow? I'm ready, Doc. Marshal, I want to thank you. Sure, Cub. Goodbye. Go on. See you later, man. He's a nice little fellow, ain't he, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, he seems to be, Chester. Hey, what's he do for a living? He's an army scout, he says. On his way out to Fort Wallace. Well, I always had in mind that scouts was more tricky. Shucks, he's no more sly than me. <clears throat> Yeah, don't let Cuff fool you, Chester. He's small, but uh, he can take care of himself. Well, one thing, he don't seem to let nothing upset him, none. Well, he's worried about his wife, Chester. Plenty. Chester, you're going to get a bellyache. I can't help it, Mr. Dillon. Ever since I was a little boy, I just get a craving for wheat cakes at supper. Four servings? Well, I... It does make up to quite a pile, don't it? <laughs> oh, but then that molasses kind of keeps them wetted down. Oh, hello, Matt. <laughs> Chester. Uh, sit down, oh, Doc. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, you gonna eat? No, Matt, no. I ate out at Widow Helgeson's with the Cuff and his wife. Uh -huh. How is she, Doc? She's resting, isn't she? <laughs> uh, you know, she's a pretty little thing, Matt. Just as nice and sweet. Yeah, she is. Uh, what went wrong with her, Doc? <laughs> Nothing that won't be right in about six more months. Well, that don't make sense, Doc. She's gonna have a baby, just then. She is. Yeah, well, it only took a minute to see that. I guess Cuff meant it when he said he didn't know much about women. Well, I should think a baby be easy enough to tell about. At uh, Chester. <clears throat> oh, yes. Cuff sent a message to you, Matt. He's going on out to Fort Wallace. Says after he reports into the colonel and gets a place ready out there, he'll come back for Mrs. Peters. Now, that's a ten-day ride there and back, Doc. Huh? Well, I know, man. A little while, that's a... I don't like Mrs. Peters stand alone here in Dodge. Well, there's nothing to be worried about. She's in good hands here. Yeah, but the widow Huggerson's an old lady, Doc. She wouldn't be much help to Nina. Well, what kind of help would she be needing, Mr. Dillon? More than an old lady could give him. If Hank Lawson finds out that she's alone here. <laughs> Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this coming Tuesday night, you have one date with Pam and Jerry North and another date with John Lund as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. If mystery is your dish, then listen in as Mr. and Mrs. North and Johnny Dollar dish it out. Remember, the night is Tuesday, 
The network is CBS Radio, and the shows are Mr. and Mrs. North and yours truly, Johnny Dollar. They're here on most of these same stations this coming Tuesday. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. About everything, Mrs. Peters? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'll give you a hand out to the buckboard. Oh, it's not that much. I can carry it. Well, I'll get the door for you then, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Good day. Uh, good day, ma'am. Well, if it ain't Mrs. Peters come to town to do a week's shopping. I beg your pardon? Excuse me, ma'am. I ain't being very polite. This is Kane Twig. I'm Hank Lawson. What do you want? Now, surely you remember me, ma'am. You ought to. I was a fellow your husband hit in the mouth his first day in town. I remember you. Now, let me pass. Well, now, ain't I being a miserable cuss letting you carry all them heavy sacks? See, I help you some. Please. Well, just put them in the wagon for you. What? Oh. <laughs> Oh, that was mighty careless of me. They slipped plumb out of my hand. <laughs> I hope there was nothing in there to break. Leave me alone, please. <laughs> well, now, Mrs. Peters, I don't know why you're upset. You know I wouldn't do nothing to harm a fine lady like you. Besides, your husband might try to give me another lesson in manners, and that scares me real bad. <laughs> I just want to show you how much I learned. Now, you go on and get into that buckboard. <laughs> All we're going to do is just start you for home, Miss Peters. Untie them lines so we can face that team down the street. Sure. Now, like I say, ma'am, I don't want you to fret. <laughs> Stand aside, Twig. All right, ma'am, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> She's all right, Matt. She's fine. And the baby. There wasn't anything I could do. I... Those miserable, filthy now, beasts. Take it easy. Kid. Take it easy. What are you talking about, Matt? Those men should be. No, 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 no. Kid. Matt did all he could. He even roughed them up a little on the way to jail. Oh. And then yesterday morning, the judge fined them and turned them loose. Find them? Probably all of fifty dollars. Kitty, be sensible. You and your precious law. I'm sick of it. You have to go by it, Kitty, whether it seems right or not. I don't have to do you nothing. Now, now, Kitty, don't talk like that. There's a man. I'd shoot him in the belly. Oh, now, Kitty. <laughs> oh, leave me alone, both of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kitty. Look, Kitty. <laughs> Why don't you go in and, and talk with her, huh? She needs another woman. Huh? Go on. Lena, can I come in? Oh, it's terrible, Matt. I... Yeah. Well... What are you going to do? Well, there's nothing more I can do. Officially. No, I guess that's right. I... Look, Doc, I want you to keep Nina in your office. You can keep an eye on her there. Cuff will be back in a few days. And then... And then you will tell him? Yeah. Yeah, then I'll tell him. <laughs> Hello? 
Hello, Marshal. Chester. Oh, Mr. Peter. Uh, Cuff. I just got back. Widow Helgeson says there's been an accident. I should come see you. Well, uh, your wife was hurt bad, Cuff, but she's better now, though. Where is she? Uh, she's up in Doc's office. Uh, Chester will show you. I know the way. Just makes me sick, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he's likely been in the saddle all day riding to get back to her. Then he gets here and... How was she tonight? Well, she ate the supper Kitty brought over. That's more than she's done in a week. You know, I'd kindly hate to be Hank Lawson. Have you seen him around? Yes, sir. Him and Twig been hanging around the Longhorn. Hank asked me, was anybody looking for him? And he laughed. What'd you say to him? Nothing like you told me. I just walked on out. Yeah, good. What do you figure Cuff will do, Mr. Dillon? I don't know. Cuff's so mild and quiet and all. But I got a feeling he'd be mighty mean if once he got right. I... I want to thank you, Marshal, for all you and... Chester, Doc Dunn for Nina. I'm sorry, Cuff. Now, I wonder if you'd hold my gun for me. What are you going to do? I'm going to look for Hank Lawson, and I'm going to mock him. Mock him good. That way somebody's going to get hurt. That's a fact, Marshal. Look, Cuff, I won't stand for a killing. Now... Nina's well enough to travel. You, you could start for Fort Wallace. We'd fix a bed and a wagon for I'm you. I'm going to start for Wallace, all right. But not until I've seen Hank Lawson. Well? Will you hold my gun? Till you come back for it. Thank you. Oh, uh, Cuff. Yeah? Um... Uh, Chester and I were just talking about going up to Longhorn for a drink. We thought maybe we might walk with you. The company'd be fine, but it's my deal. Sure. see the marshal come along so he wouldn't get hurt. I'm just here to see that no shooting starts, Hank. Yeah. What's on your mind, Cuff? I left my gun at the marshal's office. So? After you drop yours on the floor, I'm going to make you bleed. Figure to take me with your fist? That's right. <laughs> All right, boys, move back. Make a little room here. <laughs> All right. All righty, Cuff. Load my gun down. Chester, just so Hank's friends don't get too excited and maybe want to help him out, move down to the end of the bar. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon? There'll be no gunplay here, Hank. What's between you and Cuff, you'll settle yourself. Right in here. That's good enough for me, Marshal. All right, little fella. Come and get it. Now I'm going to take you apart, Lawson. Bit by bit. That's the way you feel. Get up, Lawson. (laughs) 
You dirty little pig. I'm going to slit your throat. Drop that knife, Hank. Never mind, Marshal. He's going to fight with a knife. I'll fix me one, too. Yeah. Now, Lawson, if you're going to fight to cut, I'm ready. Fight or drop it. Now get out of here. Because if I see you again before I leave, I'm going to finish what it started. Oh, oh. My gracious alive, I ain't seen anything like that since I left Waco. Cub, as soon as you got your breath, I... I'd like to buy you that drink I owe you. Thank you, Marshal. I figure I could use it. Because my wife and me's got a long ride ahead of us. Smoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The special music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin and Lawrence Dobkin, with Lillian Bioff and James Eagles. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Later tonight on most of these same stations, Herb Schreiner will take your sense of humor in hand and give it a once-over wonderfully on Two for the Money. Hoosier Herb and his droll wit are an irresistible combination for merriment. The quiz part of Two for the Money makes the show that much more interesting to hear. Remember, Two for the Money later tonight. George Walsh speaking. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy open fire on your funny bone Sunday nights on the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the Territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, 
and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Take a look at these. What? Which do you think's prettiest? Ooh. I don't wear galluses, Kitty. Not like those, anyway. Oh, Matt. Mr. Jonas ordered them all the way from New York. We gotta encourage him. The store will never stock anything but beans and ammunition. <laughs> well, I can use beans and ammunition, but I won't wear those. Well, they're lovely. You'd look nice in a pair of bright suspenders. Galluses. All right, galluses. You like the purple ones? No. But they're not as bad as those pink and orange ones. But what is that they got stitched on them, anyway? Chickens? Don't be silly. They're parrots. Real fancy, Matt. Yeah, they sure are. I'll buy them for you. No, you won't. Please, Matt. Give them to Chester if you want. They're more his style than mine. All right, I will. You refuse to be elegant. I refuse. And if Chester has any sense, he will, too. Or in those people who think he's a whiskey drummer or a barber. <laughs> that beat's looking like a buffalo hunter. <laughs> Mr. Dillon? Oh, you looking for me, Chester? Uh, yes, sir. Hello, Miss Kitty. Good morning, Chester. Uh, Mr. Dillon, there's a sergeant from Fort Dodge over at the office. Major Evans sent him in. Oh, what does he want? He says the Major... W- Gracious alive, look at them galluses. My... What does he want, Chester? Uh, he says the Major wants to talk to you. Oh. Right away, he said. Chicken. Well, where is the Major? Hmm? The Major. Oh, uh, out at Fort Dodge, I guess. Oh, Chester, you tell the sergeant I might ride out sometime tomorrow if I'm not busy. Yes, sir. Well, it's only five miles, Matt. Might be important. I know. But uh, I've dealt with Major Evans before, Kitty. <laughs> Was there any mail this noon, Chester? No, sir, not a thing. For three days now. Yeah, that much less trouble. Uh Uh-oh. Here comes some trouble crossing the plaza. Now what? Uh, Major Evans. Huh? Then I guess he really does want to see me. Sure looks like it. Good afternoon, Marshal. Well, how are you, Major? Uh, Why don't you sit down? No, thanks, Hello, Major Evans. Hello, uh, Chester. Uh, Marshal, I sent Sergeant Bowers after you this morning. Well, I was figuring on maybe uh, riding out tomorrow, Major. I prefer not to wait another day. Oh, what's the trouble? Pawnees are raiding again. I hadn't heard that. Well, it's an army matter. Except for one thing. Oh? They've been supplied with rifles, Marshal, and I'm convinced those rifles come out of Dodge. Why? Well, it's the closest source of supply, and I want you to stop it. Well, I'll gladly stop it, Major. If it's true, we can find that out easily enough. How? We'll go over and see Mr. Jonas right across the street there. I'll be back shortly, Chester. Okay, sir. Come along. Who is this Jonas, Marshal? Uh, He's the only man in Dodge who sells rifles. Oh, I see. Anybody's been buying lately, he'll know. Can he be trusted? I trust him. Well, somebody's been buying rifles here, and they might have paid this Jonas to keep it quiet. He isn't that kind of a man, Major. Hmm. Well, I hope you're going to buy something this time, Marshal. Well, I'm afraid not, Mr. Jonas, but I want you to meet Major Evans from uh, Fort Dodge. How do you do, Major? Mr. Jonas? 
What can I do for you? We'd like to know if anybody's been buying rifles in quantity lately. Indian trouble, huh? Yeah, I told you, Marshal. Told him what? That you've been selling rifles to some gun smuggler. No, Major, I don't believe I have. Hmm? How do you know whether you have or not? Anybody can walk in here. Sure they can. But if I didn't know them, and they bought up a wagon load of rifles on the sudden, I'd tell the marshal about it right off. The only men who've ever been in here are buffalo hunters, and they only buy two or three rifles at the most. Well, Major, those rifles are coming from Dodge somehow. I know they are. And I'll stop it if I have to search every wagon that leaves here. You mean you'd use soldiers for that? Yes. That'd be trouble. Sooner or later, they'd try to stop some hardhead who'd start shooting. Soldiers are trained to shoot back, Marshal. I don't want innocent men shot down for no reason at all, The Major. Pawnees raided a ranch down on Crooked Creek just this morning, Marshal, 50 miles from here. But they did. But how come nobody's heard about it? The man and the woman can't be moved. And their two boys were killed at once. The cavalry patrol found them this morning and sent a messenger to the fort. Well, why didn't you tell me this before? we got to get dark down there. I'm on my way there myself. We'll give you an escort, Marshal. Good. If you can keep up with us. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, there is a definite betting pattern that overtakes a community when the gamblers move in. Hear the facts, plain, unvarnished. In the words of those actually involved, tomorrow when CBS Radio's hard-hitting Department of Public Affairs offers a full-hour documentary expose titled The Gamblers. Remember, it's tomorrow on most of these same stations. Don Hollenbeck narrates. And the brazen facts speak for themselves. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. nearly dawn when we reached what was left of the ranch on Crooked Creek. It had been burned, of course, and the stock destroyed. Half a dozen men of the cavalry patrol were standing on all-night watch while their Indian scout, Tobiel, slept peacefully in his blanket. The lieutenant in charge informed us that the man and the woman had both died soon after he dispatched his messenger to Fort Dodge. But Doc wanted to have a look at him anyway, so Major Evans and Chester and I went to the fire, had a cup of coffee. I don't know anything I'd rather have right now than this coffee. You ought to join the Army, Chester. The Army doesn't usually serve coffee all night, and I don't approve of this fire. Major, hmm? look at Tabeel over there. If he thought the Pawnees would be back, he'd have put the fire out himself. Mm, sound asleep. I suppose you're right, Marshal. After all, he's an Indian himself. He's a good scout, too. Yeah, I've known Tobiel a long time. Yeah, he's rather undisciplined. But valuable. I bet he is. On both counts. Oh, Doc. Well... Yeah. All the usual things, Matt. And, and a few new ones. Oh. Uh, Chester, hmm? uh, get Doc some coffee, will you? Oh, sure. Scalp, I suppose. For a start, Major. Worse than that? How that man lived as long as he did, uh, I don't know. You savage devils. But I think the woman was unconscious during most of it. The man must have tried to kill her and only grazed her head. How do you know, Doc? Here's your coffee, Doc. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chester. The groove across her head was too narrow for a rifle bullet, Matt. 
And I don't think those Pawnees had pistols. No, but they certainly had rifles. Oh, that reminds me again. I dug a bullet out of the man, Matt. Here it is. Oh. Huh. Huh. That's funny. What is? Now, this is a forty-four caliber. You don't see many of them anymore. Here. Take a look, Major. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I believe you're right. What do you make of it, Marshal? Major, I think I can find this gun smuggler. You do? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to borrow Tobiel over there to help me. My scout? What for? Well, those Pawnees have a day's start on us, but with Tobiel's help, I think I can catch up with them. Oh, no, no. no I'm afraid that'll bring out the whole tribe. No, I'll run this war party down myself as soon as their supply of arms is cut off. Well, they'll just be Tobiel and Chester and me, Major. It's the gun smuggler I'm after, not the Indians. And I'll go with you. Now, they'd spot a troop of cavalry. But three of us can get through the country without their knowing it if we have any luck at all. Uh, just uh, what do you have in mind, Marshal? I'll tell you later if it works. Uh, well, I guess I can't stop you. No, you can't. And I'll go without Tobiel if I have to. Yes, you would. All right, Marshal, take him. Thanks. I just hope you know what you're doing. Major, does a man ever know? For sure. Ride slow. They don't think we follow. Well, I just hope they don't find out, Tobiel. <laughs> Too bad they find out. Maybe 30 pony war party. They kill us very easy. So we better breathe our horses a little. Let's stop here. Oh. 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 <laughs> Right now, I wish I was an army. I'd feel a whole lot safer. Marshal, why we, why we follow Pawnee? Yeah. Right? I'd feel better if I knew myself. Maybe. Well, I'll tell you. First of all, that was a forty-four caliber bullet Doc found in that rancher's body. Only uh, Henry rifle shoot forty-four. Yeah, that's right, Tobiel. My. I ain't seen a forty-four Henry since I can remember. No. Most of the buffalo hunters around here use a forty-five. Or if they use a Sharps or a Remington, that's a fifty. You just don't see many forty-fours. Army, they have all Springfield forty-five. Yeah, but somebody's cornered a bunch of them Henry forty-fours and sold them to the Pawnees. Is that what you figure? Yeah, that's right, Chester. But whoever it is didn't think far enough ahead and... What do you mean? Well, he sold his rifles, all right, but his customers are going to have to come back to him for ammunition. They can't get it anyplace else. And the market's all his. Sounds to me like he's created a pretty good business. Yeah, too good. Now those ponies will be looking for him. And him alone. Marshal Wright. Most Indians only need rifles. Steal ammunition all over. One place, other place. Hmm. Pony, no fine 44 bullet, no place. So they'll go back to this man. They have to find him. And if we can keep on their trail long enough, we'll just naturally find him, too. 30 Pony on Warpack, all armed with good rifle. Maybe find us before we find them. Yeah. Hm. I guess it could work both ways. Well... Nobody's going to find anybody if we sit here. All right, let's get moving. The Pawnee Trail led south in a straight line, as though they knew exactly where they were going. We followed them for two days. 
And on the third, Tobiel informed us that the war party had been joined by another one of about equal strength. A band of Indians this large would protect itself with a ring of Scots. So we were forced to drop back and follow them more slowly. And then they turned to the east. And on the fourth day, we began to wonder if we were wrong about their trying to find the gun smuggler. Maybe they were just going to lose themselves in Oklahoma territory. Big country, Marshal. Bonnie may be blow apart like sand. You mean they might separate and wait a while before raiding back into Kansas? Sometimes do. Mr. Dillon, look. Yonder comes a ride. You... What? White man. Cowboy. Yeah. He's riding pretty hard. Ride like man afraid. Yeah, let's wait here for him. Oh, boy. Hello. Hello. You're headed in the wrong direction. Oh, no, why? If you men are smart, we'll turn around and ride. This country's alive with Pawnee. Do you see any? If I had, I probably wouldn't be here to tell you about it. But I've seen plenty of sign, and the worst kind of sign, too. Oh, what do you mean? They had a powwow of some sort about 20 miles back from me, mister. They left a white man there. Oh? Was he dead? Just about. Did you talk to him? I talked to him. But he didn't have much to say. Not with no tongue. You left him there? That's not all they done to him. But he could still use one hand. I give him my six gun. Oh, I see. The funny thing, though, there was wagon tracks leading into that camp and leading out of it too. Can't figure it no how. Only Wapali no keep wagon, Marshal. Marshal, you chasing them Indians? No, it's the wagon we're after, and whoever's driving it. Well, it's your business, Marshal. But I'm riding all the way to Dodge, and I'm going to stay there. Maybe we'll see you when we get back. I'll be there. But I wouldn't gamble on seeing you. So long. So long. Well, what do you make of it, Mr. Dillon? Well, as Tobiel says, the Pawnees wouldn't fool around with a wagon. There must have been more than one white man. We find wagon, I think, maybe five, six hours. Yeah, but it'll be dark soon. So be a track wagon and dark. We're going to have to move fast to be out of this country by daylight. We move. One man there, Toby. Mm. One man. <laughs> Big fire. Full white man fire. Well, we've crawled close enough. <laughs> Let's stop here. There. We gonna rush him, Mr. Dillon? If he starts shooting, Chester, we'll have the Pawnees down on us. Wait for sleep. Tobiel, crawl up, cut throat. No. No, Tobiel. I gotta be sure this is the right man. Yeah, but how are you gonna find out? Well, bluff him. Look, Chester, mm -hmm. you and Tobiel stay here. I'm gonna walk up to that fire. You're taking an awful chance, Mr. Dillon. Play on me. Thanks.
Stop where you are. Get your hands up. No. I'll kill you. And my friends out there will kill you. What friends? Put your gun away, mister. You haven't got a chance. Who are you anyway? What are you doing here? Put up your gun. Uh, they might get nervous. How do I know anybody's out All right, there? then shoot. And you'll find out. Well, go ahead. You must be crazy. All right, I'll put it up. There. All right, now tell me about you and the Pawnees. Pawnees? What are you talking about? I want to know where you got those rifles you sold them. Those Henry 44s. You're a law man. Don't try it, mister. You can't outdraw me. Maybe not. But I can sure bring them Indians down on you fast. That you won't live to see them. I won't hang either. You won't hang. You'll get about ten years in prison. It's not enough, but that's all you'll get. What, are you a sheriff or something? I'm a U.S. Marshal. No, Marshal, all I've got to do is shoot. I'll make you shoot. And them Pawnees will take care of the rest. So, I make you a deal. I don't make deals, mister. Well, you have to make this one if you want to live. Because I've decided I'd just as soon die right here and spend ten years in prison. Well, what about your partner? A partner? <laughs> you know everything, don't you? Just about. Uh, you can't touch him. He's with the Pawnees. They keep him as sort of a hostage till I get back from Tuscosa with more ammunition. You buy the rifles in Tuscosa? Sure. But them Indians is kind of mad about not finding 44 caliber bullets real handy. <laughs> we foxed them good. You're not very bright, mister. How do you suppose I know about your partner? How did you? We found him where you met the Pawnees. He was dead. Dead? Yeah. You want me to tell you about it? Well, what's there to tell? They got mad and killed him. He died slow, mister. Real slow. They caught you. That's right. He wasn't very pretty when we found him. I don't want to hear about it. He was your partner. Might happen to you. I said too. I don't want to hear about well, it. Well, I'm going to tell you about it anyway. First of all, they No, don't it. tell me. I can't stand that. I hate that. All right, then listen to me. If you start shooting, I'm not going to kill you or neither of my friends. But the Pawnees will come and they'll think you tried to fool them. They'll do worse things to you than they did to him. I couldn't go through that. We'll see what they do. All right, give me your gun. Come on. Take it. I don't care what happens as long as they don't get me. All right. Now go get your horse, mister. And hurry. And none of us will get out of here. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Barney Phillips, and Jack Edwards. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Jean Tierney recreates one of her most famous screen roles in the Lux Radio Theater adaptation of Laura this Monday night on CBS Radio. You will want to hear again this gripping story of a detective who falls in love with the girl whose murder he's trying to solve. Gene Tierney and Laura on the Lux Radio Theater this Monday night on most of these same stations. George Walsh speaking. Radio's outstanding theater of thrill suspense is also heard Monday evenings on the CBS Radio Network.
Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. <laughs> Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. first time I saw Lena Wave, I should have resigned my job and gone to Texas on the fastest horse I could find. Handling a man is one thing, but uh, trying to handle a woman is another. Especially when she weighs some 200 pounds and is muscled like a mule and twice as ornery. Lena came to Dodge on a great draft horse with dark circles around its eyes. And she was leading an old jack mule that carried her boyfriend, Emmett Fitzgerald. And Emmett was a tired, pigeon-breasted little fellow with a green look in his face. They weren't a very handsome pair, but we were mightily impressed by him the day they rode up Front Street. I swear, Mr. Dillon, that woman must wear leather underwear. I don't know why she's leading his mule. The man doesn't look stout enough to run away if he wanted to. My, I'd sure hate to have her on my tail. Well, she's wearing a six-gun. And built like a buffalo. Well, she sure isn't the gentlest-looking woman I ever saw. Oh, that poor little man, Mr. Dillon. He somehow gives me the feeling he's being carried around in a bird cage. Now, quiet, Chester. They'll hear you. Yes, sir. Oh, I never thought we'd make it, Lena. You mean you never thought you'd make it? Get off that mule. Sure, Lena. Here. I'll help you tie him up, Lena. Oh! You step on my foot! I'm sorry. Lena. That'll learn you to be a gentleman. (laughs) You up there! Stop that! Who are you laughing at? Why, nobody, ma'am. That's good. Because if I got the notion you was laughing at me or my man, I'd open you up. Oh, no. Oh, my, no. No, it, it, it was just something funny I heard the other day from a fella. What? What? What did you hear that was so funny? Well... I, I I was sitting there, and he come around. The, and the, ain't hard, mister. You remember, Mr. Dillon, you, you... Tell her. Please. Dillon? Why, you, you must be the marshal here. Oh, that's right, ma'am. Well, now, marshal, I'm proud to know you. My name's Lena Wave. Shake! Well, how do you do? Do. Over here, Emmett. Sure, Lena. Marshal, it's yours, Emmett Fitzgerald. Emmett? Glad to know you, Marshal. Emmett's a gambling man. Oh, is that so? I want you to know he's honest, Marshal. Ain't you, Emmett? Surely not. Say it. I'm honest. I only caught him cheating once, Marshal. Ain't that right, Emmett? I was in bed two weeks. She liked to kill me. Well, I'm glad to know that, uh... Uh, about your being honest, I mean. Emmett will be running a game tonight. Right over there is as good a place as any. The Texas Trail. Uh, sure, sure. Glad to have you sit in, Marshal. And you can come, too, yeah. if you watch your manners. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. Emmett, I'd better feed you so you can get enough strength back to kneel them cards. Come on. Sure, Lena. 
Jess has been in that game over there for two hours, Matt. She must be losing. Well, he usually does, Kitty. How anybody could concentrate with Lena hulking around, I don't know. <laughs> she does keep an eye on things, doesn't she? You know, Matt, I feel kind of sorry for her. Oh, she can take care of herself. Oh, isn't that? Being so big and not very pretty. After all, she is a woman. Uh, that's not too easy to tell, Kitty. You think she's in love with Emmett? Oh, now, Kitty, I tell you, I haven't worked that out yet. Uh, I, I'm sure I've been studying on it, oh, though. Oh, Matt. <laughs> Every woman needs a man of some kind. Uh, she's got one. Yeah. I feel sorry for him, too. Oh, Lena will take care of him. I know. But I'll bet he'd like to take care of Lena just once. After all, he's human. I tell you, that is not my hand. I had three aces. You accuse him of cheating, and I'll shoot you dead. Oh, excuse me, Kitty. I better go fish Chester out of that. Emmett was dealing, wasn't he? I'll blow a hole in you, mister. Right now. All right, hold it, Lena. She's about to shoot me, Mr. Dillon. You bet I am. Lena, I don't know what it's like where you came from, but you shoot anybody around here, and you're going to go to jail. You'd put a woman in jail? For shooting, I would. For fighting? What? This is what. When I hear he, he, he can put you in jail for that, too, now. Now, here. There's no... The game's closed, gentlemen, for half an hour. I need some beer, Emmett. Come on. Sure, Lena. I never seen a woman like that. I don't care what they say. Well, like that, it ain't fair. Uh, here, no, Chester. <laughs> Let me help you all. Oh. Come on. Oh. There. Well, are you all right? Why didn't you stop her, Mr. Dillon? She might have killed me. Well, I, I, I don't know, Chester. I never fought with a woman. Well, I have, and I don't want no more of it. Well, you can't hit her. What can you do with her? Leave her alone. That's what I'm going to do. You know, Chester, Lena could get to be quite a problem. Well, she ain't going to be my problem. I'm getting out of here. Are you going to have some breakfast? Oh, eh, no, I've already eaten. We'll have some coffee, though. Oh, good. They had me up real early this morning. No? Who did? A couple of men Lena Wave got mad at. Huh? She used a bottle on them. Oh, were they hurt bad? Oh, she blooded them up some. It wasn't real serious, though. All they did was try to protect themselves. After all, what man's going to fight a woman? Yeah, that's true. But one of these days, some drunk's not going to realize she is a woman, and he'll shoot her. Hmm. You wonder if it hasn't happened already? <clears throat> oh, say, I hear Chester caught it all right when he accused Emma of trying to cheat him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he found out later that it wasn't true, Doc. Yeah. The other boys were just playing a joke on him. They switched his cards while he, he was under the table looking for some chips that he dropped. Oh, wonder all oh, that. Oh, if you ask me, a man that'll leave his hand while he crawls around on the floor deserves anything that happens to him. Well, just about everything did. Mr. Dillon? Oh, here he is. Uh, he will uh, tell you. Uh, Mr. Dillon? Oh, say, you better come too, Doc. Huh? Oh, what's the trouble, Chester? Lena Wave. She just shot a man over at the Dodge house. What? Oh, let's see. Oh, let's see. Is a man dead, Chester? He sure he is, Doc. Where's Lena? She's still there. Claims it was self-defense. Did you see it? Yes, sir. I was right there. Uh, Lena was getting her room key at the desk, and this buffalo hunter come in and grabbed her. Well, he was pretty drunk. Uh, drunk? At this hour of the morning, he was drunk? Well, I guess he'd been up all night, Doc. Anyhow, he tried to kiss her. He must have been drunk. He got her gun hand behind her back, and then he pushed her up again in the desk. Oh, she was swearing at him something terrible. Well, how did she shoot him, Chester? Yeah. Well, sir, she just pooched around and squirmed herself along the desk till she'd rubbed her six-gun around on the other side. 
Then she just pulled it out with her free hand and shot him in the belly. She did? Oh, oh my, she's quite a woman, isn't she? She sure is. She's waiting with Emmett right inside here, Mr. Dillon. Everybody else took cover. They're scared to death of her. Yes, she... What are you here for, Doc? Eh? You can't do him no good. Eh, well, I, I... I just come to take a look at him. Let's see. Oh, yes, he looks dead, all right. He's dead. Why did you kill him, Lena? Well, I had to protect myself, Marshal. Nobody else would. Including Emmett here. I... I figured you'd take care of him yourself, Lena. You always do. Sure. But if you was a man, you'd do it for me. Oh, now, Lena, look how big he is. He ain't very big anymore. All it takes is a gun, Emmett. Sure, Lena. There are too many people carrying guns around here already. I'm going to take yours, Lena. What for? I killed him in self-defense. He wasn't even armed. Except for that Bowie knife. You're forgetting something, Marshal. What? I'm a woman. So? So? You mean to tell me a woman ain't got the right to protect her virtue in this town? What do you men come to, anyway? Well, by... Oh, by... Oh, yeah, she's got a point there. Uh, uh, ain't no judge in the world that wouldn't call it self-defense. No, you're right, Lena. I keep forgetting. You know I'm right. Emmett, we ain't had breakfast yet, and I'm hungry. Come on. Sure, Lena. You know, I've been thinking, Mr. Dillon. Oh, what about, Chester? Well, old Lena could have let that fella kiss her this morning, just a little peck anyway, and she wouldn't have had to shoot him. Yeah, she could have, but she didn't. I declare, she's enough to curdle cream. Well, I hope everybody leaves her alone from now on. Marshal Dillon? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Nate Bannister. Now, I'm glad to know you. You won't be, if what I hear is true. Oh? Uh-huh. Jim Henry was my friend, Marshal. Is that so? Nobody's going to shoot a friend of mine and get by with it. Not even a woman. He was drunk, Nate, and he was treating her bad. There's no call to kill him. In this country, a woman's free to protect herself any way she can. Yeah. That's what everybody I've talked to say. Well? Don't sit with me. You gonna arrest her? No. Okay, then. Now, wait a minute. What? Where you going? I'm Marshal. I'm going to kill me a woman. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this Monday night on CBS Radio's Suspense... Hear Jeff Chandler in Death at Strykerud Pond. It's an exciting trial in which a young man faces death because of his decisions made as a member of a World War II underground. It's a fascinating study in suspense. And it's yours to hear this Monday night over most of these same stations at the Star's Address. Monday, suspense. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Nate Bannister was obviously a buffalo hunter, same as his friend who had been shot that morning. He was a huge man with a heavy black beard and eyebrows so thick it was hard to tell if he was looking at you or not. 
I watched him as he stood in the doorway, having just said that he was going to kill Lena Wave. And I realized that a man that primitive was capable of doing anything, even shooting a woman. And I wasn't sure how to stop it, unless I shot him first. The way I was brought up, Marshal, that's what friends is for. If somebody kill you, then they gotta kill them. You do any killing around here, Nate, and you'll be tried for it. Maybe. If you catch me. I'll catch you. Why you gotta protect women, Marshal? Just because they're so weak and puny? Is that Nate Bannister? Huh? You heard me. Why? Yes, ma'am. I'm Nate Bannister. Well, they didn't tell me you was so big. Who didn't tell you? How'd you know my name? You've been spreading it around that if the marshal don't arrest me, you'll shoot me. That true? Are you lean away? I am. And if there's going to be any shooting, I want in on it. Now, wait a minute, Lena. I ain't going to get bushwhacked by no dirty buffalo hunter, Marshal. Bushwhacked? I wouldn't do that to nobody. Especially the uh, lady. Lady? Yes, ma'am. He called me a lady, Marshal. Well, you are, ain't you? Of course I am. Yeah, what's the matter with calling you one? Nothing. I kind of like it. Just because you ain't pale and skinny like ordinary wounds. No. Of course I ain't. Why, I... I never seen a woman like you. Nowhere. You're kind of admirable. <laughs> Listen to him, Marshal. Ain't he a one? Oh, I mean it. I sure do. Oh. I sure do. No, you don't. I'm too big. Too big? Why, you want to be like all them little scrawny women? They can't do nothing. They're no good. They ain't. Oh, no. A real man needs someone, uh, uh, uh better than that. He does? Of course he does. Like me? Yeah. Like you. <laughs> so, what, 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 what? You were going to shoot me a minute ago. Oh, no. I didn't mean nothing by that. Hey, come on. I'll buy you beer. We'll talk about it. Well, okay. So long, Marshal. Yeah. Don't you worry about nothing, Marshal. Uh, Chester! Yes, sir? That jug of corn whiskey's still out back. Yes, sir, it was last time I looked. Go and get it. Those two make quite a couple, Matt. Look at them. They've been sitting there most all day. Yeah, a pretty shaggy pair of lovebirds, if you ask me. How's Emmett taking all this? Well, he didn't find him till a couple of hours ago. No, what happened? Who oh, where is he? Nate ran him off. He probably had done more, but Lena wouldn't let him. You know, Matt, I think underneath she's real fond of that little Emmett. Yeah? And she's got a strange way of showing it. Women do sometimes. Well, it doesn't matter as long as she keeps out of trouble. She leads quite a life, doesn't she? Shoots a man in the morning and falls for his best friend in the afternoon. <laughs> she might have shot both of them if Nate hadn't started sweet-talking her. Well, he made her feel like a woman, that's what. Oh, sure. Nothing wrong with that, is there? It probably saved his life. All right, mister. Now you get away from her. Not mad, it's Emmett. Yeah. You heard me. I thought you'd gone home. I ain't gone home. 
Not without lean I ain't. <laughs> yes, you are. Lean and me is going to get married. I didn't say that. I ain't had time to tell you. I'm... I'm warning you, mister. Excuse me, Kitty. Yeah. I better stop this. <laughs> Look, fella. I'm going to kiss her. Watch. No. Hold it, Emmett. Oh. 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 All right, Emmett. Give me that derringer. Sure, Marshal. Chester. Yes, sir. Here I am, Mr. Dillon. Get Nate's gun before he comes to. All right, sir. I'll get it. All right, then take him over to Doc's, huh? Doesn't look too bad hurt. No, sir. He ain't. I'll take care of him. Em. You shot him. I know. You shot him. Over me. Well, he was stealing you, Lena. And you went and shot him. I was kind of ashamed this morning when that other fella tried to kiss you. You're a man after all, Emmett. I couldn't stand losing you, Lena. Oh, I didn't care nothing about him. You didn't? No. I was just tired of not being treated like a woman. He called me a lady and kind of lost my head. That's all. Well, Emmett kind of lost his head, too, you know. All right, Emmett. Come on. You're going to jail. No, Marshal, please. Come on. Get going, Emmett. All right. My husband goes to jail. So do I. But your husband? Of course. We've been married ten years, Marshal. I always knew it wasn't a mistake. Well, he's still going to jail. Please, Marshal, don't take him. Of course I'll take him. He just shot a man, didn't he? He was only protecting his lawful wedded wife. you got to let me go with him. Well, I can't leave him now. I've been waiting ten years for him to treat me like a woman. Oh, please, Marshal. Look, Lena, there's been nothing but trouble since you hit Dodge. Please, Marshal. When Nate gets patched up, he'll be gunning for Emmett here. Emmett will kill him next time. All right, all right, Leo. Look, I'll tell you what I'll do. Get out of Dodge, both of you. Right now. You mean it? If you hurry. Oh, thank you, Marshal. Hey, let's go, Emmett. Wait a minute. What? Take my arm. All right. Now, Lena. Come on. Sure, Emmett. Sure. Smoke under the direction of Norman McDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg with Vic Perrin and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in gun smoke. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. North of CBS Radio get into an arty crowd, an artful crowd, too, when mixed paints and mixed emotions make murder. Here are collector's items, Ham and Jerry's latest thriller, leading them a merry chase mid works of art before they nab their killer. It's on most of these same stations Tuesday night. On the same evening, you have a date for thrills with John Lund as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Don't forget. 
George Walsh speaking. Eve Arden, as our Miss Brooks, teaches you how to laugh Sundays on the CBS Radio Network. and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Building up the fire this time of night for? More light. See better. See what? Nothing. I just want more light, that's all. Mister, ever since we met on the trail back there this afternoon, you've been watching me. We're strangers, ain't we? Sure. You've been watching me, too? I did at first, but I trust you now. Crawl back in your blanket. Okay. better. Now go to sleep, will you? You going to sleep? I'd like to watch the stars a little while first. Ain't no stars by me. I can see them over your shoulder there. Laying on my back gives me the ache. Gives me the ache, too. We've got a lot in common, mister. Yeah? You never told me what name you go by. You never told me neither. I'm gone if you ain't the most suspicious man I ever run into. I'm still alive. You ought to quit worrying so much you get old before your time. My pa taught me to worry. Who's your pa? He's dead. Died worrying, probably. No. No, he died of the milk sickness. He's a good man, though. Ain't any good man. He was. Why? What he believed in. What did he believe in? Well, he always said he believed in foot washing, saving your seed potatoes, and paying your honest debt. Your pa was crazy. I'm going crazy if I don't get the bugs out of this blanket. You shake them out. I'm going. Some sleep. It beats me how you know which way to go, Mr. Dillon. I see, they trust it. Yeah, but all the fella said was he'd found a man's body some 20 miles east of Dodge. You've been riding like you knew right where it was laying. Well, he was a teamster, Chester. I'd just been following his wagon tracks, that's all. Oh. <laughs> I don't know, Mr. Dillon. Maybe I shouldn't never leave Dodge. Chester, there he is straight ahead there. Do you see? Yes, sir. That must be it, all right. Come on. 
Well, look at there. He's still in his blanket. Yeah. It looks like he was shot right in the heart. Well, at least the poor fellow died in his sleep. Well, he must have come half awake. His hand's on his gun. He never got it out, though. Somebody sure jumped him fast. Say, maybe it was Indian. No. No, his hair's still on. Now, besides, somebody was sleeping over here. I declare. Who do you suppose it was? I don't know, Chester. That he couldn't be a very brave man. No, sir, he sure couldn't. I'm a dirty coward. <sighs> Go get that shovel off your saddle, huh, Chester? Yes, sir. a long ride like that if only to work up a good thirst. <laughs> I've seen you work up a good thirst just sitting around, Chester. Yes, sir. I'm just lucky, I guess. <laughs> well, I never heard it called that before. Give me a glass of beer, Barkeep. Oh, beer nothing. Give him whiskey. I don't want whiskey. Ain't you man enough to drink whiskey? Drink it? When I want it. I don't believe you do. Drink some now. I ain't bothering you. Can't a man come in here and have what he wants? Cowboy, ain't you? What's wrong with being a cowboy? Nothing. Only I always thought it took a man to be a cowboy. You trying to start trouble, mister? I listen to him. <laughs> What's so funny about that? I killed a man once for telling me not to laugh. I telling you nothing? Mister, I think you're a coward. You got a gun in your belt. Go ahead, use it. What for? So you can kill me and call it self-defense? All right, that's enough. Leave him alone. What are you mixing in this for? I don't like gunfighting around here. You don't like it. I'm a U.S. Marshal. Oh, Marshal. Now, what's your name, stranger? I'm called Krigo. All right, Krigo, move down the bar. Go on, move. I'll see you later, cowboy. <laughs> I wouldn't have dared draw on him, Marshal. I ain't no gunman. He'd have killed me, sure. Yeah, he probably would have. My name's Jesse Hill, Marshal. I'm proud to know you. Well, Jesse, you keep that gun in your belt, huh? And stay away from Krigo? I ain't no troublemaker. Yeah, I know. But sometimes a man can't avoid it. Not around somebody like him. <laughs> well, I think I'll do my drinking across the street. See you later, Jesse. Yeah, so long. That Krigo's an awful mean man, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he's mean, all right. Especially when he's sure the other man hasn't got a chance. Wonder where he came from. I never saw him around here before. Now, he's new in Dodge, Chester. Let me tell you something. It had to be that kind of a man who killed that cowboy we buried today. Well, you think it was him? Well, he could have done it. He's enough of a coward. But if he did, no one could ever prove it. Uh, no, sir, I guess not. But he'll make a mistake yet, Chester. His kind always do. Like that material, Kitty? I'd like to make a dress of it. 
this all you have, Mr. Jonas? Mm, I'm afraid so. But I'll order more if you want it. How long will it take? Mm, A few weeks is all. Okay. I'll need about uh, seven yards. Mm. You'll have it, Kitty. Mm. And say, Hmm? look here. Hmm. These new parasols. Oh. They just come on the Santa Fe today. From St. Louis. Hello, Matt. Hello, Kitty. Ah, uh, Mr. Jonas. Uh, your coat's out back, Marshal. Oh? You can go try it on if you want. Oh, <laughs> new coat, huh? I'd like to see it, Matt. Well, you wait here, Kitty, and I'll just go put it on. <laughs> sure hope it fits. I had a parcel of trouble talking him into ordering that coat. Well, he's needed it ever since I've known it. Mm. Men just don't like new things, Kitty. Yeah. Now, is there uh, anything else? Ah, uh, no. That's all for today. How much do I owe you? Hmm. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, I'll have to add it up. Well, now, there's a right pretty girl. Go on back to your hogs, mister. <laughs> Salty, too. I like that. Oh, now, now, look here, stranger. Now, don't pay it? any attention to him, Mr. Jonas. You got it figured? Well, it comes to uh, about uh, $2.40, kid. Uh-huh. I'll pay it. What? I says, I'll pay it. You'll do nothing of the kind. Put it on my bill, Mr. Oh, Jonas. Oh, there you are. I like to buy things for pretty girls, providing they let me carry the package home for them. <clears throat> now get out of here and leave me alone or I'll hit you again. Maybe you're a little too salty. Maybe what you need is a ch- Go ahead, Crigo. Finish what you were going to say. No business of yours. I want to hear what you were going to say. She slapped me. You saw her. Get out of the way, Kitty. Gladly. Now, let's not fight. Be quiet, Mr. Jonas. Yes, sir. Grigo, I think you're a coward. I'm going to prove it. What are you up to? A cowboy Jesse wouldn't draw on you. But I will. Are you ready? No. There, I got my gun out and you didn't do a thing, did you? I ain't drawing on you. (laughs) All right, now get out of here, Krieger. And if I ever see you anywhere near Miss Kitty again, I'm going to break your neck. Now go on, get out. He sure showed his colors, Matt. Yeah. You know, I think that's the first time I ever saw you draw first on a man. Well, I figured he wouldn't draw, Kitty. How'd you know? A Krigo doesn't take any chances. But right now, I'm wondering how many more men he's going to kill before he's through. <laughs> We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, the crusade for freedom is a crusade for your freedom and mine. The truth dollars people send the crusade for freedom help preserve our own freedom, even as they get the truth and hope to people behind the Iron Curtain. Truth dollars help finance Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Asia, the most effective weapons Western democracy has for countering lies and distortion. Send your contribution to the crusade for freedom care of your local postmaster. That's Crusade for Freedom, care of your local postmaster. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Chester. I'm back here, Mr. Dillon. Well, come out front, huh? Yes, sir. You picked a mighty poor time to ride out to Fort Dodge, if you don't mind me saying so. Tell me what happened, Chester. I hear that you witnessed it. 
Yes, sir, I was right there, Mr. Dillon. Grigo agged him into drawing first. Yeah. Self-defense again, is that it? Yes, sir. The poor fellow was awful slow. And you know what Grigo did? What? Well, he shot him in the gun arm first, then through both knees. And finally, he shot him in the belly and killed him. There was nothing I could do once they'd started. Yeah. Who was he, Chester? A fellow named Lydak, if it told me. Some stranger. Oh. Uh. Why don't you run Krigo out of town? Ah, uh, running him out of Dodge would just mean he'd go murder somebody someplace else, Chester. Well, at least he wouldn't be doing it here. Yeah, I know. But somehow I... I'd feel responsible for letting him get away. Mm-hmm. Varmints like that oughtn't be allowed to live. Ah, uh, they wouldn't be alive if he wasn't so careful about picking the man he shoots. No, oh, sir. Oh, say, Doc was down a little while ago. Oh? He's through with autopsy and wants to know who's going to bury that fellow. Yeah. Uh, did he have any friends? Yes, sir. That cowboy Krigo tried to fight Jesse Hill. Oh. I think he was a friend of his. He helped carry him up to Doc's anyway, and he seemed real mad about it all. Quiet, you know, but mad. Uh, that could lead to trouble. How do you mean? Well, Jesse backed off from Krigo once, but uh, he may go looking for him now. I don't think he'd have a chance. And we'd sure better find him, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, Chester, we better. Come on. Maybe Jesse left town, Mr. Dillon. Well, I hope so. Though we haven't looked at every place yet. Somebody said he had a room at the Dodge house. Oh? That seems to be pretty fancy for a line writer, doesn't it? He's probably spent six months' pay in the last few days. They always do. Well, they can't spend it out on the prairie, Chester. I guess it doesn't mean much to him. Yeah, I know, but you'd think they'd save a little money. A few dollars, at least. Oh, uh, tell me something, Chester. Hmm? Where were you at the bank last? Well, I keep my money in my sock, Mr. Dillon. It's safer. Oh, oh, maybe, yeah. Isn't that kind of tough on the merchants when you go to spend it, though? Well, nobody ain't turned it down yet. Money's money. Wait a minute. There's Jesse across the plaza there. Yeah, and that's Krigo he's talking to. Come on. Hey, it looks like they're having an argument, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. You gonna stop it? Well, if I can. Krigo! Jesse! They're about to fight, Mr. Dillon. Murdered him, Krigo. On, draw. Hold it, Jesse! All right, Krigo. Put your gun away. Sure. He tried to shoot me, Marshal. You saw him. He's dead, Mr. Dillon. Well, that was pretty easy for you, wasn't it, Krigo? He shouldn't have tried it, Marshal. I told him not to. You're lying. I heard what you told him. Well, what difference does it make? He drew first. I shot him in self-defense. Yeah, sure. Krigo, did you know that man you killed the other night was Jesse Hill's friend? Yes, he was telling me that just now. Well, I got an idea. You talked him into drawing just to work Jesse up to a fight. It was both a couple of bums, Marshal. How about that man on the prairie? Was he a bum? What man? The one that was lying wrapped in his blanket. I don't know what you're talking about, Marshal. Krigo. How long you been killing people? Marshal? I killed my first man when I was 18. Fellow tried to knife me, so I shot him. I'll tell you something else. I ain't wanted by the law, nowheres. Nowheres at all. Did you ever fight a man who could handle a gun? What do you mean? You will someday, Krigo. You'll make a mistake and pick on the wrong man. Will I, Marshal? Oh, I'm gonna go and get me a drink. 
Ain't there nothing you can do about him, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, there's one thing I can do, Chester. At first, we'll get Jesse and his friend buried. Frigo's still standing at the bar of the Alphaganza, Mr. Dillon. All right, Chester. You gonna take him in? No. I'd just have to turn him loose sooner or later. Well, what are you going to do? Something I've never done before, Chester. But if it works, it'll save some lives. Oh. Well, uh, you'll see. He was bragging about already killing two men since he's been in Dodge. Well, he'll go right on killing men if he isn't stopped. He's like one of them hound dogs that gets a taste of blood in his mouth and... And sort of goes crazy with it, ain't he? Yeah, that's what he's like. Okay. Here we are. Is there anything you want me to do, Mr. Dillon? Yes, there is, Chester. What? Well, you'll know when the time comes. But stay out of the way. Yes, sir. Rigo. What do you want now, Marshal? I've been thinking about you, Krigo. And I've decided that uh, you're not fit to live. You, you got no call, Marshal. I killed them men in self-defense. Sure. Ain't no court in the world that would convict me. I'm plumb innocent. I'm not talking about hanging you. What are you talking about? Krigo, I'm going to walk out of here and wait for you in the street. And I'm going to wait one minute. And if you're not there in one minute, I'm coming back. What for? I'm going to kill you. No. No, I ain't going to fight you. Yes, you are. One minute, Krigo. You, you killed him. Yeah. He had his gun out. He, he'd have shot you right in the back. Thanks for letting me know, Chester. Oh, oh my goodness. Is that what you wanted me to do? Yeah, that was it. Well, suppose I hadn't saw him. Yeah, then Krigo would have killed another man. I feel kind of sick. You did fine, Chester. Now remember, Chester, it was more than one life you just saved. Smoke under the direction of Norman McDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Vic Perrin, Howard Culver, and Richard Deacon. Parley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow night,
tonight on most of these stations, observing the end of Amos and Andy's 26th year of entertaining America, Jack Benny, Bing Crosby, Edward R. Murrow, and Lowell Thomas join the distinguished cast in tribute to Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll, the men who are Amos and Andy. Tomorrow evening on CBS Radio, don't miss this star-studded Amos and Andy anniversary show. George Walsh speaking. For mystery mixed with merriment, join Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Kitty. <laughs> oh, I didn't see you. You'll get shot someday walking around her days like that. You'll get sunstroke sitting out here in the heat and the dust. I don't see people in the daylight very often. I wanted to find out if they're any different. <laughs> Sit down. Uh, well, are they? Any different? No. Uh. I don't know. But I've spotted a few I think might be sober. <laughs> That's different. Uh, for you, maybe. And I was just thinking, Kitty, there's hardly a man comes to Dodge that isn't looking for trouble of some kind. They call it fun. Yeah, sure. But part of their fun's beating somebody up or shooting him. I've heard of places where the men have to check their guns when they come to town. Yeah, that never works. They can always hide a gun or a knife. You ought to go fishing, Matt. What? Have some fun yourself. Quit worrying for a while. Oh, I'm not worried, Kitty. You know, if it wasn't for all these men stalking each other, I'd be out of a job. There are other jobs besides keeping the peace, Matt. Yeah, I've tried most of them in my time. Hey, Mr. Dillon. Oh, hello, Miss Kitty. Hello, Chester. Uh, Doc sent me to find you. There's an old man up in his office. Oh, what does he want me for? The old man's been shot. Shot? Yes, sir. Claims somebody tried to kill him. You mean he was ambushed? I guess he was. Anyway, it hit him in the neck. <clears throat> All right, Chester. I'll go back with you. He's got a friend with him, but they're both strangers around here. Now, you see what I mean, Kitty? Young or old, they're all looking for trouble. Maybe it'd help if we burned this place down. I'll sit here and think. See you about it later, Matt. Where's the doc? Somebody come for him. Oh, what do you mean? Somebody come for him. That's what. Said somebody else was sick. You're the man that was shot, huh? We don't need you, Marshal. We'll handle this. What's your name, mister? Peavy. John Peavy. My partner's name's Rives. Milligan Rives, Marshal. You ain't never heard of us. Where are you from? Up north. Well, sodbusters don't usually wear six guns. What are you doing in Dodge? We quit the land, Marshal. We're going to enjoy ourselves for change. 
We ain't never going back. Hmm. Oh? You're a little old to be making a move like that, aren't you? I ain't hardly 60. Neither is Rise. Mm-hmm. Well, it didn't take you long to get into trouble, did it? We ain't in trouble. Maybe you're not Rives, but Peavy here's just been shot. I told you we'd handle this, Marshal. Ain't nobody gonna sneak up on John Peavy and shoot him. I don't care if he is a woman. A woman? What woman? Oh, you always did talk too much, Peavy. You might as well tell him now. I ain't going to tell him. I'll fix her myself. You'll tell me or I'll throw you in jail till you do. I'm not going to have any women killed around here. Now, do you understand that? Hey, go on, tell him. You already started. Well, yeah. all right. She, she come up the alley, Marshal, next to our sleeping room, and she shot right through the window. Rive seen her running around the corner after. I, I, I'm going to fix her good. She's been threatening him, Marshal. I'm here to do it. Who is this woman? What's her name? Yeah, she's one of them, them gals that works at the Texas Trail, Marshal. Name of Kitty. Sorry to bother you, oh, Kitty. Oh, come in. Come in. Yeah. My room's a mess. I wasn't expecting any callers. Well, it's uh, important, Kitty. Of course. What's the trouble, man? You know a man called John Peavy? Peavy? Yeah. Yeah, I know him, the old fool. But did you threaten to shoot him? Don't tell me he's come and complained to you about that. Well, no, not exactly. Well... I told him I'd shoot him, and I will, too, if he doesn't leave me alone, the old goat. He's been shot, Kitty. What? He wasn't hurt very bad, but uh, he and his partner claim a woman did it. Now, they say it was you. Do you think I did it, Matt? <sighs> well, Kitty, if you got mad enough and you had a gun in your hand, I'd be one of the first to hide. But uh, to sneak up on somebody in cold blood, uh, no, you didn't do it. When did it happen? Oh, an hour or two ago. I've been right here, alone. I guess I couldn't prove it. Well, you don't have to, Kitty. Thanks, Matt. Well, the reason I came was uh, to tell you about it and see... Well, see if you had any ideas. Well, all I know about Peavy and his friend Rives is that there are a couple of old men who've been acting like schoolboys. Oh. Like they've run away and are having their last fling. And I don't want anything to do with either one of them. Well, I don't blame you. But, uh, Rives claims he saw a woman down the alley after the shooting. You, uh, any idea who it might have been? No. He's probably lying, dreaming. Yeah, maybe. Well, if you hear anything, let me know, Kitty. And, uh, if PD gives you any more trouble, send for me. I sure will. <laughs> been up this early in the morning since I can remember, Mr. Dillon. Oh? How about last Sunday, Chester? Last Sunday? Yeah. Oh! Well, that's different. That was still Saturday night, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look. There comes Miss Kitty. What in the world is she doing up at this hour? Oh, she's in a hurry, whatever she's doing. Matt! Hello, Chester. Morning, Miss Kitty. What's the trouble, Kitty? Matt, somebody tried to shoot me. What? In my room, just a while ago. I had a pillow down by my feet. I guess they thought my head was there. They put a bullet right through it. What, did you see anybody? No, it came from outside. I didn't dare look out right away. It's it, it kind of the same as happened to Peavy, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, maybe it was Peavy. He threatened something like this. Well, I'm scared, Matt. Well, you should be. Chester. Yes, sir? You stay with Kitty. Don't let her out of your sight. I'm going after Peavy and Rives. <laughs> We will return.
return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, every Tuesday, Pam and Jerry North prove that solving a murder is a family affair. And on the same evening, John Lund, as yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings us the thrilling details of his latest insurance fraud investigation. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. By noon, I'd searched the whole town, and there was no sign of P.V. or his friend Rives. They'd disappeared. And until I found them, I didn't dare leave Kitty where they could get at her. So I had Chester drive her out to a friend's place a few miles from Dodge, and she was happy to go. Now, we didn't have any luck until the next afternoon. Cowboy happened to mention to Chester that he'd come across a couple of drunks camped about a mile up the Arkansas. I decided it was worth riding out and taking a look. And it was. It's him, all right. Yeah, and they've seen us. Keep your head up now. You think they'll fight us? Ah, uh, you never know. Oh. What are you doing out here, Michael? Looking for you. Well, you found it. You down and have a drink. Well, what you got there? Corn liquor. Only about half a jug left, though. What's that other jug? Who killed that yesterday? Here, have a swallow. Well, say, now, that's right kind of... Yes, sir. Yeah, but, of course, I don't drink before sundown. Leastwise, not very often. Why'd you come out here if, uh, if you don't want to drink? How long have you men been here? Day before yesterday. Phoebe's neck was bothering him, and I figured a couple of days in camp like this might ease it off some. And I get to... Feeling better. I'm going back and teach that gal Kitty a lesson, though. I swear I am, Marshal. Somebody tried that this morning. Eh? What, what do you mean? She got shot at, Peavy, the same way you did. That don't make no sense. Why, well, he's just thinking you done it, Peavy. How could I do her? I've been laying here drunk for two days. Anyway, uh, I wouldn't shoot no woman, Marshal. I had to beat him up a little, that's all. You know, knock him around. Well, uh, what kind of men you think we are? I don't know. Why did you leave home in the first place? Yeah, home. <laughs> Man don't live forever, Marshal. He's got to enjoy himself while he can. It rives. Rives. You tell him what you told me. About them in graves? Well, I I was in the graveyard once, a long time ago, and I noticed something I never forgot. No, sir. Never. Yeah. Tell him where I was. Well, Marshal, I, I, I looked around... And I seen that there was as many graves shorter than me as there was graves longer. And uh, that got him to thinking about dying, Marshal. So one day we decided to enjoy ourselves and quit working so hard. Hey, hey hand me that jug, Rives. Yeah, help yourself. Uh, Hold it a minute, baby. Huh? I want to tell you something. What? I'm going to leave you here. But if I see you around Dodge, either one of you, I'll throw you in jail. What's this? We ain't done nothing. You have it in mind to beat up Kitty. But if you did that, I might kill you. So stay out of town. Come on, Chester. <laughs> Left them there 
there, passing the jug back and forth across their fire on the riverbank. Talking of death, probably, and of the hard, empty lives that they'd had. And the prairie often left men a little too hungry and a little too dry. Chester and I were talking about it when we spotted a woman up ahead. She was walking after a saddle horse, which we figured must have thrown her and got loose. She was an old woman and dressed for Sunday in a long black skirt and a big hat with a fancy pin stuck through it. I sent Chester to catch the horse while I rode up to her and dismounted. My friend will bring your horse back, ma'am. Are you all right? I'm all right. Well, how'd he get loose? Mean critter, he run off. Oh, I see. Uh, you live around here? No. You've been down by the river, ain't you? I just came from there. Why? See anybody? Well, a couple of men lying around a fire, that's all. Drinking? Yeah. Yeah, they were drinking. Uh, you know them? I might. Are you looking for somebody? I might be. Well, uh, maybe you'd like us to ride back there with you. And, uh... I don't need nobody to ride nowhere with me, mister. Oh. oh what's your name, ma'am? What's my name? I don't take to scallywag cowboys asking me my name. Well, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. You didn't? Well, no, ma'am. Of course I didn't. What's yours? Matt Dillon, ma'am. Dillon. I heard that name somewhere. Well, we won't be introduced proper unless you tell me yours. My name's Sabina Peavy. Ms. Peavy? I've been married 35 years, Dylan. Here he is, Mr. Dylan. Seems gentle enough. Uh, I'll hold him while you get back on, ma'am. I can manage. Hey, look what you've got tied to her saddle, Mr. Dylan. One of them old cavalry pistols. Yeah, grab it and put it in your belt, Chester. What? You heard me. Yes, sir. You put that back, you see. What are you, anyway? Suppose you'll steal my horse next. I'm a U.S. Marshal, Miss Peavy. Everything's going to be all right. A Marshal, eh? I uh, want you to come back to Dodge with me. Chester will bring your husband in. Is she Peavy's wife? You can't stop me, Marshal. Chester, hmm? go back to that camp and shoot a hole in their jug. And when they're sober enough, bring him to town. And don't say anything about Miss Peavy. Yes, sir, I'll do it. Now you're going to be all right with me, ma'am. Well, you stole my gun and you're stronger than me. I guess I'll have to go. Ah, shall I make another pot of coffee for us, ma'am? No. No, thanks, Dylan. Ah. Well, they ought to be here pretty soon. It's nearly evening. It, you'll tell that girl, Kitty, how, how sorry I am I tried to shoot her, won't you? Well, I'm sure Kitty will understand. Imagine me being blind jealous after 35 years. You, uh, told me you were out to kill your husband. Well, if, if that's true, why would you be jealous? You can be jealous, even if you hate a man, Dylan. You hate Peavy? I didn't know how much I hated him till the day that old fool Rives come by. The two of them rode off together. He come into the house and took the money and left, just like that. After 35 years. How, uh, how'd you know they'd come here? Oh, they was always talking about Dodge. It was always talking about laying on the bank of the Arkansas and drinking corn liquor, too. I knowed where they was. Hey, you're mighty dressed up for a woman riding out to shoot a man. Well, it seemed fitting somehow. Only good clothes I ever owned, Dylan. Wore them when I left home, St. Louis. Yeah. Well, well, I'm glad I ran into you, Miss Peavy, before it was too late. I'll talk to him. I told you I would. 
But I ain't never going back to him. He's had his fun. Maybe he'll settle down now. Not with me, he won't. Dylan, I bore that man 13 children. 13? 11 of them died. And he beat me. Every time we lost one. Every time, Dylan. Oh, I see. Well, uh, where are the other two? He ran them off. Don't know where they are. Oh, oh here, here comes your husband. Uh, looks like Chester's got him pretty sober. But I, I don't want to talk to him in here in front of everybody. Well, you, you could go out back there in one of the cells, if, if you don't mind. Oh, what difference it makes. My, my hat on straight, Dylan? Yeah. Yes, ma'am, you look fine. Ma'am. I'll wait out back. Here. Here they are, Mr. Dillon. Sober as deacon. What's this all about, Marshal? What do you want us for? We ain't bothered nobody. Peavy, hmm? you go out back through that door. There's somebody wants to see you. Who? Get moving. No, you stay here, Rives. Go on, Peavy. Well, all right. Who's out there, Marshal? His wife. You? What will I do with that gun, Mr. Dillon? Uh, throw them in a drawer, Chester. Okay, sir. Hey, what's that? He's beating her. Come on. Look at TV. She knocked him out. I think I killed him, Dylan. Killed him? He sure looks dead. You stabbed him. I had to. He beat me for the last time. Said he was going to kill me. I put it right in his heart. Well, you old devil, I'll bet you... No, you won't, won't, Rives. Miss Peavy, you come with me. Chester, lock up Rives in another cell. What for? You can't lock me up. Oh, you ain't even armed, Rives. Get moving. Well, I tell you, I'm an innocent man. All right, sir. Come into the office, now. Shut up. Your voice is my ear. He was going to kill me, Dylan. I know he was. Well, I... I shouldn't have let him be alone with you. You didn't know... What are you going to do with me now? You, uh... You mentioned St. Louis, Miss Peavy. Uh... You, you have any people there? My sister. She's all that's left. Huh. Well... How'd you like to see her? You ain't holding me? There was self-defense. Then I can go. I'll hold Rives here till you're out of town. Oh, but I... I can't get to St. Louis. Took all her money when he ran off. It's all spent. I know it. M- Miss Peavy, would you think I'm a scallywag cowboy if uh, I offered to stake you to St. Louis? Thanks, Dylan. Wait till I tell my sister about you. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, 
with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Ralph Moody, and Helen Cleave. Harley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Silver, star of the Broadway and film versions of Top Banana, visits Mike Wallace on Stage Struck tomorrow over most of these same stations. George Walsh speaking. Stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows in a few minutes over most of these same stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. I don't know what got into boy, Mr. Dillon. When I come for you, he was offering to shoot his initials into the mirror behind the bar. Is he drunk, Chester? Yes, sir. But mostly it seems like he just plain wants to howl. Well, he can howl all he likes as long as he keeps his gun quiet. Oh, there he goes. Yeah. I hope that's the mirror and not some man he's shooting at. Yeah, so do I. Old Doff would hate to lose that boy. All right, watch it now. Look. He's laying on the floor, Mr. Dillon. He's been killed. Look what he done to my mirror, Marshal. You shoot him, Sam? No, I hit him with a bung starter. He ain't dead. But I'm about to have to shoot his friend here. Go ahead and try it. Maybe I will. Easy, Sam. All right, what's your name, mister? My name's Blades. I work for Tom. You mean you work for his father, don't you? Well, sure. The old man owns the ranch, but... Me and Tom, we work together. Oh, my. Pick up his gun before he comes to, Chester. Yes, sir. All right, Blades. Tom's going to sleep it off in jail. You want to be locked up with him, or you're going to go home quietly? I ain't done nothing. But that girl over there got him started. Oh, what girl? That one sitting at the table in the red dress. What? Kitty? Yeah, that's her name. Wait till old Dolph hears you through his son in jail. I'll tell him myself. Now, you get out of here. I'm going. He's at the Dodge house right now, Marshal. I'd like to hear you tell him. Can you get Tom over to the jail, Chester? Yes, sir, I sure can. All right, lock him up. I'll be back later. Oh. Yes, sir. All right, come on now, Tom. Oh, you ain't hurt me. All right. You gonna let Chester put him to bed, man? Yeah. <clears throat> Sam knocked all the fight out of him, Kitty. I know. I saw it. Blade said that uh, you made him mad. That's one way of putting it. Oh, what do you mean? He made me mad. I don't like fresh kids, Matt. Right, Tom Vickers must be 20. Well, he's been acting like a kid. You know, Matt, he's changed lately. He used to be a gentleman like his father. I don't know what's come over him, but if he were mine, I wouldn't allow him off the ranch. Well, maybe you've just forgotten what it's like to be young, Kitty. I'm young enough to pour this glass of beer over your head. <laughs> you know what I mean. Sure. Well, that fellow Blades is older, though. 
Maybe he's responsible for Tom's jump in the fence. I don't like him at all. I'm sure he isn't a good influence on Tom. Yeah, Tom's too easily led. Yeah, he isn't the man his father is. He sure isn't. Anyways, he better leave me alone. Yeah, I'll tell him to. Well, i got to go see Dolph now. He isn't going to like you throwing his son in jail. Yeah, maybe not. But a stranger was shot and killed on his range yesterday. And I don't like that. Oh, I hadn't heard. Well, they haven't been talking much about it. Well, looks like you and Dolph are in for a pleasant little talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, so long, Kitty. Goodbye, Matt. <laughs> Marshal, come in. How are you, Doc? Fine, Marshal. I've been sitting here smoking a cigar before I went to bed. Have one? Uh, no, 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 thanks. Doc, uh, I got some bad news for you. Tell me. Tom tried to shoot up the Texas Trail a while ago. Sam laid him out, and all right now he's in jail. Anybody hurt? Oh, the boy's got a bump on his head, that's all. I don't like the idea of Vickers being in jail. I'm sorry, Dolph. How do I get him out? Well, I'll turn him loose in the morning. No Vickers was ever in jail before, Marshal. Well, it's not that important to me, Dolph. If you want him out now, you can come and get him. No. no he's done wrong. He's got to pay for it. I thank you for coming to tell me, Marshal. Sure, Dolph, sure. But uh, there's something else I want to talk to you about. What's that? Well, I heard that a man was shot and killed on your range yesterday. It's true. Who did it? He was rustling cattle, Marshal. Oh. Oh, were you there? No, but I've been losing a lot of stock lately. That fella got caught by my men and put up a fight. So there's one less thief around. You know who this man was? Never saw him before. But there's nothing wrong with shooting thieves, is there? I'm not if I try to shoot you first. I'm going to hire me some gunmen, Marshal. I'll show with them. No, that no, can't... that'll just cause trouble, Dolph. Gunmen will shoot anybody that happens along and then claim that they put up a fight. You know what they're like. Yeah, then everybody better stay away. Everybody won't know about it, Dolph. You don't want innocent men killed, do you? Of course I don't. But I don't want my cattle stole either. Dolph, uh, you mind if I ride back out to your place with you tomorrow and have a look around? I got business in Dodge tomorrow, but I'm going out the day after. Be glad to have you. Oh, good. Well, I'll meet you here, then. Okay, Marshal. Men branding cattle up ahead, Dolph. That'll be Tom and Blades. They got a camp near here. I put Tom in charge of this whole section. They left Dodge yesterday morning early, Dolph. I know. I saw them leave. Oh, you did? They didn't see me. I was sitting across the street. Oh. Yeah, that's Tom, all right. Coming to meet us. He shouldn't stop work just because we ride by. We'll wait here. Who now? Who? Howdy, Tom. Tom. What calves are those, Tom? Oh, it's a bunch of men gathered day before yesterday, sir. Where are the other men? How come just you and Blades are working them? Oh, we got all but about uh, 20 of them branded yesterday. I figured me and Blades could finish them alone. Two men ain't enough with a bunch like that. It'd have saved time if you'd kept more men to help. Let's ride over there. I want to look at them. 
Maybe I better stay and help you. Oh, no, sir. We're doing fine. We'll be all through by evening. Your herd's getting scattered now. We'll handle them. Sure, don't you worry none, Mr. Vickers. I ain't worried none, Blades. Tom, next time you keep at least three more men with you when you got a bunch this size. No case, sir. I'll do it. In case you're wondering about the marshal here in Chester... They're going to look things over for a day or so. Marshal thinks maybe he can cut the trail of them cattle thieves. I sure hope so. We ain't had much luck, except for that one. Now, go on back to work. I'll ride out here next week sometime. All right. Uh, get that iron ready for another one, Blaze. It's red hot now. Come on, Marshal. I'm late enough. <laughs> Sure is nice even, Mr. Dillon, ain't it? Don't you think so? What? Oh, I was just wondering what kind of an evening it is in Dodge, Chester. Oh, if there was any real trouble, somebody would have rode out and told you. Yeah, I suppose so. It's been two days now. Oh, we'd better get back tomorrow. That'll suit me fine. I swear we've rode a thousand miles over this ranch. And all for nothing, as far as I can tell. Yeah, maybe. Why don't you come set in the porch, you two? I was just walking our supper off a little bit, Dolph. Yeah, I've been in the saddle so much the last two days, I need to stand. <laughs> Suit yourselves. Uh, Dolph, from what the men tell me, you've lost only about a hundred head of calves altogether. I had the impression that it was a lot more than that. I won't put up with one calf being stolen from me, Marshal. I'm an honest man, and I work hard. And if a neighbor or stranger needs help, I'll give it to him gladly. But I'll kill the man that steals. Well, I wish you'd do one thing for me, Dolph. What's that? The next time you lose any stock, send word to me before you turn this outfit into one arm camp. Well, Marshal, if it was anybody else, I'd tell him to mind his own business. But, uh... I'll do it. Thank you, Dolph. Oh, by the way, uh, we're going to be riding back to Dodge tomorrow. All right. But I won't give you more in a couple of days next time. (laughs) Well, that's better than nothing, Dolph. get to Dodge if we stop and tally ever heard of cows we come across. Now, this is a bunch I wanted to see, Chester. We'll travel as the crow flies from here in. Come on. Why was you so interested in that herd? We must have rode through it ten times. I was sort of interested in proving something to myself, Chester. Yes, sir. Now, look up ahead there. Oh, a couple of dogs men, I reckon. Yeah, probably. I say, it's Tom and that fellow Blades. Yeah. Where's my old man, Marshal? We left him at the ranch, Tom. We're going back to Dodge. Empty-handed, huh? Not quite. What do you mean, not quite? Well, Blades, I'll tell you. I just looked over that bunch of stock back there. Sure. We gathered them yesterday. Now we're going to do a little branding. You better. We'd better? You ain't bossing us, Marshal. Just get them branded, Tom. All of them. Of course we'll get them branded. Say that you do. Come on, Chester. Yes, sir. I don't understand what you was driving at, Mr. Dillon. That's the same herd those two were working the day we rode by here with Dolph, Chester. Well, see, now, I didn't notice that. And you probably didn't notice about 20 calves in there that are still unbranded. What do you mean? Tom Vickers and his friend Blades are thieves, Chester. 
and probably murderers to boot. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, today, good engineers are needed in hundreds of varied fields. You can build a fine career as a trained engineer and at the same time help maintain America's scientific and engineering superiority. For information, write Box 40, Midtown Station, New York, 18, New York. That's Box 40, Midtown Station, New York, 18, New York. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Where's Matt? Oh, he'll be back in a minute, Doc. Sit down. No, don't mind you. Say, he told me about Dolph Vickers' son last night. Well, the only thing I can't figure, Doc, is why he don't tell Dolph. Oh, he's got his reasons, I expect. But, uh, I didn't come here to gossip. Have either of you had supper yet? Uh, I had early tonight. But Mr. Dillon probably go with you. Good uh, no. evening, Doc. Ah, you look hungry. You look worried. And all Vickers, boy? Yeah. Well, sooner or later, I'm going to have to arrest him, Doc. I've been trying to figure some way to do it without breaking the old man's heart. Well, I don't suppose there is any other way, Matt. Huh? Well, if there is, I haven't thought of it. <laughs> Somebody out back, Mr. Dick. No, stay where you are, Chester. I'll see who it is. I'll be right with you, Doc. Sure. Sure, Matt. You're going to starve to death waiting for somebody to eat with around here, Doc. Oh, why, fasting's good for Manchester. <laughs> and a little of it wouldn't hurt you. Oh. Seems to me I spent my entire youth fasting, Doc. I won't never make up for it. Uh oh. oh what? What's that? I don't know, but I better go see. Mr. Dillon? Get out, Chester. Somebody shooting at you? Quiet. It's okay, Chester. They've gone. Somebody was shooting at you. Yeah. After they knocked on the door, they ran up behind that fire shed there. Plenty poor shooting. Well, ain't we going after them? Now, they had horses hidden there. I heard them ride off. Well, I'll go buy a couple from the rail. No. Huh? No, let them go, Chester. Hey, but Mr. Dillon, they tried to ambush you. I know. But I'd prefer not to shoot him. Especially Tom Vickers. Tom? We'll ride out to the ranch tomorrow, Chester. Maybe we can bring him in without a fight. Anyway, it's worth a try. For Dolph's sake. Anybody home? Here comes somebody. Where? Oh. Hello, Marshal. Hello, Doc. Chester. Hello, Doc. Come on in. Come on in. Thank you. Where are you going, Tom? Ain't you going to say hello? I got work to do. What kind of manners is that? There's no use running away, Tom. You wouldn't get far. What? Now, come on back and sit down, huh? You do a lot of ordering around, don't you, Marshal? Sometimes I do. What's the matter between you, anyway? Be better if you told him, Tom. I don't know what you're talking about. All right. Did you brand those calves the other day? What calves? Wait a minute, Doc. Did you, Tom? Of course we did. You willing to ride out there with us and prove it? I ain't riding nowhere. 
I've had enough of this. You tell me what you're talking about. Tom? Maybe you better tell me, Marshal. Well, Duff, you remember the herd Tom and Blades were working the day we rode out here with you? Of course I do. Well, I saw that same herd on the way back to Dodge. There were still about 20 unbranded calves in it. Say it out, Marshal. I ran into Tom and Blades just beyond, and I told them to be sure and brand those calves. Go on. So they knew I was on to them. On to what? Dolph, I'm willing to bet everything I got that if we find that herd, those calves are either still unbranded or missing. What makes you so sure? Tom refuses to ride out there with us. What you're saying is mighty serious, Marshal. I hope you won't regret it. Come on, Tom. We'll go see them calves. No. We're going out there, I said. I ain't going. You'll do what I tell you. Not this time. We're going if I have to knock you down and tie you onto your horse. And you know I'll do it. Yeah, you would. Them calves ain't there. Then where are they? Twenty calves ain't hard to track, Tom. Blades got him. Got him where? Up by Little Spring. You don't have to say it. I know Little Spring ain't on this ranch. Go on. And there are three other men up there. You don't know them. They're holding over a hundred head by now. Tom. You gonna charge your own son for stealing from you? Are you? Tom, you and Blades killed that stranger to help you cover up all this, didn't you? It's too bad we didn't kill you, Marshal. What's that? They tried to ambush me in Dodge last night, Dolph. My own son. A murderer. And a thief. Tom, come into the other room with me. You'll excuse us, gentlemen. He's going to help him get away, Mr. Dillon. Not if I know Dolph, he isn't. I expect he just wants to talk to him alone before we take him to jail. Mm. Yes, sir. You know, I feel a whole lot sorrier for Dolph than I do for the boy. I guess you should. Mr. Dillon. Huh? It's all right, Marshal. Where's Tom? I killed him. Here's my gun, Marshal. I'm sorry you did it, Doc. I had to. Marshal, I'd like to bury him now. Uh, we'll help you. Nope. I'll bury my own dead. Then I'll ride into jail with you. All right. You'll get my calves back? I'll pick up a posse when we get to Dodge. The boy was my responsibility, Marshal. You understand that. What you did was wrong, Duff. You can wait here in the cool of the house. I'll be back. We'll wait. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards, Paul Dubov, Charles A. Baston, and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. 
Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in gun smoke. <laughs> Don't miss The High Mountain, a hard-hitting documentary report on the progress and problems of 15 million Negro Americans. Tomorrow in the daytime on most of these same stations. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows in a few minutes over most of these same stations. George Walsh speaking. Saturday night's Herb Schreiner shells out on Two for the Money over the CBS radio network. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. What is it, Chester? You know Tiller Evans? Oh, uh, the mule scanner? Yes, sir. What about him? He's standing out there in the street. Looks like he's about to head down Santa Fe Trail with a big load of supplies. Well? Well, I, I'm just wondering what a nice, sweet girl like Mavis McLeod can be doing with a man like that. You, uh, jealous, Chester? Oh, no, sir. But Tiller's such a mean, ugly old bull. Oh, well, look at him. Look at that. What? Well, he just hit her, Mr. Dillon. What? Huh? Slapped her right in the face. He did. I told you he was mean. Well, that's a fine way to tell a girl goodbye. Yeah. Look, he hit her again. Yeah. Oh, I hate a man that picks on women, Mr. Dillon. Oh, poor little thing. She's crying. I sure am glad we're doing something about this. About you when I get back, Mavis. I'll really whip you. You understand? No. Don't do it. Don't. That's enough, Teller. What are you butting in for, Marshal? Let go of her. This ain't no business of yours. I said let go of her. Okay. I ain't hurting her none. Am I, Mavis? Am I? You see? You got no right to mix in people's private business, Marshal. This your wagon and mule, Stiller? Of course it is. Then get going. Right now. I'm going. But if I wasn't in a hurry, I'd have this out with you right here. I'll see you when I get back next week, Marshal. Well, Mavis, you remember what I told you now. Well, do you? Yes. What's going on here, anyway? Mavis, has this beast been after you again? Don't you call me names, Kitty. I'll fix you same as her. I can't tell you from one of your mules, Tiller. Now, look at him. Leave him alone, Kitty. You get up on that wagon box, Tiller. Now. You wait like you're back. He's been hurting you again, hasn't he, Mavis? I hate him. Well, what are you doing with him if you hate him so much? Oh, he's a bully, Chester. She's afraid of him. At least he'll be away for a few days now. I hope he never comes back. Will you come with me, honey? Thanks, Kitty. I'll make you some coffee. Uh, come on, Chester. 
poor gal. You think old Tiller's going to start trouble when he gets back? I don't care if he does, Chester. No, I feel the same way. Oh, he's a mite too big for me. What? Look, there's somebody here. Are you Marshal Dillon, sir? I am. My name is Marcus France. How do you do? Uh, this is Chester Proudfoot. Mr. Proudfoot? Mr. Proudfoot. Well, how do you do, Mr. France? I witnessed that scene in the street there, Marshal. That man should be horsewhipped. He sure should. Such a pretty girl. And she's an awful nice girl, too, Mr. France. I'm sure she is. Well, Marshal, I don't want to take up your time. I thought it best we have a talk before I uh, go to work here. Well, you're a stranger in town, huh? I arrived this morning. I'm from Philadelphia, Marshal, and I'm a gambler. Uh huh. They gamble much in Philadelphia? Men gamble everywhere, sir. The weakness is universal. Yeah, I suppose. Well, you can gamble here all you like, as long as you don't run a crooked game. That's precisely what I wanted to see you about, Marshal. What? It's not that I'm dishonest, but I've often been accused of being so. Sometimes makes for unpleasantness. Around here, it usually leads to gunplay. Yes, of course. I can handle myself on that score. Mr. France, I never heard a gambler yet come out and admit he was a crook, but if he is, sooner or later, either he or somebody else winds up dead. That's why I don't tolerate anything but an honest game in Dodge. You impugn my honor, sir? He what? Never mind, Chester. Now, just what is it you want to tell me, Mr. France? I am a gentleman, Marshal. Well, if you are, you're about the first one that ever rode into this town. But for the time being, I'll believe you. Thank you, sir. And don't be so touchy about your honor. I'll just get you into trouble. I'm afraid I haven't explained myself, Marshal. There are reasons why I've often been... Dis- Accused of dishonesty. Oh, like what? A bad loser will grasp at any straw to save face. He'll even call the deal crooked. Yeah, I've seen that happen. There are likely to be many losers in a game I run. Is that so? That may sound like bragging, Marshal, but I possess great skill at cards. Also, I'm extremely lucky. I see. Now, you may send a man to watch the deal if you like. That's Mr. Proudfoot here. Oh, sure. Well, I'd be glad to come. No. You run your game, Mr. France. If it's crooked, I'll find out soon enough. All right. But uh, don't get the idea you're going to start shooting down every man that bothers you, no matter how good you might be with a gun. Do you include self-defense in justifiable homicide, Marshal? If it is self-defense. But you take to killing people even in self-defense, and I'll have to run you out of town. Oh, uh, hello, Matt. <clears throat> Chester. Hi, Doc. Fellas been trying to sell me a new horse, Matt. I thought you'd uh, take a look at it for me when, when, when you're through here. Oh, uh, sure, Doc. Uh, this is Marcus France, uh, Doc Adams. I'm pleased to meet you, Doctor. Doc will do. Of course. Where are you from, Mister? Philadelphia, sir. Not much sun there. Sun? Well, you look peaked. I've had a long journey, sir. Well, now, when you get rested up, you come see me, and I'll give you some good tonic. One dollar a bottle, Mr. France. He gave me some once. <laughs> I appreciate your interest, Doc. Perhaps I will call on you one day. Any time. Now, if yeah. you gentlemen will excuse me, I'll be going. Goodbye, Mr. France. Goodbye. What's he doing in Dodge? Huh? He's a gambler, Doc. Why? Oh, I don't know. He seems sort of out of place around here. He says he's a gentleman. Oh, maybe that's it. Well, I've heard that easy talk before. I will soon find out just what he really is. Like this could serve something besides beans with their meat, wouldn't you now, man? Honest. Oh, well, you got potatoes, Doc. I'm sick of them, too. Yeah. Once you got married, Doc, and then you could eat fine. <laughs> oh, the last woman that wanted to marry me was a hog and harmony cook. <laughs> I don't think she ever heard of any other kind of food. Why didn't you ever take her out? 
Okay, girl. Oh, man. That was in Arkansas. <laughs> she didn't even wear shoes. You old liar. No, 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 no. I swear. <laughs> Her pappy had a saying that every woman's entitled to a baby and a bonnet. But shoes were never mentioned in that house. <laughs> You must have been a handsome couple. Oh, well, of course. I was somewhat younger then. <laughs> a lot younger, I hope. I was, I was. And <laughs> good thing, too. They lived in a place called Rip Shin Thicket. <laughs> Rip Shin Thicket. They caught in that girl was a day's work, man, believe me. <clears throat> Doc, why don't you finish your supper? I'm not even listening to you. Oh, and she had a brother called Spotted Jack. He claimed he never slept in the bed his whole life. <laughs> Or took a bath. There must be something else we can talk about, Doc. Oh, man. Well, anything at all. Anything at all. Gee. Well, what are you going to do about that gambler, that Marcus France, for example? Well, I don't know yet, Doc. Well, he's been here for a week and he's already killed a man. That was self-defense, all right. But if it happens again, he's through. You think he's dealing honest, Matt? Uh, so far, he is. Uh, well, oh. Mr. Dillon. Doc? Well, Chester. Chester. Yeah, I've been over to Texas Trail. Miss Kitty asked me to find you. Huh? Trouble? I don't know. But she said it was really important. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, Doc, uh, you didn't tell me that Arkansas girl's name. Oh, well, it's a funny thing, Matt. Uh, but she never told me. to see me, huh? Sit down, Matt. All right. It's, um, it's about Marcus France over there. Oh? Uh -huh. He's going to be killed, Matt. What? Tiller Evans is due back tomorrow. Well, what's Tiller got to do with it? You remember the day he left when you stopped him from slapping Mavis around? Mavis? You mean Mavis and France? Are... She says she's in love with him, Matt, and she doesn't care who knows it. Underneath, she's scared to death. Uh -huh. Well, does France know about Tiller? Uh -huh. Mavis told him. Matt, I don't know what you think about him, but to me, he's the most decent man I've met in a long time. Well, he may be, Kitty. But he's sure causing a lot of trouble. Well, Tiller's going to kill him. I know he is. you got to stop it, Matt. Kitty, how did a nice girl like Mavis get started with Tiller in the first place? Oh, she didn't have much choice. The big ape just moved in on her and took over. She's awful young, Matt, and pretty helpless. Well, if she and France is so much in love, why don't they get married? <laughs> I've thought of that, too. So has Mavis, by the way. Ah. Well, maybe France isn't so honorable after all, Kitty. Ah, give him time, Matt. Well, tomorrow isn't very far off. Before I said you're cheating, and I meant No man can call me a cheat, I just did, didn't I? Stay here, Kitty. Yeah. Better leave the game, mister. You're cheating, you're dealing crooked cards. You got it done, mister. Now use it. Leave that gun where it is. Now, France, I warned you once. You heard what he said, Marshal. I meant it, too. He's dealing crooked cards. Can you prove it, mister? I don't have to prove it. He's got over $100 of mine. I ain't want a hand at this table in an hour. See, Marshal? Just like I told you, some men can't take losing. Did you see him cheating, mister? I didn't have to. Look at that pile of money. You talk pretty loose for a man that doesn't have any more to go on than that. Now, why don't you forget about it and get out of here? Forget about you it? You heard me. This game is closed for the rest of the night. Well, just as Good. you say, Marshal. Gentlemen, the game is closed. Oh, I'll see you later. Oh, oh France. You know, egging men into a draw and then calling it self-defense is going to make your stay in Dodge mighty brief. I'll have to chance that, Marshal. How many men have you killed because of that tender pride of yours, huh? Well, it doesn't matter. But there's something I would like to know. What are you going to do about Tiller Evans? Oh, you heard. Yeah. First time in my life, Marshal. I love a woman. Then why don't you get her out of here while there's still time? Run away from a fight? Tell us a pretty tough man. You mean he might kill me? And where would that leave Mavis? 
Sorry, Marshal. I've got to stay. You know, France, I can't figure you at all. There's something wrong with you, and I don't know what it is. You'll find out, Marshal. Soon enough. return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, tomorrow afternoon on Stage Struck, Mike Wallace and CBS Radio cover the opening of the new Broadway musical, The Girl in Pink Tights. Its star, Jean Mayer, Charles Goldner, and others in the cast will be heard. Stage Struck on most of these same stations tomorrow afternoon, opening The Girl in Pink Tights, a promising newcomer full of Sigmund Romberg's music. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. now, Mr. Dillon. Oh, uh, what won't be long, Chester? Cowboy just told me he passed Tiller Evans a couple miles down the trail. He'd be driving into town directly. Oh. Uh, Chester. Hmm? What do you think of Marcus France? Him? Well, sir, for a fact, I'm dubitated. What? Well, he seems like such a nice fellow, but he just won't do what he plain in order. Like? Get married with Mavis McLeod like she wants him to. That'd stop old Tiller. Uh, maybe. Well, the very least he could do is run off with her. Mr. Dillon, I just hate to think what'll become of that little girl if Tiller gets her. Well, one way or another, Chester, there's about to be a killing. And I gotta try to stop it. How are you gonna do it? Well, there's a stage north in half an hour. Yeah, but Mr. France won't go. Chester, hmm? you know where Mavis lives, don't you? Yes, sir. All right, go get her. I'll put her on the stage. I'll meet you there. Okay, Mr. Dillon. Now, you're going to have to hurry. Please come in. Thank you. I am honored, sir. Would you care for a glass of whiskey? Uh, no. No, thank you. The very best money can buy. France. Hmm? Tiller Evans will be here shortly. He'll be looking for me, Marshal, not I for him. Well, anyway, it happens there'll be a killing. One sinner less in the world. I'm a lawman, France, not a preacher. Yes, of course. Now, Marshal, I have no quarrel with this man, Tiller. Why don't you talk to him? Well, he's not the kind of a man you can talk to. Well, then put him in jail for disturbing the peace or something. It'll be too late by the time the peace is disturbed. France, there's a stage leaving Dodge in a few minutes. Is there, Marshal? Mavis is going to be on it. What? Now, if you're the gentleman you say you are, he'll be on it with her. You're making a mistake, Marshal. Well, I've made mistakes before. No use arguing with you, is there? Well, if you told me what's holding you back, there might be. Shall we say I never run from a fight? I don't question that. But this time it's different. I don't believe that's your reason. You say goodbye to Mavis for me, Marshal? No. I've, uh, just decided you're going with her. I'm sorry. I'm not. 
Careful, Marshal. I'm always careful. No, you... <laughs> Where's Mavis, Chester? She's inside the coach. I'm keeping an eye on her. All right, open the door, Chester. France is going with her. Yes, sir. Marcus. Marcus, what happened? He hasn't hurt, Mavis. But he'll be out for a while yet. Why are you doing this, Marshal? Well, I'm a gambler, too, Mavis. And I'm taking a chance that man here of yours is what he says he is. He's a fine man. Well, goodbye, Mavis. And good luck. All right, driver. Yeah. Get this stage out of here. Sure, Marshal. Hold on there. What? Get going, driver. Hold on. Go on. Come back here. Stop that stage. It's too late, Teller. You, you done this, Marshal. Now take it easy. And that tin horn. Run off with my gal. And you helped him. She wanted to go. Nobody steals nothing from Tiller Evans. I'll find him and I'll kill him. Both of them. No, you won't. Oh, I've got to kill you first, eh? Why don't you go get drunk and forget about it, Tiller? You helped him. Don't do it. I'll do it. <laughs> Chester. Yes, sir. Take care of this, will you? Yes, sir. A couple of you fellas, give me a hand here. We'll drag him over at that trough. Leon, you and Phil. Matt? Yeah. Is Tiller bad hurt? No, you'll be all right, Doc. Not sad of being a little lonely. Mavis is going to be a little lonely, too. What? Marcus France. He did come to my office, man. What are you talking about, Doc? His lungs. That's why he came west. I wouldn't give him over a couple of months at the most. Oh. Uh, Mavis just isn't very lucky, is she, Doc? No. No, she isn't. But thanks to you, at least they'll have what time there is. He wouldn't have left with her any other way. Yeah. I guess Marcus really is a gentleman. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Eleanor Tannen, John Daner, and Harry Bartell. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Monday night, CBS Radio Suspense stars Ronald Reagan. The drama is an unusual one titled Circumstantial Terror. In it, a man is on trial for a killing he didn't commit, and a guilty man is on the jury. Tension mounts and mounts until the suspense is almost beyond belief. Don't miss Suspense Monday night over most of these same stations. George Walsh speaking.
Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows in a few minutes over most of these same stations. For more outstanding drama, remember the Lux Radio Theater, Monday nights on the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Barkeep. Barkeep, get down here. His name's Sam, mister. That's so? What's your name? Neil Butler. Ain't you pretty young to be drinking so much hard liquor, Neil? I'm 19. But I've been around Dodge longer than you have. Kind of sassy for a kid, ain't you? Man enough to ride for fate in her. Fate Ender? You never heard of him? Maybe I have. Anybody that's ever been near a Longhorn Steer has heard of Fate Ender. Uh, sure. He's a hard man to work for, though. How's that? Well, he eats one meal a day and don't drink or smoke. So he has a big advantage over the likes of me and you. Mm -hmm. Does he pay regular? Looking for a job, mister? It ain't mister, it's Lee Shin. Okay, Shin. And I'm looking for a drink, not a job. Sam! Hey, Sam! Yeah, it's about enough, Jim. You ain't my nursemaid. I'm buying a drink for me and Lee Shin here. I've been yelling for one long enough. Sometimes I'm hard of hearing. You know, I've seen bar keeps with their heads all busted open. Shin, huh? And, uh, where would you have seen that, Shin? Texas, maybe. Well, you ain't in Texas now. Lay off of him, Sam. He's new around here. Fetch them drinks. I just don't believe I will. Now, looky here. <laughs> you don't pull much weight around here, do you, Neil? He's had enough, Shin. Don't you egg him on. He can take care of himself. Of course I can. Sam... You give me a drink or by heaven I'll bore a hole in you. Now take it easy, kid. You don't think I will, huh? Well, you better not try. I'll try. All right, you hold it, mister. Watch him, Marshal. I ain't made a move. No, but you was about to. It'd have been too bad for you if I had, Bart. Never mind that. Throw some water on Neil there, Chester. All right, Mr. Dillon. Okay. You got any water, Sam? What kind of place you think I run? Well, give me some beer, then. You paying for it? <laughs> Mr. Dillon? Forget it, Chester. The kid's coming, too, anyway. Oh. Oh. You're a stranger in Dodge, mister. Suppose I am. Don't start any trouble, that's all. I ain't done a thing. I've just been standing here. It's that mean-tempered barkeep started it. You want me to break a bottle over your head, Shin? See? Blast you, Sam. What'd you hit me with, anyway? The usual. If you try that again, I'll hit you twice. You sure sobered me some. Eh. Sobered you, did he? What were you doing drunk in the first place? 
Now, Mr. Render... Shut up, Neil. I can tell what's been going on here, and I don't like it. It's all right now, Mr. Render. You, uh, going to arrest him, Marshal? No. I got nothing to arrest him for, Fate. Drunkenness? He won't cause any more trouble. You're trying to protect him, eh? Well, it ain't going to work. He's sober now. Look at him. Sure, he, he's all right, Fate. I just had a little argument with him. More than nothing. I'm not blaming you, Sam, but a man has to learn to hold his liquor. Or not drink at all. It's a lot easier not to drink at all. The way you do, Fate. Maybe. But I remember the time I felt I'd come to be a state of man when I'd learned to drink one and one-half quarts of whiskey daily. That's a lot of whiskey. But I quit. Fifteen years ago, I quit. You ain't had a drop since? Only once. A friend of mine who was a candidate for office tempted me into a glass. I felt like I'd stolen a sheep. Well, you can't expect everybody to feel the same way, Faith. I don't, Marshal. But I recognize the weakness for liquor when I see it. And young Neil here's got to learn. Mr. Ender, I ain't been drunk in two weeks. Till today. Two weeks? Neil, if you ain't man enough to stay away from it longer than that, you ain't man enough to work for me. You mean I'm fired? You'll draw your pay tomorrow morning. Good day, gentlemen. Well, Mr. Render. That old moss head. He needs shooting. You'll start thinking about finding a job, Neil, not shooting somebody. Maybe I'm tired of working. Say, where'd that fella Shin go? His plum disappeared. Never mind about him. Look, uh, Neil... They're looking for some help over at the OK stables. Maybe it'd keep you in feed till you find something else, huh? Thanks, Marshal. But I got some thinking to do first. Sure is a hard man, Mr. Dillon. Uh, hard enough to cure himself of drinking, anyway. Yeah, but he needn't have been so mean with Neil the other day. He could have gave him a second chance. Oh, uh, Neil can get another job. That's right, no. But I don't cotton to a man being so self-righteous. My, I'll bet old Ender's made lots of mistakes in his time. Uh, people say he has. Only nobody's caught up with him yet. Mm. What do you mean? Ah, uh, back in Texas, he used to spread a mighty wide loop, Chester. I expect it was a long time before he paid money for any cabs. Oh, well, I never heard he was a thief. Oh, he isn't. Not now. It was just after the war when everybody was branding anything in sight. Cattle were running wild then, what was so few men to look after them. Yes, sir, I know. One of my brothers got caught at it. Oh, uh-huh. You never told me that, Chester. Well, it's something us proud folks don't bring up very often, Mr. Dillon. <clears throat> uh, no. No, of course not. No, sir. My brother wouldn't like it. What? Well, he's a banker now. A banker? Yes, sir. At a place called Pavo. That's over west of San Antonio. Real dry country there. He likes it. But I sure don't. My goodness, the wind and the dust. Ah, yeah, Matt. Ah, uh, hello, Doc. Yeah, say, you better come upstairs. Oh, what's the trouble? The fate ended. He didn't want to see you, but I sneaked down anyway. He didn't want to see me about what? I just took a bullet out of his arm, Matt. What? And he's talking about killing the man that put it there. Who? He didn't say. Oh, uh, wait here, Chester. Uh, I didn't hear about no gunfight, Mr. Dillon. Neither did I. Is he hurt bad, Doc? Well, I didn't even break the bone, Matt. It'll be a mite painful for a while. He's resting a little right now. That's how I get away. Well, I'm glad you did. Uh, I might have known that's where you went, Doc. No man comes in here carrying a bullet without my telling the marshal, Fate. How'd this happen, Fate? I'll skin my own snakes, Marshal. Not around here, you won't. 
I've killed men before, and I don't need no help to do it again. Somebody took a wild shot at you, is that it? Not so wild it didn't hit me. Well, maybe he wasn't trying to kill you. He didn't get close enough for any such trick shooting. A little coward. Oh. You think it was Neil, huh? Of course it was. And I'll kill him. I'll kill him, sure, Marshal. Why do you think it was Neil, Fate? I know it was. Tried to kill me while I was crossing the Arkansas on my way into town. But he was a quarter mile off, behind a bluff. Just too bad for him he didn't hit my gun arm. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. If he was behind the bluff, how do you know who it was? You're just complicating things, Marshal. I heard he threatened to kill me the other day when I fired him. All right, Fate. I'll find him, and if we can prove he did it, he'll go to jail. He won't go to jail if I find him first, Marshal. You won't stop me. I've lived too long to be killed by some hot-headed kid. You've got a right to protect yourself, Fate. But murder's a hanging offense these days. And if you don't want to see me hung, you better move fast, Marshal. return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, Barbara Stanwyck and Barry Sullivan play their original screen roles again in the Lux Radio Theater adaptation of Jeopardy. It's the story of a wife who encounters a killer during her frantic race to save her husband from death. Remember, Jeopardy on the Lux Radio Theater Monday night over most of these same stations. On the same evening, hear Victor Mature in The Girl in Car 32 on Suspense. Mature plays a cop who, chasing a jewel thief, finds love along the way. Here's Suspense, also Monday night at the star's address. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. For all his hard-headedness, Fate Ender was as good a citizen as any around Dodge. And in some ways, a lot better. In any case, I didn't want to see him hung any more than I wanted to see young Neil shot. And since fate wasn't the kind of a man you could argue with or throw in jail to cool off, I went looking for Neil. He wasn't at the OK stable, but a small boy there told us that he'd be right back. So Chester and I sat down in one of the stories and waited. Mr. Dillon... Mr. Dillon, you don't think Neil's going to admit trying to stage an ambush, do you? Well, he'd be a fool if he did, Chester. Hmm? And what are you going to do with him? I don't know. Well, maybe he'll do it by himself. What? Yeah, maybe this is him. Hey, it's that fellow Shin. Be quiet, Chester. Well, sometimes I think it'd be worth hanging for him. Even if I did get caught. That's more like it, kid. Don't you let nobody bluff you. He ain't all bluff. I've seen him. Neil, fate enders like a Confederate dollar. Like 500 Confederate dollars, in fact. He's just that no good. Well, I don't know. But anyways, he sure didn't treat me fair. I mean, I shouldn't have talked so much about shooting him. Don't you worry, kid. They can't do nothing to you. They can't prove nothing at all. Of course they can't. What's that to prove, me? Marshal. Take your hand off that gun, Chin. Why, sure. Shouldn't jump out at a man like that, Marshal. Well, my being here wouldn't bother most men. What do you mean? I, uh, take it you've heard about Fate Ender getting shot. Uh, I heard. And he's saying I did it, too. Well... Don't tell him nothing, kid. You don't need no alibi. Suppose you stay out of this, Shin. Well, why should I? I'm the only friend Neil's got around Neil here. can talk for himself. Everybody's got a rope on the kid. It ain't That's fair. enough out of you. He's just trying to help me, Marshal. But he don't need to. I can prove I wasn't anywhere near there. Oh? Well, how do you know where it happened, Neil? A friend of mine met him on the way into town. Ender told him all about it, and he comes straight off and told me. Ender says it was a noon, Marshal. You want to know where I was at noon? 
Yeah, where? At the Texas Trail, talking to Kitty. I'm going back there right now and get her to prove it before Ender find me and tries to kill me. Now, wait a minute, Mayo. Let him go. It won't do any good, kid. Of course it will. Darn fool, kid. Shen. Why won't it do any good? There's nobody will believe either of them. You'll say they're both lying. He's paid off Kitty or something. I'm right there, Neil. No! Hey, that was fate into Mr. Dillon? Yeah. All right, drop that gun, fate. Drop it. Don't let him shoot me again. I ain't going to shoot you again. Not this time, anyway. Here. Take my gun, Marshal. You know, you don't have to kill a man to go to jail, Fate. All right, Chester, keep an eye on him. Yes, sir. How are you, Neil? He busted my shoulder, Marshal. Well, you're lucky. I seen him coming and I got scared. But I wasn't fast enough. Oh. You weren't fast enough? I know him. He'd never bother saying so. But I drew first, Marshal. I gotta admit it. Now. Chester. Yes, sir? Uh, give Neil a hand here, huh? Picking up the ducks. Okay, Mr. Dillon. Shin can help you, Chester. <laughs> he's run off, Neil. Seems like he's kind of gun shy. All right, now, come on. Put your arm around me. Be careful. Put it on there. We are. Look, lock some, Neil. Tell me something, Fate. How come you didn't finish him off while you had the chance? Well, I would have. The first shot hadn't crippled him. I ain't no murderer, Marshal. But you'll kill him when he gets well. Is that it? I'll kill him. Of course I will. Kitty, Sam. I can tell you're not going to make any money off him today, Sam. Uh, have a drink on the house, Marshal. Uh, no, no. Kitty's right, Sam. I didn't come here for pleasure. Uh, I heard about Fate Ender being shot. Is that what it is, man? Yeah. Kitty, hmm? young Neil claims that he was in here at noon talking to you. Yeah, he was, Matt. Funny thing is, he was talking about fate most of the time. Sam was here, too. He heard him. Yeah, he sure did. If what he was saying is true, fate's about the sharpest dealer I ever heard of. Huh? What do you mean, Miss Ed? Oh, it's just a story about fate when he was still in Texas. <laughs> go on, go on. Hey, tell him, kitty. Tell him. Well, uh, seems fate owed a man $500 when the war broke out. But he told him he'd keep it for him so he'd have something when he got out of the army. That was during the Confederacy, of course. So when the fellow came back to collect his money, fate shoved a whole barrel of it at him and told him to help himself. <laughs> that's so much. <laughs> fate claimed the debt had been made in Confederate money, so that's what he paid off with. <laughs> Pretty foxy of him, don't you think, man? Five hundred no good Confederate dollars. <laughs> Uh, Kitty, hmm? did uh, Neil say where he'd heard this story? Oh, that new friend of his, Shen. He told him why. Hey, uh, it's a good story, Kitty. It's a, it's a real good story. <laughs> Got the bullet out and everything. Yeah, there's nothing more I can do now. You're you're a mighty lucky young fella, Neil. <laughs> I don't call getting shot so lucky. I ain't talking to you, mister. When you come back tomorrow, Neil, I'll, I'll have to change that dressing. Sure, Doc. Let's get out of here, Shim. Okay. Uh, Shen. 
Yeah. Where'd, uh, where'd you go after the shooting at the stable? Nothing I could do for him there, Marshal. Come on, kid. Now, you, you wait here a minute, Neil. I'd more like to talk to you. What for? Well, I ain't waiting. You might be interested in this, too, Shen. i wait for you at the stable, Neil. That's far enough, Shen. I've heard all your talk I need. Marshal. Shen, maybe fate and her outsmarted you, but $500 isn't enough to try to kill a man over. Now, wait! Get over for the one to Chester in case he makes the street. I'm going after him. Yes, sir. Dylan, right there. What? I got him. All right. Oh, did, did you shoot him, Chester? I didn't hear anything. No, sir. That chamber pot there, I dropped it right on his head. What? <laughs> A bullseye, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's your prisoner, Chester. Come on down and lock him up. Yes, sir. I'll be right there. <laughs> Neil? Yes, sir. The marshal here told me the whole story. Looks like we both made a mistake, Mr. Render. Shin wasn't much of a friend, was he? Trying to hide behind you all the time. I took up with him when I was drunk. That's the whole trouble. Neil, I'm kind of old. Sometimes I guess I forget what it's like to be young... Yes, sir. And I... Well, uh... That's all right, Mr. Ender. No, no, it ain't all right. Uh, maybe, uh, what he's trying to tell you, Neil, is that, uh... He went and paid Doc for fixing you up. He did? And Doc says it'll only be a couple of weeks before you can ride again. A couple of weeks is too long for a little wound like that. I won't have no namby-pambies riding for me. You hear? Yes, sir. I hear. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, James Ogg, Harry Bartell, and Barney Phillips. Harley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Grown-ups love him. Now, who could be so universally admired? Why, no one else but that singing cowboy, Gene Autry. Tomorrow night, Gene Autry invites all his friends to visit him at Melody Ranch for a half hour of songs and stories about the Old West. You don't need any roadmaps to get to Melody Ranch. Just turn on your radio and tune in the Gene Autry Show, Sunday nights over most of these same CBS radio stations. George Walsh speaking. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows in a few minutes over most of these same stations. For Mystery Mixed with Merriment, join Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. city and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun 
Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Well, what'll it be, stranger? Nothing. What? I don't drink. Is that what she come in here for, to tell me you don't drink? I didn't come in here to tell you nothing, Barkeep. You won't be the first stranger in Dodge I've had to straighten out, Which Mr. one of these men is the marshal? The marshal? The marshal. I was told I'd find him here. He's here. He's sitting right behind you, so don't start nothing. Oh, is that him sitting right there? That's him. Well. Marshal Dillon. Yeah. I want to talk to you, Marshal. I'll go ahead. Do you mind if I sit down? No. Huh. Now, my name is Ben Corder, Marshal. Ben Corder. This is my first time in Dodge. I know. And I want to be friends, Marshal. Uh, why not? <laughs> now, I figure we can do each other a lot of good. A lot of good. Oh? Is that so? That sure is. That's why I came to talk to you. See, uh, whenever I come to a new town, I always get to know the man that's running the place. That way I figure there won't be no misunderstandings later on. Misunderstanding about what? Well, I'm a gambler, Marshal. A Dodge is an open town, Mr. Corder. Oh, sure. You see, I make money gambling. Sometimes a lot of money. Now, you must be pretty lucky. Oh? Uh, <laughs> I'm lucky, all right. But now, you know how sometimes a player will go broke and start a fuss over it, maybe even run to the law about it? Yeah. Yeah, I know. And when he does, he's usually been cheated. Oh, some losers always got to complain about something. Is that what you came to tell me, Mr. Corder? Oh, Marshal, you know what I'm talking about. Now you take care of the troublemakers, and I'll take care of you. Say, a quarter of the profits, eh? <clears throat> Let me explain something to you, Mr. Corder. If a man loses his money gambling, I figure that's his lookout. But I still don't allow any crooked games in Dodge because sooner or later they lead to killing. So you run your game straight. Now, out you go. That's not friendly, Mark. Now, you've made one mistake, Mr. Corder, trying to bribe me. You make another and you're through here. For good. Oh, you're one of the hard-nosed lawmen, eh? <laughs> You'll find out soon enough, mister. Well, I... Now, I've got an idea that I can persuade you yet, Marshal. Dillon? Yeah. What is it, Chester? Did you ever hear of a place called Deming? Deming? Oh, that's in New Mexico. Well, is it a nice place? Oh, sure. Why? Oh, this girl I know is going to move there. Oh? Is, uh... Is she a nice girl, Chester? She was. <laughs> what do you mean, she was? Well, I haven't seen her since she was about ten, and that was over twenty years ago. Well, what are you writing to the girl for, Chester? Oh, I don't write to her. I write to her brother, Welby. He tells me about everything. 
Uh, yeah, well, I'd better get out before you explain it to me. He wants me to marry up with her, Mr. Dillon. Oh, he does, huh? Yes, sir, but once a year, regular, I write and tell him I won't do it. Uh, yeah. He's getting too dang old. That's what's the matter with her. Uh, well, don't mm-hmm. forget to put the lamp off before you leave the office tonight, Chester. No, sir, I won't. Get off it. You see anybody? You want the rifle? No. Crawl over and put the lamp out, Chester, but keep low. Yes, sir. All right, we'll wait here a minute. He'll get away. Now, he had our rifle, Chester, and he was in the alley right across the street. It was mighty poor shooting. Unless all he wanted to do was scare me. Oh, then it was that gambler you told me about. Corder, huh? Yeah, maybe. But I can't prove it. Well, you sure ought to do something about it. I am. I'm gonna get something to eat. What? While well, you go out and drop the word here and there about me getting shot at. But why? Just do it, Chester. Yes, sir. I'll be around later. Evening, Matt. Hello, Kitty. Are you uh, busy? No. Sit down. Ah, uh, thank you. I heard about you getting shot at tonight. Well, I've been shot before, Kitty. Oh, and I suppose I shouldn't worry about oh, it. Oh, now, Kitty, don't start that. It's just luck you weren't killed years ago, Matt. It stopped being luck, Kitty, when I learned how to handle a gun myself. Sure. And anyway, somebody has to enforce the law, don't they? <laughs> well, that's the way I look at it. I'm sorry, Matt. Good evening, Marshal. Hello, Corder. Ah, right pretty girl. How long you been wearing shoes, mister? Ah, uh, look here. Say what you have to say, Corder. You sure do make it hard to be friends, Marshal. I only wanted to say that I heard that you got shot at tonight. So? Well, I'm sorry it happened, that's all. I don't envy a man has to be a Marshal. It's mighty dangerous. Besides that, it usually don't pay very good. And what do you think I ought to do about it, Corder? Quit? No. <laughs> that ain't necessary, Marshal. Because if you were smart, you could stay right here and make good money and be real safe to boot. <laughs> I didn't know for sure it was you, Corder. But now I know. What are you talking about? There's a stage leaving Dodge about sunup. You're going to be on it. Oh, no, I'm opening a new game across the street tomorrow. I'll take your gun, Corder. Oh, wait a minute, Marshal. You can't do that. I think I can. Oh, by <laughs> heaven, you... Corder went to bed early that night in jail. But I got him up next morning in plenty of time to make the stage. He climbed into it, meek as a bird, and then it left. And I soon forgot about him. Like so many others, I'd run out of Dodge. I figured he'd keep going and make his trouble somewhere else. But a couple of weeks later, I found out I'd figured wrong. I was walking up Front Street one afternoon with Doc. Uh, I tell you, Matt, I'm going to take down my shingle one of these days and let all these people find themselves a good vet. <laughs> Who's been sour in your milk, Doc? Oh, uh, Miss Humboldt. That's who. She's been coming in every day for a week. Ah, you're usually complaining about a shortage of patients, Doc. Yeah, well, that woman's not a patient. She's a suicide. Well, now, Doc, that might be said of anybody who comes to you. Huh? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, well, the price for cutting bullets out of you just went up, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Tell me about Miss Humboldt. Oh, she wants to be bled all the time, and I won't do it. Uh, a lot of people think bleeding's good for them. Well, I do. Yeah. Oh. Oh. oh, Doc. Hi, Chester. He's right inside the Alpha again here, Mr. Dillon. I just saw him. 
Huh? Who did you see, Chester? That gambler, Corder. What? And he's got somebody else with him, some stranger. Well, well, we'll see you later, Doc. Oh, yeah, well, sure. Come on, Chester. There they are, at the bar, Mr. Jones. Well, I'll be... There he is, Tom. That's him. Him? I'm back, Marshal. Brought a man with me to sort of look after my interests. You won't buffalo him so easy. Hello, Tok. You really the Marshal here? Didn't Corder tell you? He didn't mention no name. Yeah, what are you talking about? Tok Mullen and I are old friends, Corder. We worked and rode a long time together. In fact, we went through quite a lot. Didn't we, Tok? Too much, Matt. Remember? Yeah, I remember. You're Marshal now, huh? And you've sold your gun to Corder here. Is that right? That's right. So you're here to kill me? Yeah. I'm here to kill you. Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, tomorrow night, Herbert Marshall stars as the Honorable Edmund Burke, British statesman and member of Parliament. Hear his story on CBS Radio tomorrow night on the Radio Hall of Fame with Lionel Barrymore as your host. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. It was a bad feeling to meet Toke Marlin again after some 15 years and to have him standing at the bar of the Alafraganza hired by a crooked gambler to kill me. Toke and I had run horses together over in Colorado until the night we rode into La Hunta and got taken by a drunken mob and beaten half to death. And the next day, when they found out we weren't the men they wanted, it was too late. By then, something had gone wrong inside Toke. And as soon as he could climb on a horse, he'd ridden off without a word. I never saw him again. Until now. How long you been, Marshal? Quite a while, Toke. I never figured a lawman for much. A lot of people don't. Like Corder here. Uh, go ahead, Toke. Shoot him. I'll back you up. I handle my own gunfighting. Porter. I want to talk to you, Tuck. Uh, come on over to the table. No, right? you don't, Marshal. You stay Shut right up, here. Shut up, Porter. Come on, Tuck. Sit down. Well, Tuck, is this your profession now? Shooting people? I gamble a little. Why do you do it, Took? I don't like people much. Not after what happened at La Hunter. Oh, you got over that beating? We both did. Anyway, that was a long time ago. Maybe my memory is better than yours. No. No, it isn't. We both changed after that, Took. <laughs> we sure did. But in different ways. Now you hate everybody, I just hate mobs. I guess that's one reason I became a lawman. There was a lawman helping them that night, La Hunter. The sheriff himself. Well, there are good sheriffs and bad. Like marshals? Like anybody, Took. It's kind of too bad you're a marshal, Matt. You mean you're going through with this anyway? I never back off from a fight. Well, suppose I won't fight. I get paid all the same. But you'll have to get out of Dodge. You think I'll do that? No. But I'll give you 24 hours to worry it around. All right, Tuck. 
That gives you 24 hours, too. I don't change. Talk's nothing to me. But money is. It adds to the pleasure. Tell me something, Tuck. Huh. You'd, uh, enjoy shooting me? You ain't Matt Dillon no more. You're a lawman. Same as the one who helped him half kill me. You too, Lord. Oh, you're a fool, Tuck. Maybe. But I'm a pretty good gunman. Sure. You can let Corder run his game here, or you can quit. It's a crooked game. There'd be fights. Men would die. 24 hours, Marshal Dillon. Okay. 24 hours. Your cut, Chester. You sure you don't want to stop, Mr. Dillon? Oh, just because I've been losing? It could be a bad omen, especially today. That's like I told Kitty, Chester. I don't depend on luck. Oh. Oh, well. You two still playing cards? Oh, Doc. Doc, how many, Chester? Uh, one. Mm-hmm. Match have been hiding out in here all day long while everybody's talking about how you let that gambler come back to town yesterday after running him out. And I don't like it. I'm taking three, Chester. It'll all be settled tonight, Doc. Mm-hmm. Now, they're saying you're afraid of that gunman he's got with him, that, 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 that toke something. Sure bet, Chester. Uh, Doc, don't get drunk too early today, huh? We might need you. Oh, I quit. I can't even think of that, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> okay, Chester. If there's anything I hate, it's a paid gunman. A paid gunman? Oh, so that's what he is. Ain't there no way at all to stop him, Mr. Dillon? How are you going to stop a man that kills just for money? Just for money? Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Doc, you, do you know where he is now? Well, he, well, he was in the Texas Trail uh, a little while ago, Matt. He... Good. I'll be back later. <laughs> Dillon. Sit down, Marshal. You know Miss Kitty here? Hello, Matt. Kitty. I've been talking about you, me, and Kitty. I've been talking about me, too. Good. That's what I want to talk about, Tuck. Me? I'll go right ahead. But don't stay too long. She's a real pretty girl, Matt. Maybe I'd better leave. But if you leave, I leave with you. Matt? It's all right, Kitty. Stay. Talk. how much is Quarter paying you to get rid of me? Three hundred dollars. Yeah. Well, what if I give you three hundred? To shoot him, huh? You don't care who you kill, do you? It don't matter much. No. All right. I'll give you 300 to clear out of here and forget this whole business. Why? Well, we were good friends once, Took. Till you got mad and started hating everybody. You've changed too, Matt. You sure never were a coward in the old days. Is that what you think I am? Well, so does Kitty. Don't you, Kitty? Don't tell me what I think, mister. <laughs> He's full of vinegar, Matt. A girl like that deserves a real man. Yeah... I think I'll get my money from Corridor so I can hang around Dodge and get a little better acquainted with her. No, I am leaving. Well, I guess there's nothing more to say, Top. Nothing I know of. See you in about an hour, Marshal. Unless you go hide. <laughs> Shorty, 
I told him, Mr. Dillon. Thanks, Chester. He said he likes the idea of meeting you in the street. So do I. There's less chance of anybody else getting hurt out here. Yes, sir. Uh-oh. There he comes. Yeah. Mr. Dillon, I... I wish you'd... Get out of the street, Chester. Yes, sir. I guess you ain't a coward after all. Then get out of Dodge, Toke. And take Corder with you. Corder don't mean nothing to me. Does anything? Just killing people. Especially lawmen. Okay, Toke. Go ahead. Watch me. Chester. Yes, sir. Take care of him, will you? You going after Corder? Corder isn't the kind of man who'll stay around after this. No, I'm... I'm going for a ride. Alone. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, and Vic Perrin. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Laughs Ahead on CBS Radio tomorrow night with Our Miss Brooks on most of these stations. George Walsh speaking. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows in a few minutes over most of these same stations. There's comedy with my little Margie Sunday nights on the CBS Radio Network.
city and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Smoke, starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, the United States Marshal. I'm that dry I could fair spit cotton, Mr. Dillon. Oh, you can fill up at the Olifraganza when we get back to Dodge, Chester. Yes, sir. But right now, I'd settle for a drink of water. <laughs> you can't be that thirsty. I'm about to stampede. You think there might be a spring in that clump of elder up ahead? Yeah, there might. I swear next time I'm going to carry a water bag. And keep it wrapped in your pillow, I suppose, huh? You know, Chester, town life has made you mighty soft. That's far enough. Look. He's got a rifle, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Who are you, men? I was looking for water. Is there a spring in there? I said, who are you? What's your name? Matt Dillon. And I'm Chester Proudfoot. You don't worry me. And I never heard of no Dillon. Well, then you shouldn't mind if we got a little water. Okay. But you'll have to drop them gun belts first. One at a time. Sorry. You heard me. You can't shoot both of us, mister. Who is it, Harp? One of them's called Dillon. Dillon? From Dodge? You from Dodge? Yeah. That's what he says. Well, bring him in here. He'll help us. He's a U.S. Marshal. A Marshal? That's right, Hart. And instead of us standing here about to shoot each other, why don't you tell me why you need help? I'm Joe Hart, Marshal. Okay, Hart. Who's your friend? Harry Spiner. I never heard of him either. What's the matter? Has he been shot or something? I busted his leg. Oh. Well, there's a doctor in Dodge. I can't get him there alone. I will help you. If you'll put that rifle down. Well... Okay. I found him lying out there on the prairie this morning. Horse throwed him when I drug him into the shade here. Uh, you mean you're not traveling with him? No. I just stopped to help. Are you really Marshal Dillon? I am. But uh, I don't remember you. I ain't never been to Dodge. I heard your name, Mo. You live around here, Spinner? No, I've been working in a saloon down in Tascosa. Wanted to change, so I bought me a horse and rode north. But I shouldn't have come alone. I don't know nothing about horses. I hate them. Well, we better get you in to Dodge. I suppose you aim to drag me to Dodge. Well, I've been drug as far as I'm going to be. Why'd you get you out of the sun, Spinner? It was mighty rough about it. Why, well, he saved your life, mister. Why shouldn't he save my life? Well, of all the ungrateful, mean temper he's, he's been like ever... that all day. But I figure it's because his leg hurts him. Of course it hurts. I busted mine once. I know what it feels like. Poor fella. Do you want to help get him into Dodge Harp, or you want to keep going? No, no, Marshal. I kind of like to see Dodge anyway. Okay, then let's get busy. <laughs> Luckily, Spiner had broken only one bone in his leg, and after we rigged up a splint for it, we managed to get him mounted. It was night before we reached Dodge, but by the time he got there, he was too weak to complain. Anyway, I was more interested in Joe Harp, but all I could find out was that he was a cowboy, drifting aimlessly through the country like so many of his kind. He said he had a little money from his last job, and that's why he'd been so wary of strangers. And he seemed honest enough. 
As six weeks later, he was still in Dodge, gambling some, and making friends with most everybody in town. Doc and I were talking about him one day in the office. Do you know what he did, Matt, about three or four weeks ago? What, Doc? Why, he came and offered to pay Spiener's bill. He said the poor fellow wouldn't be able to work for some time. As long as he'd saved him, he felt he ought to help take care of him. Oh, did you take his money? I did not. Spiener can pay me himself. And he'd better get to work soon, too, because he's already walking around without a cane. I, uh, take it you don't like Spiener much, though. Oh, do you? Well, nobody does that I know of. I don't believe he's even thanked Joe Hart for saving his life, man. Well, well, Mr. Santa Fe just come in with the mail, Mr. Dillon. Oh, oh Doc. Mm. Hello, Chester. Oh, see, that brown envelope looks official. It is. You want to open it now, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, I better. might have my paycheck in it. <laughs> Here you are. Thanks. Uh, no check. Just some new wanted circulars. What? What is it? Here, have a look, Chester. Oh, my goodness. Look at that, Doc. Huh? Let me see this. Let me see. Uh, wanted, dead or alive, reward $500 for bank robbery and murder while escaping. Joseph Harp. Joseph Harp? Age 32, Sandy here. Six feet tall, blue eyes. Glad to see him, all right. Signed by the sheriff, city of Denver, Colorado Territory. You gonna arrest him, Matt? Uh, can't you pretend you didn't get it or something, Mr. Dillon? You can stay here if you like, Chester. Oh, no, sir. I didn't mean that. All right, then. You take the Alifragasa, the Longhorn, and the Oasis. I'll look in this boarding house at the edge of town, then I'll come back to the Texas Trail. Meet me there if you see him first. Yes, sir. All right, get moving. Burrs, Matt. Uh, I don't see Joe Harp around anywhere, Kitty. He left. Why? Has Chester got here yet? No. Is it trouble of some kind, Matt? I'm after Harp, Kitty. How long ago did he leave? Well, just a little while ago. He was over there gambling, as usual, and then that Spiner came running in and said something to him, and they both left. Spiner? Somebody ought to take him out and bury him somewhere. Well, I couldn't find him nowhere, Mr. Dillon. Hello, Miss Kitty. Chester, what's this all about, anyway? Harp's wanted for murder. For murder? Joe Harp? That's just what Spiner said when I told him. He just couldn't believe it. You told Spiner, Chester? Why, yes, sir. I ran into him, and I... I... Go get our horses, Chester. I'll pick up the rifles and hurry. They've had time to get out of town already. Mr. Dillon. What? My, I guess I just wasn't thinking when I told Spinner about Joe Harp. I didn't know he was going to run off and warn him. Next time I'll send you out with a potato rammed in your mouth. Yes, sir. Oh, I feel so bad. I wish you would. Ah, oh, forget it, Chester. At least it shows Spinner isn't as bad as we all thought. I guess he was just waiting for a chance to do Harp a real good turn. Well, he sure did it. Hold it up a minute. Hmm? Hold, hold. Look. Hello! Well, it's Speeder, Mr. Dillon. He's got his hands up. Yeah. Come on. Get your rifle out, Chester, and keep your eyes open. Yes, sir. Now, 
Now, don't shoot, Marshal. I ain't done nothing. Where's Harp? He's in that drawer behind me. Any tricks and you'll die, Spinner. I ain't no outlaw. And Harp ain't gonna pull no tricks neither. You just follow me, Marshal. I swear I don't understand this at all, Mr. Dillon. Just follow him, Chester. Yes, sir. There's his horse. Yeah. And there he is. Well, he's been hurt. He sure has. Oh. Oh. Well, there's your man, Marshal. Did you do this, Spinner? I tried to talk him into giving himself up, but he wouldn't listen. And then he, he tried to draw on me. Spinner, I can tell from here the way he's lying that you shot him in the back. What difference it make? He's an outlaw, ain't he? Yeah. Five hundred dollars worth of outlaw, Spinner. If you live to collect it. Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, the Red Cross campaign for this year is nearing an end. Have you answered the call? Remember, this year, the Red Cross needs you as well as your contribution. Go to your local Red Cross chapter, and while you're there, join and serve. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. sort of stay out of my sight. And he did. And about a week later, I had to send Chester to find him and bring him into the office. Here he is, Mr. Dillon. Come over here, Spinner. I've been waiting like you said, Marshal. I ain't talked to nobody. I had a wire from Denver this afternoon, Spinner. Everything's all right. The money will be here in another week or so. Oh. I thought it'd come now. There it is. But I, I thought you said it wasn't here yet. I'm paying you out of government funds. Oh. Well, that's fine. Yeah, I didn't think you'd mind very much how you got the money. Now, Marshal, I only done my duty. Count it, Spinner. Oh, that's all right. I, I'm sure it's all here, Marshal. Count it, I said. Yes, sir. One... Two, three, four, and five. You're satisfied? Five hundred, that's right. Spinner, nobody knows about this yet. They think I killed Joe Harp. But before they learn who did and how it was done, I advise you to clear out of Dodge and stay out. Why? I didn't do nothing Tell wrong. me something, Spinner. Is Harp the first man you've killed? Of course he is. Well, there are men around here who've killed... Ten or a dozen, and think nothing of it. But I won't guarantee how they're going to take to your having killed one man. They can't do nothing about it. It was plumb legal. Yeah. Yeah, it was legal. I earned this money, and before I leave Dodge, I'm going to double it gambling. And there ain't nobody going to stop me. Okay, Spinner. I warned you. I'm going to get rich, Marshal. I'll show them. Real rich. Get out of here. I'm going. Sit down, Matt. Oh, thanks, Kitty. Drink? No, no, no thanks. 
Spina was in. Oh, is that so? He left, though. They closed the game on him when he started bragging about how he got his money. I kind of figured they might. Why'd you keep it such a secret, Matt? What were you protecting him for, that milk-livered little sneak? Now, the law doesn't separate people that way, Kitty. But now that he's been paid and he's been warned about what might happen, he's on his own. Well, I hope somebody does shoot him. Just think, Matt. It was Joe Harp who saved his life. I'd have caught Harp anyway, Kitty. I know. Somehow that's different. Yeah. That's yeah, a lot different. You know, Kitty, that's a pretty dress you're wearing. Close your eyes, Matt. What? Close them. Go on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's this for? Now, tell me what color this dress is. Uh, well, it's... Uh, uh... It's blue, Matt. Blue, sure. <laughs> I was just about to say that it is. I know. Speaking of colors, look what's coming. What? Oh, it's Spinner. Well, nobody's shot him yet. Never too late. Marshal Dillon? Yeah. Marshal, I just tried to buy a drink over at the Alifer Gang. And they wouldn't serve you. Good. I'm not talking to you. Marshal, two men threatened to kill me right there at the bar. Now, that's funny. What do you mean? Well, most men around here don't waste much time on threats. Marshal, I demand protection. And I won't spend the night hiding in jail, either. Okay. Then you'll come with me? No. What? I can't protect you any more than I have already, Spina. But I'll tell you one thing. If you take off your gun, nobody can claim self-defense for shooting you, and I'll have to go after them. If that's any satisfaction for you. Marshal, I'm a citizen, and I demand... Get out of town, Spina. Get out now. <laughs> Mr. Dillon? Yeah? Could you lend me a dollar? I went broke last night. Oh, uh, gambling, huh? Yes, sir. All right. Here you are, Chester. Thank you. Hey, wait a minute. You told me you swore off gambling a week ago. You even took an oath. I did. I sure did. Well, then how come you went broke gambling last night? Uh, no, sir. I said I went broke, and you said gambling? And I said yes, sir, but I didn't say I was gambling. Chester, keep the dollar, just go spend it somewhere. Uh, yes, sir, but you don't understand. You see, I've got it all figured out. I swore off gambling, all right, so what I do now is to hire a fella, and I give him the money, then he goes and sits in the game for me, you see. Uh, uh, hello, Clay. Marshal, my horse come back. Huh? What horse? The one Spinner bought off me when he left town. Well, Spinner's been gone five days, Clay. I know. But my horse come back, Marshal. Alone. Saddle? Yes, sir. But it ain't my saddle. It's Spinner's. That means somebody must have caught up with him, Mr. Dillon. All right, we'll start looking for him. I can tell you where to look, Marshal. What? That horse has got red mud all over his legs. And there's only one place I know where he'd get into red mud around here. Now, that water and hole, Granby Springs, huh? That's right, Marshal. Say... Do I get to keep the horse now? I don't know, Clay. I'll tell you when I get back. You know, I just had a thought, Mr. Dillon. What, Chester? Well, Granby Springs is only 30 miles. Spinner must have made it easy the first morning he left. Uh, so? So, if he was killed there, how come nobody ain't found him and reported it yet? I don't know, Chester. That, there it is, right over there. We'll soon find out. Yes, sir. That's him, Mr. Dillon. He sure looks dead. Yeah. I don't see no bullet hole. 
No. Oh. Hey, he's still breathing, Chester. Uh, go fill up your hat and throw some water on him, huh? Yes, sir. Spinner. Hey, Spinner. Spinner. Can you hear me? Oh, uh, pour a little on his head, Chester. Maybe that'll do it. And, uh, uh Mar- Marshall. Marshall. Yeah, yeah. What happened, Spinner? Well, what's the matter? What happened? A horse kicked me, kicked me in the belly. Busted me up inside. I hate horses. Oh, when did this happen? First day. I got off to get me a drink here. I hung on to the to the reins till yesterday. But I was too weak. Mr. Dillon. What? There's fresh tracks all around here. Not just them made by that horse of his, neither. Sure there. Fresh tracks. What? <laughs> Three or four men been by here. Three or four men? They they just sat and looked at me, Marshal. They didn't say not, nothing. They just sat and looked at me, and, and they rode off. Every one of them. They seen who it was, Mr. Dillon. That's what. Yeah. It's too late now, Marshal. I'm gonna, gonna die. Now, we'll try to get you back, Spader. Uh, uh, no. It's too... Oh, he's dead, Chester. Yes, sir. He wasn't as lucky as when he busted his leg, was he? But you'd think one of them riders might have helped him. You know, except for us, I... I guess there isn't a man in the country who'd have helped him this time, Chester. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, James Nusser, and John Daner. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Later tonight, hear Herb Schreiner on Two for the Money. Remember, one for the fun, two for the quiz. Hear Two for the Money on most of these same stations later tonight. George Walsh speaking. Stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows in a few minutes over most of these same stations. For Mystery Mixed with Merriment, join Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. city and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke.
Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. You mind stopping in Jonas' store down here? Won't take long. What are you going to buy, Doc? Another diploma to hang on your wall? Oh, another diploma to hang on. Oh, man. Well, anybody can shoot bullets into people the way you do. <laughs> yeah, sure. But what takes real brains is digging them back out. <laughs> uh, between the two of us, though, we managed to make a good living, don't we? Oh, yeah, sure. Barely. Just barely. <laughs> Hello, Marshal. Mr. Jonas. Oh, hi, right, Jonas. What can I do for you? I'm looking for a saw. You were looking for a saw? Doc? And some nails, Mr. Jonas. Sure, Doc, sure. I'll have to fetch them from the storeroom out the back. Oh, say, Matt, look at that. What? Huh? He's got a batch of new derbies in. Oh, those are pretty fancy. Yeah. Oh, they, they, they are fancy. Here, stop there. Hey. What's that? Yeah, stay here, Doc. He's over there behind them barrels, Marshal. Who is? I don't know, but I'll shoot him dead if he moves. Don't kill me. I ain't armed. All right, come out of there. With your hands up. Neil Amber. That's me. I can't believe it, Amber. I was going to pay you later. Pay me later. You're on my books now for over $300. And stealing from me on top of that. Marshal, I want this man arrested. Were you stealing, Amber? No, no, I never stole nothing in my life. I was going to pay him later. Then what was you doing running off with that sack of seeds? I had to have them seeds, Mr. Jonas. I got to raise something. My wife and I are about to starve out there. Out where, Amber? A little patch of land near Pawnee Wells north here, Marshal. Ain't much. We've had nothing but bad luck. I've been keeping you going for nearly a year, Amber. This is a fine show of gratitude. How can I pay unless I raise something? A man's desperate, Mr. Jonas. But he owes me money, too, Matt. But I don't hold with stealing to pay off your debt. I'll pay you, Doc. Someday I will. But right now, we got nothing. That's good land up there, Amber. What's been your trouble? Oh, everything, Marshal. First, I raised a little corn. And then Pete Fletcher's cattle busted in and ruined it. And then Mrs. Amber's goats got swelled up and died. She had two of them. She always wanted goats. All her life she wanted them. And then some mean devil shot one of my horses. And, uh, I don't know what all, Marshal. We just ain't making out very good. That's still no excuse for thieving, Amber. You throw him into jail, Marshal. Amber, you take your seeds and go on home. What? Put them on my bill, Mr. Jonas. Y you mean you're going to turn him loose? Go on, Amber. Oh, thank you, Marshal. I won't forget this. It's a fine thing when the law starts encouraging crime. I hold you as guilty as he is, Marshal Dillon. Come on, Doc. Let's get out of here. <laughs> You know something, Mr. Dillon? What, Chester? If the government would come through with a little expense money, I got an idea. Now, the government won't even supply me with ammunition, Chester. But go ahead. Well, sir, if we bought two or three buffalo hides and sewed them together, yeah. we could make a nice rug for this office. Then it wouldn't make so much noise people tromping around like they do. Uh, yeah, Chester. Well, I'll have to take that up with Washington. Uh, but in the meantime, you you work on some other ideas, huh? Uh, yes, sir, I will, Mr. Dillon. And I got a... I, I, I got a one Hello, that I... Marshal. Chester. Well, it ain't Pete Fletcher. Hello, Pete. Marshal, I heard about your refusing to arrest Neil Amber yesterday. Oh? Well, it seems like a lot of people have. I'm a cattleman, Marshal. I got no use for sod busters. Especially when they don't know when to quit like them Ambers. There's room enough out here for everybody, Pete. Not for thieves, Harry. Well, I don't think Amber will try to steal anything again. I come to tell you you're wrong, Marshal. Why? One of my riders, Jim Baird, 
Found a calf in Amber's shed. It had been stole, slaughtered, and half scun. One of your calves? Wearing my brand. Barrett's standing guard over right now. Look, Peek, the Ambers are nearly starving. What's one calf to you? Is huh? there a law against cattle thieving, Marshal, or ain't there? Yeah, there is. Well, then do something about it. All right, I'll ride out and have a look. I want that woman arrested, Marshal. Woman? Well, it happened yesterday while he was in town. It had to be her. If Mrs. Amber wasn't a woman, I'd have shot her. That cat's in the shed right over there, Marshal. I don't see the Ambers around anywhere. Yeah, I told Barrett to make him stay in the house. You had no right to do that, Pete. Oh. Uh, I got a right to protect my property, ain't I? Chester? Yes, sir? Go tell the Ambers to come out to the shed here, huh? All right, sir. Come on, Pete. I was thinking you'd never get back, Pete. This here is Marshal Dillon, Pete. Where I come from, we hang cow thieves ourselves. Now, it's been done around here, too, Baird. Good. And the man that headed the last lynching got 25 years in prison. You trying to scare me, Marshal? I hate lynching, Baird. I hate even the talk of it. Now, where's the cat, Pete? Right over here, Marshal. He was trying to butcher it on the ground. I manned it, I'll get up. There's Peak's brand. Right there. I thought I told you Ambers to stay in the house. You're not telling anybody anything, Bert. Hello, Amber. Ma'am? She didn't do this, Marshal. Would uh, you mind telling us about it, Miss Amber? Well, Bert can tell you all you need to know, Marshal. I want to hear what Miss Amber has to say. I, I feel guilty, Marshal. They made me feel guilty accusing me this way. It's hurt her bad, Marshal. My wife's an honest woman. Now, if you're innocent, you've got nothing to worry about, Miss Amber. Now, you tell me what happened. Well, Neil was in town. I come out the shed to get a potato from a dinner. And I seen that little calf lying there. And I was standing here looking at it. And then he come in and grabbed me and said I'd stole it. Marshal is saying that makes me want to die. I tracked that calf here and I caught her skinning it, Marshal. She's just trying to work on it. Nobody's going to believe a couple of thieves. I know what you're doing, Pete Fletcher, but I ain't leaving this land, not now or ever. You going to arrest her, Marshal? Go on back to the house, ma'am. What? In my whole life, I've never done anything wrong. Now I feel I ought to be hung. She'd be better off dead than like this. If she was a man, she would be. That's dead, enough, Amber. Bear. I'm not arresting anybody, Pete. You're calling me and Baird liars, then. I'm saying there isn't enough evidence. Now, you take your calf and get out of here and leave these people alone. All right, Marshal. Next time we ain't coming to the law, we'll handle this ourselves. <laughs> Well, hello, Kitty. Matt, I want you to meet Lucinda. Uh-huh. She's new here. Oh, welcome to Dodge, Lucinda. Kitty's told me a lot about you, Marshal. I was hoping you'd come in tonight. Uh, where are you from? Well, I've been in Abilene the past two years. Well, then you must know Bill Hickok over there, huh? Sure I do. He told me he looked you up when I got to Dodge. He said you'd keep me out of trouble. <laughs> well, I can't do that, but if you do get into trouble, come see me. Thanks, Marshal. Mr. Hickok said Dodge is a lot wilder than Abilene. Is that true? Uh, you'll soon be able to judge that for yourself, Lucinda. Well, I won't be here very long, Marshal. I'm working my way out to California. She got a man in California, Matt. Well, fine. I hope you make it, Lucinda. Thanks, Marshal. I'll see you later. Sure. Goodbye. She's a nice girl, Matt. Well, all girls are, Kitty. <laughs> Especially me. 
Look, I just made fifty dollars. Hey, that's a good <laughs> night's work, Kitty. Uh, if this keeps up, I'll buy me a house somewhere and retire. Oh, and do what? <laughs> You're probably right, Matt. I've worked ever since I was a little girl. I'd get spooky if I didn't have anything to do. Well, anyway, I hope you're not going to put your $50 back into the game, Kitty. No, I'm through with Pharaoh. I might buy into that poker game a little later, though. Well, I'll tell you what, you can have Chester's seat in a few minutes. I'm going to put him to work. Uh, Chester was telling me about the Ambers, Matt. I feel awful sorry for that poor woman. Yeah, so do I, Kitty, but, uh... There's nothing I can do about it. You don't think she's guilty, do you? Oh, it can't be proven either way, Kitty. Not one way or another, Peak Fletcher's managed to get rid of every Nuster anywhere near it. Mm-hmm. Except for the Ambers. Now, like he says, they're pretty stubborn. Um, look, Matt. What? Isn't this that fellow Baird? Oh, yeah. I was kind of hoping he'd busted his neck somewhere. Evening, Marshal. Ma'am? It's Miss. Not that it matters. Okay, Miss. I come by the Amber Place today, Marshal. You made a big mistake the other day. Did I? You sure did. Remember how Amber kept saying his wife would be better off dead? While well, he's sitting out there now, and he won't even look at you or talk. And the woman ain't nowhere around, Marshal. Amber's gone killed her. That's what. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first... Starting next Monday evening, most of these same stations will bring you CBS Radio's newest anti-crime program entitled Night Watch. On Night Watch, you will actually ride the prowl cars with the police of Culver City, California, as they seek the trouble spots, question witnesses, and arrest suspects. No actors, no sound effects, and no music will be heard in these actual presentation of police work. Be sure to ride with us when Night Watch has its premiere on CBS Radio next Monday evening. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. The place looks deserted, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it does. Yeah, maybe Baird was right. Maybe something has happened to Miss Amber. Yeah, maybe. But I will soon find out. Let's try the house first, Chester. Yes, sir. Hey, look. The door is wide open. Yeah. Amber! Hello, is there anybody home? Let's take a look inside, Chester. Well, there he is. Yeah. Uh, hello, Amber. Uh, are you all right? Hello, Marshal. Chester. Uh, have you been sitting here like this long? I don't know. Where's Ms. Amber? Why, she went away. Went away? Where? Yes, she went away back east. Home. When did she go? The other day. Well, uh, did did you have an argument with her? Is that why she went away? I loved her, Marshal. She's all I had. Yeah. Uh, Trust her. Come outside a minute, huh? Yes, sir. That's Amber's horse down there in the corral, and that's the only one he's got. And by golly, that's right. I'm going back and try to talk to him. You'll take a look around, huh? Take a good look, Chester. 
Yes, sir, I understand. But I sure hope I don't find nothing. Well, if you do, come in and tell me. Yes, sir, I will. Uh, Amber, you, uh, you want to tell me what happened? She's gone. But did Baird or Pete Fletcher have anything to do with it? Baird come by yesterday, but he didn't do nothing. I'm ashamed about my wife. Ashamed? Well, why? I mean, her not being here. It was too much for her. She just couldn't take it no more. But she shouldn't have gone like that. How did she go? We was married 30 years. I was real proud of her. Sure, of course you were. But tell me, when she left here, how did she go? She rode away. You mean she took your horse? Yeah, she took my horse. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, did you find anything? Yes, sir. Laying under a blanket right out in the shed. He didn't even bury her. She's been shot, Mr. Dillon. Amber, who shot your wife? I couldn't bury her. I couldn't get that near her yet. Did you shoot her? Tell me. I... I shot her, Marshal. Well, he still won't eat, Mr. Dillon. He's going to die of starvation before they hang him. He hasn't been tried yet, Chester. Oh, no, sir. Just keep bringing his meals in. He'll eat sooner or later. Hello, Marshal. Uh, hello, Peek. Baird. I guess you'll believe me next time I tell you something, Marshal, huh? What do you want here? When are they going to hang Amber? When and if a judge in a court of law says so, he'll hang. Meantime, I'm going to burn down that house and shed of his before some other nester takes a notion to move into place. Yeah, you do that, Peek. Yeah, you do that, and I'll throw you in jail. What? You've done enough to Amber, you and Baird. You accusing me of anything direct, Marshal? If I could, I'd have you both tried. Careful what you're saying. Now get out of here. Both of you. Come on, Baird. We've won any way you look at it. What'll it be? Uh, a glass of beer, I guess, Sam. Sure. Hey, Marshal. Yeah. That fellow Baird over there has been making a lot of talk about you. Yeah, Peak Fletcher, too, probably. Not like Baird. It's okay, Sam. I thought you ought to know. Thanks. I'll get your beer, Marshal. Hey, Mr. Dillon. Oh, what's the matter, Chester? Neil Amber, he's gone. What? I unlocked his cell to bring him some supper. And then I guess went off and forgot to lock it up again. Anyway, he took a rifle. Well, let's go find it. Wait, Mr. Dillon. What? Look, there he is. Over there by Baird. Yeah, come on. Baird, I'm going to kill you. Hold it, Amber. All right, put that gun away, Pete. He killed Baird, Marshal. He was going to kill me. You shoot him again and I'll kill you. He's unarmed now. I ain't going to shoot him. <laughs> yeah, I hit him right in the chest. 
Marshal. Uh, Chester, go get Doc quick. Yes, sir. I have a... Doc will be here in just a minute. Uh, he can't help me. This is going to save me from hanging, Marshal. Had it been an even worse disgrace? Worse? What? Worse than what? Come close, Marshal. Yeah. I don't want nobody else to know. But my wife. I didn't shoot her. She killed herself. Is that it? That made me terrible ashamed, Marshal. I'd have hung rather than everybody noted. You... You won't tell, will you? No. No, Amber, I... I won't tell. Thank you, Marshal. You... You've been good to me. Oh... Dead, huh? Well, you, you ought to thank me, Marshal. Saved the law, the expense of a rope. He didn't kill his wife, Peek. What? You did. You were trying to devil him off that land, making her look like a thief did it. You killed him. And I'd see you hung for it if I could. Gunsmoke. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Ralph Moody, Lawrence Dobkin, and John Daner, with Harry Bartell, Helen Cleave, Francis Drew, and James Nusser. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Five years ago, 12 nations put their signatures to the North Atlantic Treaty thus forming the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. CBS Radio joins in the salute to NATO at this time of its fifth anniversary. George Walsh speaking. For mystery mixed with merriment, join Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. city and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Oh, 
Oh, you call this keeping the peace? Sitting around in the sun like a farmer on Sunday? <laughs> Hello, Doc. Oh, I wish I was a U.S. Marshal. Get paid whether you work or not. What's the matter, Doc? Lose a couple of patients last night? Uh... I'm thinking of moving to San Francisco, Matt. What for? You got a monopoly here in Dodge. San Francisco's full of doctors. Yes, and they're probably all rich, too. No, no, I'm serious, Matt. Oh, forget it, Doc. You're some 20 years too late for the gold rush. And anyway, we need you here. Dodge can find another doctor. I'm tired of working day and night and getting paid with promises. Well, you need some money, I'll call a town meeting and shake it out of these people, Doc. But if you try to go to San Francisco, I'll throw you in jail and you can practice from there. Oh, well, good. Then you'll have to feed me, too. <laughs> <laughs> gladly, Doc, gladly. Yeah. If you can stand Chester's cooking. Oh, I take it all back, man. The last time I ate my... I ate for three days. <laughs> oh, oh, Chester. Uh, hello, Doc. Mr. Dillon. Doc wants to know where you learned to cook, Chester. Why, well, my Uncle Arthur taught me, Doc. I batched with him for a time when I was a boy. Poor old fella. He died soon after that. I bet he did. Mm. Mm. That stage is kind of late today, ain't it? Well, the way Hank's driving it, it shouldn't be, but I haven't got time to loaf around greeting stagecoaches. I'll see you men later. I'll oh, say so long, Doc. He's emotional at us, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, there's something wrong, Chester. Wait there, Marshal. I'll get right down. We run into a fight, Marshal. Anybody hurt, Hank? I killed a man I had riding shotgun. Huh? He fell off and I had to leave him there. Well, I'll send somebody out for him. Where did it happen? Right where the trail crosses the South Fork of the Pawnee. There were three of them bandits, Marshal. But by heaven, we put slugs into two of them. You mean you killed two of them? No, they rode off, but I could see two of them was all hunkered up over their saddles like they was hurting pretty bad. Did you recognize any of them? Well, I'd hate to be wrong and get a man into trouble, Marshal, but I'd swear one of them was that young Howard Brandt. You know the fellow that moved out here with his wife a while back? Yeah, I met him. They got a place up near Turkey Creek, Mr. Dillon, but I ain't never seen it. Now, let's ride up and see how they're making out, Chester. All right, sir. I'll go get our horses. I met Howard Brand when he first come out here, Mr. Dillon. He sure didn't seem like no bandit to me, real gentle, easy-going fella. That's like a horse that won't buck when you first get on him, Chester. He's waiting to come loose when you least expect it. Yes, sir. Hey, there's Miss Brandt now. She must have seen us coming. Yeah. All right, pull oh. up, boy. Hello, Miss Brandt. Howard ain't here. It's uh, important, ma'am. We'll just wait on the porch here. We won't bother you. No use, Marshal. Howard won't be back till tomorrow. Look down there, Chester, on the steps. Hey, that's blood, Mr. Dillon. Miss Brandt. That's chicken blood. I just killed one. I'm sorry, Miss Brandt, but I'm going to have to talk to Howard. Is he bad hurt? He's dying, Marshal. Leave him alone. You want to show me where he is? Marshal, leave him die in peace. He ain't got long. You'll kill him asking him questions. I don't figure he'll live through the night as it is. Howard and his friends held up the stage, Miss Brant, and they killed a man. Wait, Marshal. Huh? I'll tell you. All right. Jed Butler planned it all. I never heard of no Jed Butler, Mr. Dillon. Does this Butler live around here, Miss Brent? Howard knew him in Oklahoma Territory, Marshal. He and a man named Blake come by here one night a few weeks back. They didn't come into the house, so I can't tell you what they look like. But they talked Howard into holding up the stage, is that it? I didn't know nothing about it, Marshal, till today. I was inside redding up the house, and I heard a shout. And I come out, and I found Howard laying in the dirt. He just dumped him there and rode off. You think they forced Howard to go along? No. He probably wanted to go. 
You disappointed me, Marshal. I thought Howard was an honest man. Maybe it's as well he's dying. I'm going into him now, Marshal. You, uh, want me to send Doc out? No. It wouldn't do no good. Well, if there's anything I can do for you, Miss Brent, you let me know. Thanks, Marshal. But I reckon it's too late now. Chester, mm-hmm. take this down to Mr. Hightower and have him print up some wanted notices from it, huh? Yes, sir. I guess that's about all I can do about Jed Butler and his friend right now. Oh, somebody will spot him and come tell you sooner or later. And I hope so. It's already been two days. Matt? Hello, Chester. Oh, hello, Miss Kitty. Oh, what's the trouble, Kitty? I just went up to Doc's office to get some stuff for my throat. He isn't there. Well, should he be? Was he expecting you? He wasn't there this morning, either. When did you see him last, Matt? I come to think of it, not since the day of the stage holdup. Why? I was with him that night, Matt. He came into the Texas Trail real late. Yeah? We were sitting there talking, and some kid brought him a message. Doc didn't say it was from, but he left. And as far as I can find out, nobody's seen him since. Hey, by golly, Mr. Dillon, she's right. I ain't seen Doc neither. That was two days ago, Matt. Well, sometimes Doc's out on a call longer than that. You're trying to fool yourself, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I am. I heard about two of those bandits being shot. Well, it sure couldn't have been Miss Brandt who come for Doc. No. You mean one of those men was Howard Brandt? Oh, they left him at his house, Kitty. I didn't see him, but I believe Miss Brandt. And you know, he probably died last night. I feel sorrier for her than him. I guess I do too, Kitty. But what about Doc, Matt? What are you going to do? Well, Kitty, if I knew where those men are, I'd have gone after him before now. They're holding him. They might even kill him. Look, Kitty, I can't go out and ride around on the prairie hoping to bump into him somewhere. If anything happens to Doc, I'll go after those men myself, Matt. Well, maybe they'll just turn him loose when he's through doctoring the men. I wish I could believe that. Yeah. Yeah, so do I. waited the rest of that day and through the night, but nothing happened. The next morning, however, I was walking down to the office when I saw Ms. Brandt drive by in a wagon. I waved, but she went on past me without a sign. And as she did, I noticed a figure lying in the back of the wagon wrapped in a blanket. As I watched her drive down the street and on out of town, I realized she must be headed for Boot Hill. I got Chester, and we followed her out to the burying ground. She had stopped and was taking a shovel out of the wagon when we walked up to her. I don't need no help, Marshal. The ground's hard, Miss Brandt. We'll dig a hole for you. Leave me be. He's my man, and I'll bury him myself. Right where he deserves. Among the rest of these murderers and outlaws. What are you looking at, Marshal? Your face? What happened to you? Shows, does it? Yeah. Jed Butler did that, Marshal. He came by yesterday. Knocked me around some. He did? What for? Where is he? I was going to come tell you. Once I got Howard buried. Well, tell me now. He's got Doc with him. At least I think he has. Doc was there all tied up sitting on a horse. He didn't say nothing. Butler said he'd shoot him if he did. Why'd he beat you? What'd he want? He wanted to know if you'd been around. And if we'd told you anything. Howard was still alive, Marshal. I don't know how he lived so long. But he died after Butler got to shaking him and slapping him. What did you tell him? Nothing. That's why he beat me. Well... At least we know for sure he's got Doc with him, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, but we're no closer to finding him. You sure you won't let us help bury Howard, ma'am? I kind of wish you would now, Marshal. I'm just about wore out. Mr. 
Dillon, I, I just can't stand this waiting around doing nothing much longer. Couldn't you organize a posse or something? Butler would get scared if he got wind of a posse, Chester. You mean he'd shoot Doc and try to get away? Yeah, he might. It's a safer bet just to wait it up. Well, Tobiel, but come on in. How are you, Tobiel? Tobiel, always good, Chester. Uh, where you been the last month, anyway? Out scalping the white men? Tobiel no scalp white men long time. Maybe too long. Well, for a tame Indian, you sure got a wild look in your eye. What you doing here? Tobiel hunt antelope on prairie. Huh? Way off, see, two white men. One right very funny. Tobiel go very close. They no see, but Tobiel see. What did you see, Tobiel? White medicine man. Uh, Doc? Uh, good man. Take bullet out of Tobiel long time ago. No like him all tied in rope. Come quick, tell Marshal. Do you know where they are? Can you track them? White man easy to track, like buffalo herd. Always big fool. When was this, Tobiel? Yesterday. Long ride from here. All right. Chester, go get our horses and find a fresh one for Tobiel. Maybe. Maybe we won't be too late. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, a man just out of prison emerges to freedom packed with panic. Monday night on CBS Radio, Suspense stars Broderick Crawford in Parole to Panic, a spine-tingling production well calculated to keep you in suspense. It's entirely possible under certain circumstances that prison might be preferable to freedom. Hear Suspense Monday night on most of these stations, and you'll agree fully with that premise. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. It was 60 miles to where Tobiel had seen Doc and Jed Butler, but we rode hard and covered it in a very few hours. From there on, however, with Tobiel tracking, we had to slow down. But it was growing dusk when the trail finally led to the edge of a small bluff and then turned and dropped down around the side of it. We dismounted and followed it the rest of the way on foot to where we could see a small cabin hidden in a clump of box elder at the base of the cliff. And there we waited for the dark. When it came, we sneaked up to the cabin and stood close to the wall listening. How's he now, Doc? I've told you before, Butler, the man's dying. Listen, you, he's the only man I ever called friend. He better not die. I'm a doctor, Butler. I do anything in my power to save a life, even that of a murderer. You go on talking like that, I'll blow you open with this shotgun, Doc. Shotgun, shotgun. Why don't you carry a pistol, like ordinary men? Or are you too much of a coward? Doc, you're either a fool or you're a plum crazy. Oh, why? Because I'm not afraid to die? Well, you're going to die just as soon as he does. I ain't going to leave you around to spread no tales. I'm going to kill you and get out of here. And it won't be very long, Butler. Blake will go most any minute. Maybe I ought to shoot you now. Just leave him here. Well, I thought you said that uh, he was your friend. He is. And I'm getting a spooky feeling. Chester, Toby, let's get talk back. out of you, Doc, and I won't wait. He's, He's going to kill work. him, Mr. Dillon. Do something. We better bust in there before it's too late. No, no. He killed Doc, sure we do that. Yeah, Tobiel's right, Chester. But we got to do something. Doc said himself that wounded man's going to die any minute. Hell, I'm thinking, Chester. If plenty time, could wait and shoot when come out in morning. Yeah, but we got no time. There might be a chink somewhere in that cabin that I could poke a gun through. Man say him very spooky now. One little noise, shoot Doc fast. Yeah, I know. I wouldn't dare take the chance. Tobiel no many trick, all kind. 
But here, nothing. If Butler used a pistol, Doc might have a bare chance, but that cussed shotgun... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What, Mr. Dillon? That shotgun. It's not a six-shooter, and it's not a repeating rifle. What do you mean? He can shoot it once, and then he's got to reload. Once is all it takes? To kill one man, it is, Chester. <laughs> what are you doing, Mr. Dillon? Here. Take my gun belt, Chester. What? Here, take it. <laughs> yes, sir, but what for? I'm going in there. Unarmed. What? Now, when I get inside, you and Fabi will sneak up close. And you'll be ready to come through that door when you hear his shotgun go off. Mr. Dillon, you can't do that. Yes, I can. He'll kill you, sure. Maybe. But if you two don't get in there fast, if he does shoot, he'll club Doc to death. All right, now, quiet. Who's that? Get over by the door, Doc. Oh, don't. Don't open it yet. Doc Adams is standing by that door. I got a shotgun aimed at his back. Now, who is it? I'm unarmed. Open the door. I'll come in with my hands in front of me. All right. Open it, Doc. Any tricks? I'll shoot Doc. Go ahead, Doc. Hello, Doc. Uh, Matt? Uh, he's unarmed, Butler. And get in here and close that door. Who are you? Matt Dillon. Dillon? Marshal? That's right. You got some men outside, huh? Well, it won't do no good, Marshal. I'll shoot you before they can get anywhere near me. I got two men out there, Butler. And the second they hear a shot, they'll be in here. I'll be too late, Warren Marshal. Well, it depends on how you look at it, Butler. Won't be too late to take you. That shotgun only shoots once. <laughs> take me? You'll be dead. Yeah. Uh, Matt. Matt, you shouldn't have done this. Why not, Doc? Well, it's bad enough me getting killed. He can only kill one of us, Doc. If he shoots me, Tobiel and Chester will get him. And if he shoots you, I'll kill him with my bare hands. You got it all figured, ain't you, Marshal? Yeah. Well, I'd rather kill a U.S. Marshal than a doctor any day. You know that? Matt. Matt, he's right. You, you should have stayed outside. And stand there waiting for him to shoot you? No, I... I wouldn't like that much, Doc. Well, maybe... Maybe you have shoot me anyway. Maybe. But at least there's some kind of a chance, no? Shut up. A minute, you two. Shut up. I don't quite figure this. No? No. Or you mean uh, you come in here knowing I'll probably kill you rather than Doc? Was that right? Yes, Butler, that's right. Yes, that, that's what he did. Why? Well, no reason, Butler, no. No reason at all, except we're, we're friends, I guess. Uh, just something like that. What's being friends got to do with it? You wouldn't understand, Butler. You... You no good, filthy, rotten scum. He... He's willing to die for you, ain't he? I never heard of nothing like that. And him, Marshal, and everything... Willing to die? That's your friend, Butler. I'd better take a look at him. He's dead now. Well, make up your mind, Butler. 
I just don't understand a man like that. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friends. What's that? You ain't saying that. That come from something. Scripture, huh? Is that what it is? Blake's the only friend I ever had. Oh, and a while ago you were willing to leave him here to die. Alone. You don't know anything about friendship, Butler. No, I guess I don't. Anyways, if I was in a spot like you, there ain't nobody... Nobody in the world would have walked in here to do for me what the marshal's willing to do for you. Oh, and I feel sorry for you, Butler. Real sorry. If it'll still give you pleasure to shoot, well, go ahead. No. I just get killed anyway. All right, give me the gun, Butler. Sure. I never knowed people like you in the dock before, Marshal. You sure you ain't crazy or something? Maybe. Maybe we are, little butler. Who knows? Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Joyce McCluskey, John Daner, Frank Gerstel, and Ralph Moody. Harley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow afternoon, for its 11th feature report to America, the CBS Radio Department of Public Affairs tells the story of the wetbacks, the thousands of illegal immigrants who cross our southern border through America's big back door to look for work and wages. Hear wetbacks Sunday afternoon on most of these same stations. George Walsh speaking. John Lund, as yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings you Colorful Mystery Tuesday nights on the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Mr. Dillon, would you mind stopping at the Alpha Ganza here for a minute? It's pretty early in the day, isn't it, Chester? 
Oh, I don't want a drink. Oh? No, the barkeep's holding some money for me. I won a little last night, and I didn't want to put it back in the gauge. Ah, but you want to get it now so you can put it back tonight, is that it? Yes, sir, I'm afraid it is. <laughs> Mike? You come for your money, Chester? Yep. Hello there, Marshal Dillon. How are you, Mike? Well, here you are. Chester. Three, four, five, six. Thanks, Mike. Uh, here. Buy yourself a drink. Yeah, I sure will. See you tonight, Chester. Sure. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. I heard the bartender call you Marshal Dillon. Oh, that's right. I got something to tell you, Marshal. Go ahead. It's important. <laughs> okay. You're going to die, Marshal. Who are you, mister? Wilbur Hawkins. I'm a whiskey drummer. First time I've been to Dodge, though. I've worked around St. Louis till they sent me out here... Liked it better in St. Louis. There are lots of important people there. Wait a minute. What are you talking about? You're going to die, Marshal. I heard them saying so. You heard who saying so? Well, I don't know their names. It was dark, and they weren't there long. I didn't dare say anything, or they'd have known I was listening. And then, of course, I'd never heard of you till just now, that is. Uh, uh, you're not making much sense, mister. Oh, it makes sense, all right. You see, I rode the Santa Fe out here from St. Louis... And one night, I was all wrapped up trying to sleep. And these two men came by and stood there in the aisle. One gave the other $300. He said it was to kill Marshal Dillon. But he didn't say where. So, of course, I didn't know till just now. Is that all you know about it, Mr. Harkins? Yeah, that's all, Marshal. Well, I've done my duty now. I'll be going. Goodbye. Well, what do you make of that, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. He acts a crazy like I don't know whether to believe him or not. No. But I suppose we'll find out soon enough. sound asleep already, and it's only just got dark out, Mr. Dillon. Well, he's got nothing else to do till Tom Smith gets here. Is that who you're holding him for? Well, I thought I told you, Chester. Yeah, but Tom Smith's your at Tascos, ain't he? Sure. Why? I thought this fellow was wanted in Abilene. Oh, they never heard of him in Abilene. That's why I wired Tom. I'm going out back for a minute, Chester. I think I left my new bridle on the hitching rail out there. Yes, sir. Well, I better get this place swept up a little, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> That's a good idea. Stay there. Hey, Mr. Dillon, you, you've been shot. Well, I was trying to play possum, Chester. I wanted to get him to come up where I could see him. Oh. But he's gone now. You scared him away. He ran down the alley there. Well, he'll be lost in the crowd, but now... Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it doesn't matter, Chester. What? He probably thinks I'm dead. So I'll just go on playing possum. How do you mean? Come on, let's go to the doc's office. I'll tell you there. What would you say that whiskey drummer's name is, Matt? Wilbur Hawkins, Doc, but you never heard of him. This is his first time in Dodge. Well, you think he'd have sense enough to have followed those two men there, find out who they were. Yeah, he was probably scared to death, Doc. Yeah, and anyway, he kind of acts like he got hit by lightning somewhere. Even when he's standing still, he gives you the feeling that he's sort of walking sideways like a crab, if you know what I mean. No, I don't, but I, I'd sure think twice before asking you to explain, Chester. Well, what is it you have in mind to do now, Matt? Nothing, Doc. Nothing? No, Chester's going to do the work for a while. I'm just going to sit up here in your office and wait. 
Wait? Wait for what? Oh, when Chester spreads the word around that I'm dead, whoever wants me that way is going to make his play. He'll come right out into the open and do whatever he's got planned. And then I'm going to give him a little surprise. Oh, Mr. Dillon, that's a wonderful idea. Now, now why didn't I think of that? You better get going, Chester. I'm kind of anxious to meet this man. Him and his gunman. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, but only one thing. Ain't the boys likely to run a little wild when they hear you're not around to keep the lid on things? Ah, yeah, they might. But we'll have to take the chance. Okay, sir. I'll get started. Well, if anything, Chester's right, Matt. There's a lot of men in Dodge who are just waiting for an excuse like this. If it gets too bad, I'll just have to come to life again. <laughs> Tell me something, Doc. What are you going to do to uh, entertain me while I'm waiting up here, huh? Say, I never thought about that. I... Oh, I suppose i got to feed you, too. <laughs> You'd be a mighty poor host if you didn't. Well, how long do you figure on staying here, anyway? I don't know, Doc, but I don't think it'll be very long. Well, you uh, want to play a little cribbage, or uh, you'd rather fix supper first? <laughs> You're the first dead man I ever saw with an appetite. Well, I'll go get the cribbage board, but I'm making no promises about supper. (laughs) Doc, what time's it getting to be? Let me see. It's nearly midnight, man. Yeah. How long are you going to wait here? Well, until something happens, I guess. Not Chester will let me know. Town seems quiet enough so far. Maybe nothing's going to happen. They didn't try to kill me just for the fun of it, Doc. No, no, I guess not, man. All right, answer it, Doc. After I get to the back room. It's, uh, maybe it's a patient. I'll be holding a gun on him anyway. I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming. Kitty. What are you doing here this time of night? I might tell you if you ask me in, Doc. Well, of course. Come in. Come in. Where's the corpse, Doc? What's that? The body. I expected to find him all laid out. Oh, you mean Matt. You, uh, don't seem too upset about the corpse, Kitty. Oh, all that talk didn't fool me. <laughs> Just didn't make sense, Chester, running around telling everybody you've been killed. No, why not? I know Chester too well. If you were dead, he wouldn't be acting like that. <sighs> no, I guess he wouldn't. Where is he, anyway? I haven't seen him for a couple of hours, but most everybody else believes it, Matt. Oh, they do, huh? Mm-hmm. Good. I don't know what you're up to, but I figure someone's been trying to kill you. Is that right? Yeah. Ambush, Kitty. That's not the way he's telling it, Matt. Not the way who's telling it. I never saw him before, but there's a man standing at the bar of the Texas Trail bragging about outdrawing you. You mean he's admitting he killed me? I kind of thought you'd like to know. That's him, Matt. This is what you've been waiting for. Is there anybody with him, Kitty? No. He's alone, as far as I know. Anyway, you better come to life again, Matt. There's going to be trouble if you don't. There hasn't been any trouble yet, has there? No, but they're working themselves up to it. Yeah. Well, maybe I'd better not wait any longer. But I'd like to take that gunman's employer along with me, though. You can find out who it is, Matt. Beat it out of him. You better come with me, Kitty, so you can point this man out. Yeah. And you take cover in case he wants to fight. Any man who's coward enough to shoot you in the dark isn't going to face you now, Matt. Yeah, maybe not, Doc, but uh, you never know. Kind of okay, Kitty. I was just waiting you wait outside while I see how he's going to behave. Okay, Matt. Good luck. Thanks. I'm Marshal Dillon, mister. 
Oh. Who are you? I'm Tom Rogers. I thought you was dead, Marshal. I changed my mind. What do you want? You've been bragging about shooting me. Just talk, Marshal. I didn't mean nothing by it. I was just talking. Mm Mm-hmm. Kind of dangerous talk, don't you think? Everybody said you was dead. Well, I was waiting for you to come out of your hole, Rogers. You know, I don't like getting ambushed. Marshal, I never even seen you before. I didn't ambush you. All right, turn and face the bar while I take your gun. Go on. I ain't going to try nothing. You got the wrong man, Marshal. Okay, you can turn around. You can't arrest a man just for talking. The jail's right across the street, Rogers. You lead the way. Well, it was just talk, I tell you. You can't prove nothing. Get going. Well, I swear I didn't try to kill you, Marshal. Straight ahead, Rogers. And when we get there, you're going to do some more talking. I want to know who hired you. Nobody hired me. I ain't even got a job. Hey, Mr. Dillon, I want to tell Mr. Dillon... What are you doing out here? Who's this fellow? His name's Rogers, Chester. He's been bragging about shooting me. I was just having a little fun. I ain't no gunman. It doesn't take much of a gunman to try to ambush a man. But I didn't do it, Marshal. I heard him talking about it, and I don't know why I started saying I had uh, done Mr. it. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what, Chester? Mr. Dillon, I was on my way up to docks. I, I was coming to tell you something. Well? I, I've been over to Alaforganza. I declare I, I just don't understand it. Well, say it, Chester. Yes, sir. Well, there's a fellow over there, and he's been bragging about shooting you, too. What? Yes, sir, that's right. He's saying he outdrawed you and killed you. Of course, he's a little drunk. Yeah. Yeah, of course he is. Well, it was Rogers here till I scared him sober. Sure. Sure, I've been drinking, Marshal. I wouldn't have talked like that if I'd been plumb sober. Here. Here's your gun, Rogers. Wait. You turning me loose? It's like you say, Rogers. You're just a big talker. What about the fellow over at the Alapaganza? I don't even want to see him, Chester. He'll shut up fast enough when he hears I'm still around. And you go on back to the bar, Rogers. Unless the men laugh you out of town. Yes, sir. I'm sure sorry I've done it, Mark. All right, get going. Sure, I'm going. I don't know what's the matter with me, Chester. Not figuring this. I might have known there'd be at least a couple of drunks wanting the reputation for having killed me. Yes, sir. Doggone it. Now we're right back where we started from. Yeah. Hey, maybe that whiskey drummer was lying, too. No, you're forgetting I got shot at, Chester. And there's a man somewhere in Dodge still waiting to kill me. Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this Monday night on most of these same CBS radio stations, hear Ida Lupino and Edmund O'Brien in the stirring screenplay adaptation of The Star on the Lux Radio Theater. It's a hard hitting drama about a has been who attempts a comeback in a juvenile role. This will be Lux Radio Theater, drama at its best, Monday night at the Star's address. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. a man down, living from day to day, waiting for a bullet in the back, and not knowing who to expect it from, or when. Makes you feel kind of helpless. And before long, in spite of everything you try to do to stop it, you get kind of spooky. And you start shying at the most ordinary noise. 
especially if it comes from behind you. There's no way to stay alive, because this is the one time you need to be as calm and clear as you've ever been in your life. Well, I had a week of it, and nothing happened. Until Chester came into the office one day with a telegram from Sheriff Tom Smith of Tuscosa. I thought I'd better get right over here at this, Mr. Dillon. Might be important. Well, you told me it was from Tom Smith, Chester. Yes, sir. It is. <laughs> well, if you know that, how come you don't know what the message is? Oh, well, I didn't read it too close, Mr. Dillon. Here. <clears throat> Thanks. He's coming for his prisoner. He'll be here on the stage. Day after tomorrow, well, I figure it. Now, anything else? What? Well, is that all it says here? Yes, sir, that's all. Now, there's just one thing you missed, Chester. What's that? The date it was sent. It got delayed somewhere along the line. Tom's due in today. He is? Yeah, what time is it? Oh, about noon, I guess. Now, that stage ought to be here right now. Come on, let's go see. All right, sir. Well, there it is, Mr. Dillon. Must pulled in just a minute ago. I don't see no passengers, though. Well, that may be because they haven't got out yet, Chester. Yes, sir. Right here they come. Ain't that Tom Smith? Yeah, that's him. Who's that other fella? He looks kind of familiar. Now, that's Wilbur Hawkins, Chester, that little whiskey drummer. Oh, yes. Well, now, I've been wondering where he's been. Matt. Matt Dillon. Hello, Tom. Hey, how are you, Matt? Hello, Chester. Hello, Mr. Smith. Well, I'm sure glad that trip's over. Next time, I'll come horseback. Now, the stage is easier when you're taking a prisoner back, though. Yeah, I guess you're right at that, Matt. And I hope you still got him. I'd hate to make this trip for nothing. <laughs> oh, he's there. Anytime you want him. Hey, where's Wilbur Hawkins going? Ain't he even going to say hello? You know that little fellow? Oh, yeah, we know him. And he told me he's staying at the Dodge house. Crazy talkingest man I ever run into. I told him, Hawkins, if you tried thinking a little first, you might make a whole lot more sense a whole lot faster. Well, he means well, Tom. Uh, maybe. But he tells some mighty strange stories. Oh, what do you mean? Well, of course it could be true, but he told me he heard a couple of men in a bar talking about me. He didn't know who they meant till I introduced myself on the stage and he recognized my name. Well, what are you looking like that for, man? Uh, no, no, no. Go ahead, Tom. What did Hawkins hear? Well, he said this one fellow was going to give the other fellow $300 to shoot me. <laughs> Ain't that the darnest thing? Yeah, that sure is. I don't know, Matt. There's a lot of men that like to kill me, but I don't believe they'd be standing around talking about it that way. I kind of think he made it all up. No, he didn't make it up, Tom. Not quite. Huh? You know something about this? You mean someone is out to shoot me? Yeah. Who? I'll tell you about it on the way over to the Dodge house. You wait here, Chester, just in case he gets past us. All right, sir. He ain't gonna get past us. But I can't figure, Matt... Why, Hawkins, would want to kill you and me. Well, it doesn't make much sense, Tom. Mm. Now, here it is. Who is it? It's Tom Smith and Matt Dillon, Hawkins. What are you doing here? We want to talk to you. Open up, Hawkins. Tom, get out of the way. Yeah. How'd you know he was going to shoot me? Well, I just sensed it, I guess. Look, I can kick that door open with one foot, and then you cover me. All right, you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I'll kill you! Kill him, Matt. Well, I tried not to. Hawkins. You hit me. Now, I'm 
going to die. I had to shoot, Hawkins. But why did you want to kill us? Smith and me. A lot of people want to. Hear them say. Nobody said nothing. <laughs> you made all that up, Hawkins. <laughs> You took a shot at me last week, didn't you, Hawkins? Didn't you? No, Diane. I can't kill anybody now. Why? Why did you want to, Hawkins? <laughs> Tell me. I killed other men. Important men. I told them about it first. And then, then I killed them. But why, Hawkins? I don't know. I had to. I had to do it. Die. Now he's dead, Tom. Matt, what the devil was he talking about? I don't know. But it doesn't matter much. I don't understand it. I never saw him before yesterday. Now, Hawkins was a murderer, Tom. The kind that doesn't need any particular reason. Nobody will ever know why he did what he did. Yeah, he was crazy, if you like. Sure was crazy. You think he's done a lot of killing, Matt? Yeah, probably. That's the most dangerous kind of man there is, Tom. A murderer with no reason at all. Looking little whiskey drummer. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Edgar Barrier, John Daner, and Vic Perrin. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. You've heard fictional crime cases many times, but there's nothing like the real thing. We're talking about Night Watch. This Monday night, following the Bob Trout news, you'll be on the scene when a burglar is caught in the act. You'll hear him break a glass window in trying to get away. You'll hear the officers handcuff him and take him off to jail. You'll hear this authentic case unfold from beginning to end on Night Watch Monday night. George Walsh speaking. John Lund as yours truly Johnny Dollar brings you colorful mystery Tuesdays on the CBS Radio Network. city and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. What is it, Chester? A doc wants you upstairs. Well, I promised Mr. Green I'd be at the Dodge house in a few minutes, Chester. Tell Doc I'll drop a lot later, huh? Young Lee Prentice is up there. He got shot last night. What? 
Chart? Yes, sir. Happened out at his ranch. Doc thinks you ought to talk to him. All right, let's go. I wouldn't have thought Lee Prentice had an enemy in the world. No, sir. He's about the nicest young fellow that's settled around here in a long time. Who brought him into town, Chester? Nobody didn't. He rode in alone. Oh. Doc, don't know how he managed it. Oh, hello, Matt. Doc. Well, I hear you took a bullet, Lee. It's not bad, Marshal. Doc's got me all fixed up now. Oh, yeah, sure. But you're going to stay right here with me and take it easy for a few days, Lee. I'd be putting you out, Doc. Oh, yes, of course. It'll be a nuisance, but I'll manage somehow. How did it happen, Lee? Did you get in a fight? I didn't even see him, Marshal. It was still dark this morning, and I was going out after my horses. And then a bullet knocked me down. That's all I know. I did an awful lot of shooting the next few minutes, and whoever it was, run off. Yeah. Would uh, it be any particular man? We... I'd tell you if I knew, Marshal. I don't want any trouble. All right, I believe you. Oh, man, it's a downright shame when a young fellow like Lee comes to Dodge and in one year makes as many friends as he has and then gets shot down by some murderer. Now, you've got to find out who did that. I don't have much to go on, Doc. In fact, I don't have anything. Well, I don't care. you got to do something. Now, like what? Well, I... What do you mean? I'm not a lawman. How do I know? Well, there's one thing, Doc, and you too, Chester. Uh, what, Mr. Dillon? Don't say anything about where Lee is. Whoever did this is probably still around. Well, you mean he might come up here and try to finish him off? He might. Chester, hmm? you go fetch me one of those shotguns you keep downstairs. Sure, Doc. Okay, Doc, but uh, don't get trigger heavy, huh? I know what I'm doing. Uh, Doc, uh, Marshal, I, I'm sure sorry for all the trouble I'm causing. It's no trouble, Lee. Oh, it's no trouble, he said. Oh, all right, Matt. You go find him something to eat later this afternoon and bring it up here. A nice, oh, say, roast chicken. That'd be just about right. <laughs> sure, Doc. I'll be glad to. Gee, I'd... I'd... See you later, Lee. Come on, Chester. I'm glad I ran into you, Matt. It was a good supper. It was all my pleasure, Kitty. <laughs> Matt. Yeah, what? Have you got time to sit here and watch the crowd for a while? I don't have to be back at work just yet. Sure, sure, Kitty. Mm-hmm. Hey, you sit there. Uh, uh, looks like Dodge is in for another big night tonight. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> just think. There's hardly one of these cowboys that won't be broke before morning. <laughs> well, I figure it's worth it. Three months pay in one night? They're crazy, all of them. Well, what would you have them do with their money, Kitty? Well, I don't know. Most anything's better than throwing it away. Well, most of these men have waited a long time for a night or two in Dodge. I don't care what it costs. <laughs> There's only one cowboy I ever knew who showed any sense. Oh? That yeah, must be quite a fella for you to say that, Kitty. Well, you know who I mean, Matt. Young Lee Prentice. Oh. Oh, sure. Remember sure. last year how he drifted it into town and made a killing at Farrell and then swore off gambling? Yeah, he stayed with it, too. I never heard of his going near a game since. Oh, he hasn't. Took his money and put it in that little ranch of his. You got to admire the boy. Yeah, well, he's all right. Really? He's sure a lot different from the rest of these saddle bums. I wonder where he's been lately. He usually comes to town every day or so. Well, uh, Kitty, I'll tell you, Lee's up at Doc's. At Doc's? Uh, then he is in town. Well, he's been there for a couple of days. Well, what's the matter? Is he sick or something? No, he's not sick. Oh, oh uh... wait a minute, Matt. Hey, mister. Yeah, you. Come here. What do you want? I'm Kitty. Remember? Yeah, I remember. Well, you don't act like it. You must have been drunker than I thought. I'm in a hurry, Kitty. Well, go on, then. I won't tell you. Tell me what? You remember asking me last night if I know anything about Lee Prentice? Did I? <laughs> you really were drunk. But if you're still interested, Marshal Dillon here just told me he's up at Doc Adams. Oh. Well, I, I don't need him now. Bye. Oh, uh, just a minute, mister. You're a stranger in Dodge, huh? 
I'll talk to you later, Marshal. Not now. What do you mean, later? After I've done what I come here for. What's your name, mister? Jake Harbin. You look like a gunman to me. Why are you looking for Lee Prentice? All right, Marshal. If you're so nosy, I'll tell you. I'm going to kill him. No, you're not. <laughs> you can't stop me. Jake, uh... Harbin, huh? What'd you, what'd you hit him for, Matt? What's this all about? I don't know, Kitty. But maybe I'll find out when he comes to... in jail. This morning, Mr. Dillon. Go bring Jake Harbin in here, Chester, will you? I want to talk to him. Yes, sir. He's been saying he wants to talk to you, too. He wouldn't tell me nothing. Don't stick my nose into something that doesn't concern me. You all you say. Marshal's here, Harbin. Well, it's about time. Here he is, Mr. Dillon. Come over here, Harbin. You'd have saved yourself a lot of trouble if you'd have stayed around here last night, Marshal. What do you mean by cold cock and a man throwing him in jail? Where are you from, Harvin? Baker City. Out down on the Canadian River? Yeah. Anybody goes to jail in Baker City, they search him first. Now, what do you mean? If you'd have searched me last night, you'd have found this. What is it? Read it. And afterwards, you can apologize to me. What is it, Mr. Dillon? It's a warrant, Chester. And that also says I'm a legal deputy. You can telegraph Ben Goddard for proof if you want. Who's Ben Goddard? He's the sheriff at Baker City. That's all legal, Marshal. Yeah, but who's the warrant for, Mr. Dillon? Lee Prentice, Chester. For murder. They want him dead or alive. <laughs> We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, any way you look at it, it's murder this Tuesday night when CBS Radio's Mr. and Mrs. North look into the matter of a body that hurtled 30 stories from penthouse to sidewalk. And it's murder, too, when a publicity stunt involving presumably blank cartridges backfires. The details of that neat little plot are very truly yours on yours truly, Johnny Dollar, also Tuesday night on most of these same stations. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Chester. Yes, sir. Go down and send a telegram to the sheriff of Baker City. Now, what'd you say his name is, Harvin? Ben Goddard. All right. Ask Ben Goddard to verify this warrant for Lee Prentice. And also ask him if Jake Harbin here is a legal deputy. <laughs> You'll find out, Marshal. I sure expect we will, Harbin. Get going, Chester. Yes, sir. I'll hurry. This uh, warrant says Lee Prentice is wanted for murder, Harbin. That's kind of hard to believe, knowing Lee. Well, then you don't know him very well, Marshal. Because he is a murderer, all right. And he'd have been caught a long time ago if they'd have found out where he was hiding. He hasn't been hiding. Lee's lived here for nearly a year. Right out in the open. And so. Uh, he's all through now. Maybe. If this is true. I want to tell you one thing, Harvin. You tell me what? Nobody, whether he's a deputy or not, is going to come to Dodge and kill a man. Dead or alive, Marshal, you read the warrant. I don't care what it says. You wouldn't like it said that you're protecting the murderer, would you, Marshal? 
Well, I don't know that he is a murderer yet. But you came pretty close to being one. I was going to explain it to you after I killed him. I didn't want no interference. Well, you got it now. What kind of law do they have in Baker City? Don't they ever give men a trial down there? Sure they do. And why didn't you come here and arrest Lee and take him back with you? Are they afraid to put him on trial? <laughs> Not hardly, Marshal. That they hired a killer like you to come up here and shoot him, huh? Look, it's all legal. In Baker City, maybe it is, but not in Dodge. Well, the law's the same everywhere. It it? should be, Harvin. But sometimes it depends on who's representing the law. Well, I don't aim to argue with you. Now, look, let's get one thing straight. You are not going to shoot Lee Prentice no matter what happens. I'll kill you myself if you try it. Okay. Okay, Marshal. Why don't you talk to him, being as you are such good friends? Ask him how he'd like to stand trial. I will, Harvin. But you stay away from him. You hear? Why, sure, Marshal. I'm just trying to do my duty. <laughs> Feeling, Lee. Fine. Doc says I can leave any time. As long as he doesn't try to do any hard work for another week or so. I'll take it easy, Doc. <laughs> you better. Lee, uh, did you ever hear of a man called Jake Harbin? Harbin? Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of him. Well, he's the man who tried to kill you. What? How do you know? He's here as a deputy with a warrant for you. Dead or alive. The warrant signed by the sheriff of Baker City. Oh. What's the warrant for, Marshal? Murder. But it didn't say who. No. It didn't have to. Not if Ben Goddard signed it. It's for the murder of Jim Turner, Marshal. Oh. Uh, why did you do it, Lee? I killed him. He tried to shoot me in the back and missed. Well, that doesn't exactly make it a uh, murder, does it? His old man owns Baker City, Doc, and he owns the sheriff and Jake Harbin along with it. That makes it murder. Oh, oh I see. Is that why you left Baker City, Lee? They'd have killed me if I hadn't. Oh, what if you go back there and stand trial? <laughs> old man Turner'd run that trial, Marshal. I'd hang sure. No, I won't go back. I'll die here first. Well, I don't blame him, Matt. Why, it'd be legal murder, that's what... It isn't legal to fix a trial and hang an innocent man, Doc. That's what had happened, though. You're not thinking of turning him over to this... to this so-called deputy, are you, Matt? Look, Lee, I believe you, and I trust you. Thanks, Marshal. Now, tell me something. Do you trust me? Well, sure I do. Of course. Why? Well, you may not like what I'm going to do. What, Marshal? I'm putting you under arrest, Lee, right now. Under arrest? What for? Oh, I don't know. Uh, horse thieving? Horse thieving? Eat all that. It'll do. Well, you're my prisoner now, Lee. My prisoner. Now, come on, let's go to jail. I don't know I like being a horse thief, Marshal. Well, it beats being a murderer, Lee. And besides, I kind of doubt that we'll hang you for it. Marshal. What? Look, there's Jake Harmon. Yeah, I see him. I'd feel safer if you gave me my gun back. Prisoners can't carry guns, Lee. It wouldn't look right. Lee, please. Well, Lee, Marshal talked you to coming back to Baker City and stand in trial. Still on old man Turner's payroll, ain't you, Jake? I don't take no back talk from no murderer. Why'd you try to ambush me the other morning, Jake? Afraid to face me? I got a warrant for you, dead or alive. Why should I take any chances? Nobody cares how you die. I care, Harvin. But you can't stand in the way of a legal warrant, Marshal. 
And you'll see as soon as you get that telegram from the sheriff. It's too late, Harvin. What's too late? I just arrested Lee myself. He's my what? prisoner now. You what? And as long as he's my prisoner, nobody touches him. Warrant or no. Oh, you're, you're being tricky, Marshal. What'd you arrest him for? He ain't done nothing. Might be hard to prove, but anyway, I'm holding him for a horse, Stephen. Now get out of the way. I'm taking him to the chase. You're forgetting I, I can kill him anytime I want for free. Like right now, maybe. Doc Lee. Are you hit, Lee? No. But it was mighty close, Marshal. I didn't think he'd try it. You got him just in time. The next shot, he'd have killed me. They sure don't care much how they do things where you come from, do they, Lee? There's going to be trouble now, Marshal. Real trouble. It seemed only fair to let the sheriff of Baker City know that his deputy had been killed. So I sent him another telegram. And I soon got a reply. Ben Goddard himself was coming to Dodge. The day he was due to arrive, I sent Chester to the stage while Lee Prentice and I waited in the lobby of the Dodge house, along with a couple of friends who thought it might be interesting to see how Sheriff Goddard was going to handle the situation. The stage pulled in about noon, and a few minutes later, Chester and the Sheriff walked into the hotel lobby where we were standing on. Here he is, Mr. Dillon. Hello, Sheriff. You're Marshal Dillon. And mm-hmm. uh, this is Mr. Green. He owns the Dodge House. Hi, Sheriff. And Mr. Jonas, one of our leading businessmen. Good day, Sheriff. Gentlemen, nice to know you. And you know Lee Prentice. I sure do. You're going to a lot of trouble, Goddard. You know, man Turner. It's worth it. Getting you back where you belong. You'll hang sure now. Lee didn't kill Jake Harbin, Sheriff. No? I did. What? He tried to shoot Lee in the back. What difference it made? He's wanted, dead or alive. What are you interfering in this for, Marshal? You got no respect for the law? Not for your kind of law. Anyway, Lee's wanted in Dodge, and he's staying here. What about my warrant? You're claiming it ain't legal? You can't arrest the man that I've got under arrest. You're protecting him, ain't you? What'd you arrest him for? Stealing horses? I don't believe it. I'm bringing the charges, Sheriff. Yeah, it was my horses he stole. Well, I thought you owned this hotel, Green. What are you doing with horses? Well, I, I also own a little ranch outside of town. I, uh, I raise horses. Uh, maybe, but I know you're lying about Lee. Am I? Of course you are. Marshal Dillon, you ain't very smart. No. You'll have to bring Lee to trial, won't you? Of course. You think Green here is going to swear to that story under oath? Well, you, you may be right, Sheriff. I, I might have to change my mind once I get on the stand. Uh, it might be I, I couldn't swear to it. <laughs> I didn't think so. That trial won't last long, and when it's over, I'll take Lee back to Baker City. Uh, Marshal Dillon... Yes, Mr. Jonas, what is it? Uh, there's something I haven't mentioned. Oh? I kind of figured I'd wait till Lee's trial was over before I did. Well, go ahead, Mr. Jonas. Yes. Well, the other day, Lee came into my store, and I went out back to fetch him a sack of grain. Is that so? Uh, he didn't know I was watching, but I was. And I saw him take a handful of money out of my cash box. Oh, now, wait a minute. Mr. Jonas, are you charging Lee with robbery? No, not yet, Marshal. I'll wait and see if he gets off for horse stealing first. Well, Lee, looks like you're in for nothing but trials and rearrests and more trials. That <laughs> yeah, could go on for a long, long time. <laughs> as long as his friends hold out, Marshal, and Lee's got quite a few of them in Dodge. <laughs> Why, you're a... You're a pack of crooks cheating the law. That's what you are, including you, Marshal. My prisoner, Sheriff. I won't stand for it, I tell you. Well, what are you going to do about it? We'd like to tell old man Turner about this. You won't dare tell him, Goddard. You're licked and you know it. Turner would have you run out of town if you're fool enough to go back. Marshal, 
I got to take Lee. I got to... It's Lee's life or your job, huh? All right, Sheriff, take him. But you'll have to kill me first. Or there's a train east in about an hour. So make up your mind, Sheriff. Want me to follow him, Mr. Dillon? No, Chester, he'll leave. Uh, Marshal, uh, gentlemen, I, well, I wish I knew how to tell you. Lee. Yes, Marshal? Go on home. But remember, you're still under arrest. <laughs> and you're going to stay that way. Until old man Turner's in his grave. <laughs> Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards, Lawrence Dobkin, John Daner, Joe Duval, and James Nusser. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNair is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. FBI in Peace and War, a manhunt mystery packed with tension, is yours on CBS Radio this coming Wednesday night on most of these stations. George Walsh speaking. Crime photographer really clicks against criminals Wednesdays on the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Look, Mr. Dillon, there's Miss Kitty, there in front of the Texas Trail. Yeah, I think she's waiting to say hello, Chester. What's she going to work so early for? Why, it ain't hardly noon yet. I don't know about Kitty, but the stage from Wichita's due in about noon. Oh, I plumb forgot. Sheriff Benson's coming today, ain't he? That's what the telegram said. Why would the sheriff of Wichita come all the way to Dodge, Mr. Dillon? Must be mighty important. Maybe there's somebody here he'd like to take back with him. Hello, Kitty. Hello, Matt. Chester. Miss Kitty? So this is what Dodge looks like at noon. It's a little too real for me. <laughs> we were wondering what brought you out so early. Uh, Sam sent word. He wanted to see me. Come on in and say hello. Okay. We got a few minutes. Oh. Hello, Sam. Hello, Sam. Marshal? Hello, Kitty. Sam. Hello, Chester. You have your drink, gentlemen? Uh, no, thanks, Sam. Sam, it isn't uh, noon yet. What am I doing here? <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming, Kitty. It's a new girl I just hired. I thought it'd be sort of nice if you'd take her over and sort of show her the ropes. Glad to, Sam. She's come in from St. Louis on the Santa Fe this morning. Needed a job real bad. Well, I hope she's not one of those innocent lambs who's been a lady all her life. 
I'll, I'll go get her. Sam takes pity on every lost soul that hits this town. No woman could stay lost around Dodge for long. <laughs> That's true, Chester. That's why most of these women ought to stay home. Say, she's pretty. Kara. What? Uh, uh, that's her name, Kara. You know her? Yeah. Yeah, I know her. Well, yeah, here, here she is, everybody. Kara, this is Kitty and Marshal Dillon and Chester Proudfoot. Hello, Kara. Aren't you going to say hello, Matt? Been a long time, Kara. Matt and I knew each other out in Arizona. For a while, anyway. Till Matt sort of changed his mind. Well, what are you doing in Dodge, Kara? I thought you'd be surprised. I heard you were marshal here. Somebody told me on the train. Uh Uh-huh. You've been living in St. Louis? I've been living everywhere, Matt. I left Arizona about a year after you did. I even tried San Francisco. I made out pretty good there, too. Oh. Uh, you planning on staying in Dodge? Why not? I heard there's a lot of easy money here. Sure, sure. Any objections to my stay in, Matt? Well, of course not. Kitty, it's it's real sweet of you to show me around. Uh-huh. Let's sit over there and have a talk first, shall we? Sure. Maybe you can teach me a few things. See you later, gentlemen. Well, I'll say one thing, Mr. Dillon. She's a right pretty girl, anyway. Yeah. But she's changed since I knew her. She's changed a lot. Uh, come on, Chester. The stage is about you. Now, this is my office here, Sheriff. Oh, Dodge is short road, Marshal. Been three or four years since I was here. Yeah. Must look mighty small compared to Wichita, Mr. Benson. Maybe Dodge will be bigger than Wichita someday. But it's Denver, they say, has grown. I'm curious to see that. Are you headed for Denver, Sheriff? They're holding a killer for me up there. Oh. Well, sit down, sit down. <sighs> I'm taking the next stage west, Marshal, but uh, I wanted to be sure to see you on my way through Dodge. There's some trouble headed here. Oh? A fella called Jack Tolliver. He's a bank robber, Marshal. And he's killed a few men along the way. He opened up the state bank in Wichita about a year ago, and he's been working his way through the Dakotas since then. But here he's back in Kansas. Took $5,000 out of the bank at Salina a few weeks back. Well, what makes you think he's going to try Dodge, Sheriff? Because he's heading south. Dodge is a natural for them. Them? He's got a couple of partners. I don't know their names. Yeah. Uh, what does this Tolliver look like? That's a trouble, Marshal. Nobody ever got a good look at him, I know of. But uh, I can tell you something about one of the gang... He sends this one ahead of him to sort of look things over for a week or so, and then he and the other two ride in. Uh-huh. What about the man that scouts ahead for him? It, uh, ain't a man, Marshal. It's a woman. A woman? Don't know her name. She changes it all the time anyway, but she's right pretty. About five foot seven, black hair, hazel eyes. She's smart, and she's tough. Well, right, clear. Mr. Dillon, that sounds... That's a like... pretty clever operation, Chester. Uh, Sheriff, I sure thank you for telling me all this. Uh, we'll be watching for him. Well, I better go get some dinner before that stage pulls out. See you on my way back, Marshal. Goodbye, Chester. Bye, Mr. Benson. Thanks again, Sheriff. Mr. Dillon, that sure did sound like Kara he was describing. Oh, but of course, she wouldn't be mixed up in anything like that. Well, I said she'd changed, Chester, but I hope she hasn't changed that much. I, uh, think I better go have a talk with her.
Why, Matt, how do you know where I was? Kitty told me. I, uh, I'd like to talk to you, Carol. Sure. Come in. Thank you. Is it embarrassing for you, Matt? My being in Dodge? Why should it be, Kara? Well, we were pretty good friends once. Well, we can still be friends. You mean that, Matt? You really mean it? You know what I mean, Kara. Why'd you come here? What do you want? Oh, just to talk a little. About what? About you. Where you been. You ever get married? Things like that. No, I never got married. And I told you I've been everywhere. What else? Well, what have you been doing lately? Why'd you leave St. Louis? I haven't been in St. Louis. Are you... You said you just came from there. You didn't let me finish. I haven't been in St. Louis very long, and I had no reason to stay there. Matt, what's this all about? If you don't want me in Dodge, say so. I'll leave. Oh, you're... You're welcome in Dodge, Kara. I don't know whether to believe you or not. Oh, maybe I'm being too curious. I'll shut up. Oh, it isn't that. I guess it's just that... There's a lot of things I don't want to talk about. You understand that. Sure, sure. But I won't be bothering you anyway. I have to go out of town for a few days tomorrow. Oh? Where are you going? Salina. They're holding a prisoner for me there. Salina? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're going tomorrow? Yeah. I'll, I'll be back in a couple of days, though. Matt, couldn't you put it off for a while? Say, another week? Why, Carol? I don't know. I'd like you around. I feel like such a stranger here. I'll be more at home in another week. Please, Matt? Uh, sure, Kara. Doesn't make much difference. Uh, you, you let me know if there's anything I can do for you. Huh? Thanks, Matt. I will. You there, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. Did you find out anything? Only if she is mixed up with this man, Tolliver, she can't get in touch with him for a week. But we won't worry about it till then. It'd be kind of too bad. I mean, you being a friend of hers and all. The sheriff said Tolliver's killed a number of men, Chester. I won't mind stopping him. If I can. We will return for the second act of Gun Smoke in just a moment, but first. United States savings bonds pay 3% interest when held to maturity. They're safe, they're sure. No gamble with Uncle Sam's savings bonds. The bond a month plan at your bank or your payroll savings plan makes saving automatic. Now the second act of Gun Smoke. <laughs> A few days passed, and as I'd thought, nothing happened. Kara worked at the Texas Trail. And although we kept an eye on her, she talked to so many strangers every day, there was no way of telling which might have been her bank robber friend, Jack Tolliver. Would have been easy for him to just ride into town anytime he wanted, buy Kara a drink, and get what information she'd gathered. I talked to her now and then. And although she tried not to show it, I was pretty sure she was aware that I was suspicious of her. 
And then one day, I was real sure. Doc and Chester and I just finished a game of three-handed stud in the office. Six fifty, six seventy-five, and seven. <clears throat> seven fifty, eight dollars. You have to count it out loud, Doc. Eight fifty, nine, nine fifty. Ah, there we are. <laughs> Uh, well, I do it to teach you a lesson, Chester. You got my money, ain't that enough? <laughs> oh, you're always thinking of money, Chester. Money isn't the only pleasure in the world. Why, there's also... Oh, my, there's... Uh, well, uh, well, there's also, um... Um... Also um, what? <laughs> you better think hard, Doc. He's following you mighty close. Uh, did you ever go out in the night, Chester, and look at the stars? What? Did you ever watch them and feel close to nature and enjoy the great and wondrous beauty of it all? You talk like you had a drink, Doc. Uh, uh, oh, Chester. Of course, I watched the stars whenever it wasn't raining or snowing or blowing the wind down out of the north or whenever I wasn't just too doggone saddle weary and tuckered out to keep my eyes open. You're a hard man to inspire, Chester. Uh, saving you from the devil would be a full-time job. And I'm afraid it's too late. Now, oh, here... I... Uh, the world has corrupted you, Chester. It's touched your soul. It's withered it like a... Oh, my, my like a... Like a bean. Like a bean? Now, doggone it, you listen here, Doc. <laughs> oh, oh, kitty! <laughs> oh. Oh, well, look upon her, Chester. The beauty of womanhood in all its passionate splendor. What? It sure beats the stars, anyway. Are you too drunk? <laughs> Doc's been trying to teach Chester to take a larger view of life, Kitty. <laughs> Doc's got all my money, and he's just crowing about it. That's all he's doing. Money, huh? Well, that's just what I came here for. Oh, what do you mean, Kitty? I need $20, Matt. Oh, well, sure. There you are. Before I take it, I better tell you, it isn't for me. What? Kara needs it. She came to me, and I didn't have it, but I said I thought I could get it for her. I think she knows where. Well, she could have come to me herself. Too proud, maybe. How come she's broke? She's been working. I didn't ask her what it's for, Matt. Uh, it's all right, Kitty. Give it to her. I will. But I'll tell you something. What? I've met some pretty tricky women here and there. But your old friend Kara has them all beat. I'll give her the money. Chester. Yes, sir? Follow Kitty. Don't let Kara out of your sight till you find out what that money's for. I'll wait here for you. Okay, Mr. Dillon. Depot's already crowded, Chester. It must be close to train time. Yes, sir. And Carol will be here. I know she will. The agent told me she bought one ticket to St. Louis and asked what time the next train leaves. Well, I hope she's here. And maybe she's innocent after all, Mr. Dillon. Well, we'll soon find out, Chester. Oh, there she is over there. Yes, and all dressed up, too. Carol's always all dressed up. Hello, Matt. Chester? Miss Kara? You staring at me, Matt? I'm just wondering why you didn't come and say goodbye if you're leaving Dodge. What makes you think I'm leaving? Well, you bought a ticket to St. Louis with the $20 I gave Kitty for you. Yes, I did. I knew you'd figure it all out, Matt. And I knew you'd think I'm leaving. I wanted you to. Why, Kara? Because I've enjoyed making a fool of you. Have you? A friend of mine's leaving on that train, Matt. Jack Tolliver? I knew you were on to us. I'll watch Kara if you want to go after him, Mr. Dillon. There are 20 strangers down here, Chester. How do I know which one's Tolliver? <laughs> you know, I could arrest you, Kara. You're wanted in a lot of places. You're too smart for that, Matt. Arrest me and you'd never find Jack. Sure, but once Tolliver's on that train, I can find him. How? I'll have the whole train put under guard when it gets to Abilene. And one by one, every man on it will have to clear himself. We'll get him. 
No, you won't. He'll jump off. He won't know what I'm going to do, and you can't warn him, no. Hey, it's pulling out, Mr. Dillon. We'll make it, Chester. So long, Kara. No, Matt, wait. Come on, Chester, run. Matt, come back. Well, we made it. <laughs> you sure fooled her, Mr. Dillon. Kara doesn't think I fooled her, Chester. What do you mean? She thinks she fooled me. Well, how? She wants me on this train. She planned the whole thing for it. Well, why are we here, then? Well, we won't be for long. There's a ranch close to the tracks about ten miles from here. I'll have the conductor stop the train, and we'll get off there and then borrow a couple of horses. And, and ride on back to Dodge? Jack Tolliver's in Dodge, Chester. He's thinking he can hold up the bank any time he wants to now. But there's nobody to stop him. I tied the horse way over yonder, Mr. Dillon. Plumb out of sight. Oh, good. It's almost dark anyway. They'd never see him. Yeah. Well, things look quiet enough. Come on, let's get inside the bank. We'll wait for him there. How are we going to get in, Mr. Dillon? Ain't it locked? Yeah, there isn't more than a couple of hundred dollars in there, Chester. Mr. Botkin's been keeping the bank's real money in a safe at his home ever since I heard about Jack Tolliver. He gave me a key to the rear door here. Well, if there's nothing for him to steal, what do we care? Well, I'll let you figure that out for yourself, Chester. Hmm? Where'll I get at, Mr. Dillon? Uh, over there by the window there. Where you can see them, huh? Oh, what if they try to come in the front? Oh, no, they won't. It's too exposed. I'll wait over here. When they come, we'll leave them alone until they get clear inside. You understand? Yes, sir. I won't shoot till you do. All right, good. Now, don't stand right in front of the window, Chester. They'll see you. Yeah, but I can't see good if I'm at one side. You don't have to be at one side. Just stand a few feet back from it. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's better. My. I sure do wish there was a moon tonight. Yeah, it'll be a help, all right. Uh oh. What? There's some horses. They're heading this way. How many? Four, I think. Yep, four. Yeah, that's them. Here they come. They're getting down. Three of them are. They're handing their reins to the other one. I hope now he's getting down, too. She, Chester. That's probably Kara. My God, I think it is. All right, quiet now. Yes, sir. Not so much noise. Be taking care us all the way down Front Street. <laughs> all clear, Kara? Okay, Jack. All right. Go ahead, you two. I'll follow. All right. Behind the banker's desk there, according to Kara. Yeah. All right, get your hands in the air, Tolliver. All of you. You're coming. I can't see. No. Oh. no. no. I got two of them, Chester. Tolliver, run outside, but I hit him. He's wounded. Look, Kara's having to help him. Hold it, Tolliver. Kara, get away from him. No, you don't, Kara. You stay right here. Don't hide behind me, Jack. He'll kill me. He won't kill you. But if you move, I will. No, let me go. Get around behind him, Chester. Yes, sir. You're trapped, Tolliver. Now let Kara go. You just stay right where you are, both of you. I'll kill her if you don't. You coward, Jack. Get away from me. I warned you. There you got him, Mr. Dillon. 
He's dead. I didn't get him soon enough. Let's see how Kara is. Kara. Oh. Kara. I'm sorry, Kara. It's too dark. I couldn't shoot any quicker. Kara. I don't think she heard me, Chester. He shot her right in the back, Mr. Neal. Yeah. Well, sir, that's the end of Jack Tolliver's gang. It's the end of a lot of things, Chester. A lot of things. Yes, sir, I guess it is. Smoke under the direction of Norman McDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Jill Jarman, Vic Perrin, and John Daner. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Guns blaze away in Peaceful Valley. Tomorrow night on CBS Radio, Gene Autry rides right into the middle of a border feud and tries his hand at settling things. Don't miss the Gene Autry Show, tomorrow on most of these same stations. The Star's Address presents America's favorite singing cowboy and his Melody Ranch pals every Sunday. George Walsh speaking. Your news is always accurately reported when it comes from the CBS Radio Network. skirt before, Kitty. You've been riding side saddle? For the first time in my life. <laughs> At least I know how to do it now, in case I'm ever called on to be a lady. <laughs> well, I know ladies who don't always ride side saddle. Sure. Like that female wildcat down in the panhandle you told me about. What's her name? Oh, Bell Star. I bet she never rides side saddle. <laughs> no, Bell Star's a lady, though. And everybody treats her like one. Even though she has to use a six-gun to make them do it. <laughs> Maybe I ought to try that. Yeah, it takes more than a six-gun to make a lady, Kitty. That's a funny way of putting it. But, well, that isn't what Mr. I meant. Mr. Dillon? Uh, hello, Miss Kitty. How are you, Chester? Hey, I just come to Longhorn there, Mr. Dillon. What, trouble, Chester? Uh, not yet, but there's going to be as soon as Art Long gets to town. Art Long? Well, he's always been a peaceful man. Isn't he one of those nesters out near Sam Baxton's ranch? That's him. But it's another one of them nesters that's talking up trouble. A fellow named Hoffer. He's saying he's going to shoot Art Long on sight. Well, is he drunk, Chester? Yes, sir, some. Armed? He's got the biggest old cavalry pistol you ever saw stuck right in his belt. Real farmer style. Well, that may be true, Kitty, but those horse pistols go off sometimes. Well, bye later, Matt. Yeah, I will if I can, Kitty. So long, it sure sounds like he means it, Mr. Dillon. Now, why does he want to kill Long, Chester? Well, sir, he didn't say. Yeah, maybe he's just drunk and wants to shoot somebody. No, anybody. Sir. No, sir. He Hoffer's pretty certain about who it's going to be. All right, Chester. Uh, don't stand too close in case he puts up a fight, huh? No, sir. Just where yet? Your 
name Hoffer? Barnaby Hoffer. What's the trouble between you and Art Long? You friend of his? That doesn't matter. Yes, it does. Because if you're a real good friend, I might take it to mind to shoot you, too. Now, but you're a marshal, mister, and you're not going to shoot anybody. Oh, Marshal Dillon, huh? I'll take that pistol, Hoffer. Okay, Marshal. Take it. All right. Now tell me what this is all about. I don't need no pistol. I got He's got this. a knife, Mr. Dillon! Drop it, Hoffer. I said drop it. No. I'm going to cut you again. Give me that knife back. You're kind of hard to convince, Hoffer. Did he, did he cut you bad, Mr. Dillon? Oh, he opened up my arm a little bit, Chester. I better go see Doc. You throw him in jail. Yes, sir, I sure will. There's a saying that it's the gentle horse that's most dangerous. You don't watch him close enough. And so with Barnaby Hoffer, a farmer who hands you his old horse pistol and then snatches an eight-inch knife from the back of his belt. Well, Doc took a few stitches in my arm and told me to come back in a couple of days. And I did. That it looked pretty good by then. At least I thought so. You're going to have to watch that cut, Matt. There might be an infection in it. What are you talking about, Doc? Looks as clean as rain to me. Well, how do you know what that idiot's been using his knife on? Probably sticks hogs with it all day and uses it to clean his boots at night. Yeah, sure, but my arm bled a lot. I've got it clean. That and uh, all the turpentine you poured into it. Hurt, didn't it? <sighs> you know, someday, Doc, if my luck holds, I'm going to get a chance to work on you. Oh, no, you know, I'd sooner die. I'd sooner lie in the snow and bleed to death all alone without anybody around even to bury me. <laughs> How did you get in the snow, Doc? Oh, I just hate snow. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I forgot. Oh, come in, come in. Oh, hello, Chester. Hey, Doc, hey, Mr. Dillon, Art Long's been killed. What? Yes, sir. A cowboy just came into office and told me. Said he rode by his cabin this afternoon and he found him there laying right in the door. Barnaby Hoffer must have done it. Hoffer? I thought you had him in jail, Matt. Well, I turned him loose next morning, Doc. He seemed calm enough then. I guess I made a mistake. I guess you did all right. Maybe we shouldn't have stopped to bury Art Long. Offer maybe a long way from here, but now. Oh, we couldn't leave him lying there, Chester. No, sir, I guess not. Poor fella. Well, there's Hoffer's cabin. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Hey, we've done pretty good at that. It's hardly past daylight. Looks like his door's open. Yeah, then he must be inside. He wouldn't go off and leave his door open. No. Hey, wait a minute. Look hmm? over there, Chester. What? Why, it's him. Oh, he looks dead. Yeah. Come on. Hey. been shot, Mr. Dillon, with a shotgun, just like Art Long. At least still breathing. Hoffer? Uh, Hoffer? Uh, it's Marshal Dillon, Hoffer. Uh, hey. Uh, Ma Marshal. Uh, I'm tore all apart. Took a load of buckshot. When I opened the door. Who did it, Hoffer? Did you see him? S Sam Baxton. He did it. Sam Baxton? Who killed Art Long, Hoffer? Did you? Art Long. Is he dead? Yeah. Bo both of us. Dead. <laughs> I don't want to die. That's 
a wonder he lived this long. Gosh, Mr. Dillon, I, I just can't believe Sam Baxton done this. Why? Just because Baxton's a big rancher and pretty respectable? He's also a mean old devil. And these men are nesters. Come on, let's go find him, Chester. Hello? Anybody home? Why, it's Marshal Dillon and Chester. Hello, Miss Oh, ma'am. Well, don't stand right out there. Come on in, set a while. Thank you, I got two pots of coffee on the stove. Well, we don't want to bother you none, Miss Baxton. Bother? Why, well, love company. And besides, you don't get out this way very often, Marshal. You're just going to have to stay and eat dinner with us. I got a little suckling pig roasting out back. How's that sound? Well, that's fine, ma'am, but I don't think we're going to be able to stay. Nonsense. I never let a man ride off hungry yet. Sam will be here in a minute, Marshal. He just went down back to the corral. In fact, that's him now coming in the back. Sam! Sam, we got company. Hello, Baxton. What are you doing here, Marshal? Why, Sam, that's no way to... Shut up, woman. Well, please, Sam, don't talk like that. You want to get whooped instead? Well, do you? No, Sam. I asked what you're doing here, Marshal. Yeah. Yeah, I heard you. Well, say it out. We're busy around here. You know Art Long and Barnaby Hoffer? I know them. Dirty nesters. Well, they're both dead, Baxter. Good. Oh, no. They both got killed the same way. What do I care how they got killed as long as they're dead? I'm going to tell you anyway, Baxton. Each of them, when he came out of his cabin first thing in the morning, was killed by a man waiting outside with a shotgun. How do you know all that? You, you weren't there. Barnaby Hoffer was still alive when we got there, Baxton. Still alive? He died pretty quick, but before he did, he told me who shot him. Did he? And who was that, Marshal? You. Oh, no. No, it couldn't be. I'm sorry, ma'am, but that's what he said. I'm going to have to arrest you, Baxton. Arrest me? On the word of a dead sod buster? <laughs> Who's going to believe it? The court will decide that, but it's enough evidence to hold you on. What makes you think Hoffer wasn't lying? He knew he was going to die, and it was his last chance to get me in trouble. That's what happened. You'll get a trial, Baxton. You can defend yourself there. Right now, you're going to jail. I'm charging you with two murders. But Art Long was dead. He didn't tell you nothing, Marshal. He and Hoffer were killed exactly the same way, ma'am. Looks like one man killed both of them. Go on, Marshal. If we're going to jail, let's go. And you stay out here, woman. I don't want you running into Dodge all the time I'm there. All right, Sam. And don't go talking your fool head off to everybody about this either. I won't. When we get this business over with, Marshal, I'm going to give you a lot of trouble. You're going to wish you never come near me. As soon as I get Kitty fixed up here. Oh, Matt. Kitty? What's that, a black eye? What happened? It's none of your business. <laughs> How's your arm, Matt? His arm's all right, Kitty. Just comes up here to bother me. But somebody's got to keep you from sleeping all day, Doc. Oh, don't forget I'm making pretty good money off that cut of yours. <laughs> yeah. There you are, Kitty. Thanks, Doc. Matt, has Sam Baxton confessed yet? No, I've spent two days trying to get him to, but he won't admit a thing. Well, if he does hang, there won't be many tears shed around here. Yeah, there's Ms. Baxton, Kitty. For some reason, she really loves him. Oh, that poor woman. I've seen how he treats her. Too bad she hasn't got a son to stand up for. Her. Some kid about eight feet tall. Well, he'd be about eight feet tall if he was Sam Baxton's. Well, that man's tall as a tree. Is he still wearing that white hat of his? Yeah, the only time he takes it off is when he sleeps, Kitty. Then he puts it over his face. Must be like sleeping under a horse blanket. No wonder he's so ornery all the time. Oh, oh come in. Well, come on in, friend. 
fellow downstairs told me I could find the marshal up here. Well, what can I do for you, mister? Well, I've never been in Dodge City before, Marshal. I ain't even been in Kansas very long. I'm riding south. I got tired of that cold up north. Well, you're welcome here. Well, I'm going on south. Well, what I come to tell you was, there's a little creek runs out of our Kansas about 20 miles from here. A fellow told me it's called Ginger Creek. Yeah, that's up near Sam Baxter's ranch, man. That's on his ranch, according to him. What about Ginger Creek, mister? Well, some fellow's got a little cabin there with a corral out in back. I don't know his name. Now, that'll be Jim Fowler. He's been homesteading there for about a year. No, no more he ain't. But, but what do you mean? I buried him myself early this morning. I come by and found him laying on the door of his cabin. He was dead, still bleeding. Somebody tore him plumbing, too, with a shotgun. Let's take a retake of the <coughs> What do you mean? I buried him myself early this morning. I come by and found him laying in the door of his cabin. He was dead, but still bleeding. Somebody's tore him plumb in two with a shotgun. Okay, and the top of the second act. If Mr. Dillon, look at there. What? what is it, Chester? Uh, out there in the street. It's Miss Baxton. Huh? She's coming to buggy. Ah, news travels fast, doesn't it? You gonna turn old Sam Baxton loose? Well, I don't have much to hold him on now, Chester. No, sir. Not with him right here in jail when that last fellow was killed the same way as Art Long and Hoffer. Shucks, I guess he was telling the truth after all. Yeah, it looks that way. Well, I'm glad for Miss Baxton anyway. She's an awful nice lady. Yeah, she is. I'll open the door for her. Well, morning, Miss Baxton. Hello, Chester. Hey, come right on in, ma'am. Thank you. Hello, Miss Baxton. Marshal Dillon, I, I'm sure glad to see you this time. Well, I hope there aren't any hard feelings, ma'am. Oh, you was only doing your duty. I respect that. Oh, where's Sam? Oh, the cells are out back. Oh, you haven't turned him loose yet? Uh, no, ma'am. It's too bad about Jim Fowler Marshall being killed that way. But it was just like the others, wasn't it? The same man killed all three of them. And Sam was right here in jail. Well, I was just saying to Chester, news sure travels fast. How'd you hear about it so soon? It just happened this morning. Well, one of our cowboys rode by there about noon, Marshall... He comes straight to the ranch and told me about it. Would you let me see Sam out? Would you let me... Would you let Sam out now? I was just saying that Chester news sure travels fast. How'd you hear about it so soon? It just happened this morning. Well, one of our cowboys rode by there about noon, Marshal... He comes straight to the ranch and told me about it. Would you let Sam out now? I'd like to get started for home. Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Baxton, but uh, I'm going to have to hold him for a while yet. But why, Marshal? What for? Well, Mr. Dillon, a few minutes ago you said yourself that... I you... said that he wasn't clear of this yet, Chester. You don't listen very close, Chester. No, sir, I... I sure don't. Marshal, you said that whoever killed Hopper killed Art Long, since they was both shot the very same way. Well, I know I did, ma'am, but uh, I've been thinking a lot about it, and I'm uh, just not sure yet. Even with the same thing happening again this morning? Well, i got to admit that does make a difference, all right. I suppose if one more man got killed like that, I wouldn't have any case at all against your husband. But uh, the way things are now, i got to hold him, ma'am. I'm... Sorry about it. Well, it's like I said, Marshal. You've got to do your duty. Yes, ma'am. If uh, there's anything I can do for you, Miss Baxton... Thank you, Marshal, but I'm all right. Can I see Sam before I start back? Uh, of course, ma'am. He's right through that door. I can't stay long. My, 
What's the matter, Chester? Oh, I was just thinking about how happy Miss Baxton looked when she first come in here. Yeah. Yeah, it's too bad. Uh, Chester. Hmm? You've been up on Ginger Creek since I have. Yes, sir. Isn't there another nester there, not far from Jim Fowler's cabin? A couple of miles beyond, there's one. I don't know his name, though. Oh, no, that, that doesn't matter. Uh, Chester, go get our horses, huh? And bring a horse for Sam Baxton, too. He's going to go up there with us. I don't know what you're up to, Marshal, but I'd rather be in jail than spending the night in this place. It's a nice little cabin he's got here, Baxton. Well, you improved it some when you sent him into Dodge for the night. It's almost daylight, Mr. Dillon. Okay, Chester. And I'm going to build a fire now and let whoever's waiting outside think his victims just got up. What makes you think he'll be there this morning, Marshal? Well, if he isn't, we'll stay here till he does come. If Mr. Dillon, you want me to pull the door open when you're ready? I'll tell you when, Chester. And after he gets off a couple of blasts with that shotgun, we'll go out and try to take him alive. All right, Baxton, you get over there with Chester. Mm. And I'll try to get this thing started. All we're going to need is a little smoke going up through the chimney. Maybe we can come back when it's all over and cook a little breakfast, Mr. Dillon. Now, we'll worry about breakfast later, Chester. Yes, sir. Here, Baxton, you stop that. What? Wait, he's got my gun, Mr. Dillon. You're standing in my way, Chester. Move! Oh, he got outside. Come on. Drop that gun, Baxton. I got him, Marshal. I hit him both times. Drop it, I said. All right. I was only helping out, Marshal. Look, he... He's laying right out there. Gosh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dillon. I never thought he'd try nothing like that. Walk ahead of me, Baxter. Oh, sure. Oh, Marshal. Look. It's my wife. Yeah. She's dead. I, I, I didn't know who it was, Marshal. I, I, I couldn't see who it was. How'd I know she was doing this? Going around killing people. Your wife shot Jim Fowler yesterday morning. I didn't know she hated Nestor's that much. Well, it's kind of hard to believe, Marshal. Yeah. But I guess you never know about a woman. Well, I can tell you about her, Baxton. Fowler's the only man she killed, and she didn't kill Fowler because she hated him. She did it because she loved you. What are you talking about? She was trying to cover up for you. Oh, wait a minute. She almost did it, too. She almost kept you from hanging. Until she claimed one of your cowhands saw Fowler's body. When I knew he'd already been buried. I had all the evidence I needed on her right then, Baxton. And the biggest mistake you made was killing her. I, I didn't know it was her. You knew. Well, what you forgot was that she'd have confessed to killing Long and Hoffer. Why would she? Because she loved you. Besides, she couldn't have been punished anymore for killing three men than for killing one. You got it all figured out, ain't you, Marshal? Yeah. Yeah, everything. Everything except how she could love a man like you. But then it's like you say. You never know about a woman.
Where are we going, Mr. Dillon? Well, I don't know where you're going, Chester, but I'm going to get myself a haircut. Say, I need a haircut, too. I cost two bits these days, you know. Well, I didn't say I was going to get one, Mr. Dillon. (laughs) Not till the weather gets hot, anyway. Well, I hope you're saving up for it, Chester. You know a man oughtn't to have to spend money on things like haircuts? Why don't you get married and let your wife cut it for you? Mr. Dillon, that'd be like buying a whole cow just to get one piece of steak. (laughs) You know, Chester, I got an idea. Your hair is going to get longer and longer. (laughs) Look... It's no more than down to my nose now. But... Oh. <laughs> Excuse me, mister. What's the matter with you? Can't you see good? I was looking at my hair. Well, maybe you could look at it easier if I scalped you. All right, now, just take your hand off that knife, mister. I said I was sorry. Anybody bumps into Lou Quiller better be sorry. Take it easy, mister. He didn't hurt you. Now, what are you cutting in on this for? There's enough fighting in Dodge without anything as silly as this. What do you care about how much fighting there is? That's my job. I'm a U.S. Marshal. Oh. Okay, Marshal. But you better keep your friend here off the streets before he gets himself killed. Did you say your name's Quiller? <laughs> you never heard it, Marshal. I ain't wanted nowhere. Maybe not. But the way you're going, you soon will be. Yeah. I'm going to get me a drink. Mean, ain't he? Yeah, he's just another hard case, Chester. Dodge is full of them. Well, here's the barber shop. I'll be back at the office in about a half hour. Yes, sir. Right over here, Marshal. Uh, hello, Teeter. You know, you are real lucky, Marshal. This place was full up an hour ago. Oh? You can hang your coat and stuff on the wall there. All That's right. right. Now, the rate you're going, Titus, Dodge will have a lot of pretty respectable-looking citizens by nightfall. A man ought to get his hair cut every month or so, Marshal. Yeah? I keep telling them all that. Here, let me get this sheet across you. Yeah. Here. They'd sooner go around looking like wild animals. And that's what they are, just plain wild animals. Is that so? They don't think of nothing, Marshal, but drinking and fighting and tearing things apart. Oh, have a chair, young fella. I'll be ready for you in a few minutes. I don't want a haircut, I want a shave. Well, I'll take care of you. Just hang your coat up right there next to Marshal Dillon's. Marshal Dillon? Are you really a marshal, mister? Yeah, that's right. Marshals and sheriffs are one of a kind. Killed my pa. That's what happened. Now, is that so? Now, who's your pa? My pa's dead. Back in Alamosa. I got a grudge against lawmen. And I got a grudge against all of them. Look, fella, why don't you sit down over there? Huh? You're awful drunk for so early in you the day. You shut up, barber. So that's your coat over there, huh, Marshal? Yes, it's his. It's going to be real easy. I think I'll shoot me a marshal. Watch. I got a gun under this sheet, fella. No, you ain't. It's pointing right at your belly. Your gun belt's hanging over there under your coat. You can't see it, can you? No. But it's there. You're gambling with your life, fella. You start for your gun and you're gonna die. I don't believe you. Now get out of here. Go on. Walk out that door. Slow now. Thought you was gonna have to kill him, sure, Marshal. Darn fool kid. It wouldn't have been easy, Teeters. What? I bluffed him. My gun's hanging under my coat over there. Is that so? <laughs> well, say that's great, Marshal. You sure made a fool of him. Wait till I tell everybody about this. <laughs> Forget about it, Teeters. You <laughs> what? Nobody likes to be made a fool of. Might drive that boy into doing something to try to prove he isn't one. Oh. Okay, Marshal, I won't say nothing. Yeah. Good. Hey, I 
let's go back. There's got to be out of this. All I heard was Georgie. Oh. Didn't hear a thing. Once, once again, we'll start from the top. Stand by. Oh, Sam, give me a beer, huh? Right up, Marshal. Evening, Matt. Hello, Kitty. Say, that's a nice dress. <laughs> Thanks. Mr. Jonas down the store ordered it for me. Huh? Just came in on the Santa Fe from Kansas City today. <laughs> you know, Mr. Jonas was going to order me a couple of vests. Uh-huh. That was last fall, I think. Uh, better let me order them for you. Uh, I'm afraid it wouldn't work. He'd smell a rat. You got a pretty country way of putting things, Matt. No wonder you have to carry a gun all the time. Here's your beer, Marshal. Oh, thank you, Sam. Oh, say, speaking of guns, I heard about you at the barber shop today. Oh, you did? Teeters has been telling everybody about it. Yeah, I told him to keep it quiet. Well, he should have. That boy's name's Dave Robbins. He was in here a while ago, and everybody was laughing at him about it. Yeah. He said he was going to dig Teeter's tongue out of his head. I think that's how he put it. When did he leave, Kitty? Just a little while ago. With that ornery-looking Lou Quiller. Quiller? Yeah. Now, how did they happen to get together? Do you think there might be trouble, Matt? <laughs> I better go find young Robbins, Kitty. I'll see you later. Sure. <laughs> Well, I finally located him, Mr. Dillon. Huh? He's right next there in the oasis. Yeah, he would be in the last bar we looked at. Is Quiller with him? Yes, sir. Yeah. There's Dave, Mr. Dillon. He's sitting alone now. Now, will you stay here, Chester? Yes, sir. Hello, Dave. How'd you know my name? I heard it. You mind if I sit down? Wouldn't do much good if I did, would it? Uh, Dave, tell me about your pa, huh? What happened to him that got you so mad? It's none of your business. Well, you were about to shoot me for it this afternoon. Nah, even drunk I wouldn't have shot you. Not like that. I was bluffing, too, Marshal, and I was awful drunk. I, uh, told the barber to shut up about all that, Dave. You did? Well, I kind of figured that you wouldn't be very proud of it. Why do you care how I'd feel? Dave, there are enough hard cases around now. A lot like Quiller over there. And you're about to become another one. Now, you leave Teeters to me. I'll talk to him. Stopping his talk now won't do any good... People are already laughing at me. Look, Dave, I've been bluffed myself. It's nothing to be ashamed of. No. Look, I, I, I'd still like to hear about your paw. Uh, you say a sheriff killed him out in Alamosa? Shot him in the back. Paw wasn't even armed. Well, why did he do it? Paw was on to him. There was a bank hold up and nobody got caught, Marshal. And then Paw found out the sheriff had some of the money. Oh, after the sheriff killed Pa, I started to tell people the truth about it. But they didn't believe me. He put a rope on my feet, Marshal, and dragged me out of town. Oh, well, that's bad, Dave. But uh, lawmen are like any other people. There are all different kinds. Maybe. Now, that, that's true. You think about it. Uh, and Dave, don't let... Quiller talk you into anything, huh? <laughs> and I'll have me some more of those chili peppers, Matt. <laughs> okay. There you are, Doc. 
Uh, thank you. Mm. You know, those peppers will make your hair straight, Doc. Oh, ten years ago, the matter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you must have been quite a lady killer then. Yeah, I still keep my end up, Matt. Yeah, but you're slowing down, Doc. I've been noticing it. Oh, is that so? How would you know anything about that? Well, uh... Word gets around. Oh, Matt, you're the biggest liar in Dodge. Outside of General Parsley Smith. <laughs> well, you think the general's a liar? He claims he was on Robert E. Lee's staff. Says he rode into the Shenandoah Valley with Lee back in 63. Well, maybe he did. Oh, maybe. You know what he really was, Matt? He was the regimental butcher. Well, you can't expect him to go around bragging about that the rest of his life. Mr. Dillon? Doc? Oh, yes, sir. I, I just come by the barbershop, Mr. Dillon. There's quite a crowd outside. Oh, well, what for? Well, sir, I got to look through the window, and Teeters is laying there with blood all over him. He looks dead to me. What? Young Dave Robbins is laying there, too. I think they went and killed each other. All right, let the doc through here, please, will you? Yeah, let me through. Pardon me, please. Will you let us through? I, I think the door is locked, Mr. Dillon. Stand back a little, I'll kick it over. Stand back, Stand Okay, doc, go on in. All right. Chester, huh? you stay by the door and keep everybody off. Yes, sir. All right, Looks like they had quite a fight here, Matt. Well, let's find out if they're dead, Doc. Take a look at Teeters first. All right, we'll see. Now. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Yes, I thought so. What? He's got a broken jaw, man. Well, that wouldn't kill him. His neck's broken, too. And he's dead. Oh, poor fella. All right, let's look at Dave Robbins here. Uh, let's see. Uh, he isn't dead. I can see him breathing. Let's see. Got a lump on the back of his head, that's all. Here, Dave, Dave, Dave. Oh. Wake, up. Wake up. Oh, yes. Oh, he must have oh. fallen and hit his head, Matt. Open your eyes, Dave. Oh. Doc. Doc. Yes, you're all right here. Just sit up a little bit here. Oh. He hit me, Doc. He hit me with his gun. There's no gun here, Dave, except yours. And I think I better take that right now. Marshal, Teeters is dead, ain't he? Yeah, he's dead. You must have hit him awful hard, Dave. You broke his neck. I didn't hit him. I tried to stop it. What happened, Dave? I didn't want to come here at all. But Quiller talked me into it. Quiller, huh? Yeah, he said we'd scare him a little and make him stop talking about me. But then Teeters didn't scare, and Quiller started beating him up. I tried to stop him, Marshal. Well, you're the one that's been threatening Teeters, Dave. What's Quiller care about him? I don't know. I don't know why he did it. Mm, you're going to have a hard time convincing anybody of that story, Dave. You believe me, Marshal? If we find Quiller, I'll know whether to believe you or not. He won't be in Dodge. Not now. Well, you got any idea where he might be? Well, he said something once about a deserted cabin he'd found up on Walnut Creek. But I don't even know where that is. I do. We'll look around Dodge first, and then we'll ride north. You mean you're taking me with you, Marshal? One of you is going to hang for murder, Dave. And as soon as we find Quiller, I'll know which one. Hey, maybe Quiller ain't running at all, Mr. Dillon. Maybe he was coming up here anyway. No reason why he should run. He isn't guilty, Chester. I might have known nobody'd believe me. Nobody ever has. Oh, you ain't hung yet, Dave. Hey, look. There's a cabin. The one Quiller told me about is hid under a bluff of some kind. Well, there's people in this one. A woman out back there. See her? It's not much of a cabin. I don't think they've even finished building it. Well, it looks like somebody drove a herd of cattle over it. I swear and declare, some people just ain't got any pride. Imagine keeping a woman in a shack like that. What's she planting, you suppose? Whatever it is, it won't grow. I don't see no water around here. Hold on, boy. Oh. oh. 
Let's leave the horses here. Look at that horse out there, Mr. Dillon. If that ain't the sorriest animal I ever laid eyes on. That horse is bedrock, Chester. Somebody's rode him too hard. Well, then they ought to shoot him. Uh, hello, ma'am. Who are you? Uh, my name's Dillon, ma'am. Is, uh, your husband around? No. He ain't around. Not no more. Not since this morning. Oh. Uh, is that a grave you're digging, ma'am? I made it real deep. I didn't want no sign of a grave here. Well, what happened to him? How'd he die? Man killed him. What? Rode by here this morning and killed him. Who rode by and killed him? I don't know. What difference does it make? Look, ma'am, I'm a lawman. I'm a U.S. Marshal. Now, will you tell me what happened, please? A Marshal, huh? You catch him and hang him, Marshal, but it won't bring my husband back. I gotta live here all alone now. I ain't even got a baby. I always wanted a baby. Can you tell me what the man looked like, ma'am? He come out on that horse out there. He took ours. My husband didn't want him to. He tried to stop him. I'll bet it was Quiller, Mr. Dillon. He's that mean. Was he a tall man, a black mustache, carrying a bowie knife in his gun belt? A knife. That's what he killed my husband with. Said he wouldn't waste a bullet on a dirt farmer. It sure sounds like him. Maybe you'll believe me now, Marshal. Quiller knows he can't hang twice. What's he care how many men he kills? Was he still heading north when he left here, ma'am? Over that way, Marshal. I stood here and watched him till he was plumb out of sight. Yeah. Well, uh, is there anything that we can do for you? Bring the horse back unless he's ruined him like he done that one there. You'll have a horse, ma'am, I promise you. We'll stop on our way back. Goodbye. Don't bring that man here. I don't want to see him. All right, ma'am. I won't. Oh, that poor woman. He killed Teeters, too. You believe me now, don't you, Marshal? Just because he killed this man don't prove he killed Teeters, Dave. Now, wait till we find him. He'll own up to it. He's got to. He might, Dave, if we can take him alive. Oh, if you don't take him alive, then, then I'm in a bad spot, ain't I? Let's find that cabin before it gets dark. Ain't he ever coming back, Chester? Mr. Dillon knows what he's doing, Dave. Doggone to take it easy. Yeah, sure. Now, I got nothing to worry about. Yeah. There he comes now. We sit here too long, Quiller is sure to get wind of us. No, he ain't. He's probably laying around that cabin thinking he's safe as if he's in Texas. What'd you find, Marshal? Well, he's there, all right, but he's getting ready to move on. How you know? He's saddling his horse. Well, how are we going to stop him? Without shooting him, I mean. That's a long chance, but maybe we can surprise him and get the drop on him. Now, we're going to have to split up, Chester. One of us will wait on this side, and the other will have to go across the top of that bluff and wait on the other. All right, sir, I'll go. No. No, you stay with me, Chester. What? Dave, here's your gun. My gun? Take it. I don't understand, Marshal. You go across the bluff. We'll wait for him if he rides out that way. How do you know I won't warn him and take sides with him? I don't know, Dave. Now get moving. Okay. Mr. Dillon, you're, you're, you're taking an awful chance. He's got his choice, Chester. If he makes the right one this time, he just might go on making them. It's worth the chance. Now come on, let's get over there. Chester, this is far enough. Quiller's getting on his horse. 
If he rides this way, we'll throw down on him at the same time. He might be surprised enough to give up. He's mounted. Yeah. Hope, look. He's going the other way. I sure hope Dave's going to stop it. There he is. Hold it, Fuller. Get your hands up. No, you don't. Come on, Chester. He killed him. He went for his gun, Marshal. You shot him right in the head, Dave. He'd have killed me if I hadn't. Yeah. But now I... I can't prove nothing about Teeters. Maybe I should have let him shoot me. It sure beats hanging. Uh, I can't win no how, Marshal. You could have warned him, Dave. It'd have been a fight with Chester and me, but you might have won that. I know. I was thinking about it all the time I was crossing the top of that bluff. Maybe I should have. But it's too late now. Here's my gun, Marshal. Now, keep your gun, Dave. Keep it? I believe you about Teeters. Marshal, I... I... I believed you right from the start, but I wanted you to prove something to yourself, Dave. And I think you have. Marshal, I... I'd kind of like to go back to Dodge with you. Maybe show everybody I ain't what they thought. Good, Dave. We'll be there by morning. to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. Transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Mr. Dillon, like you said. Oh, good, Chester. They was the sorriest looking cowboys I ever did see. <laughs> I guess I didn't really hurt any of them, Chester. Well, so being banged on the head with a six gun ain't the gentlest way to end the evening's pleasure. <laughs> now they'll live. Yeah, they've been taking their pleasure too seriously. Yes, sir, but things quieted down a little last night after you locked up them five. There might have been real trouble otherwise. My, I just don't know what's got into everybody lately, Mr. Dillon. Well, it goes like that, Justin. Things will be peaceful enough for a while till some wild outfit like this drag our herd hits down. Then you got to come down on them hard and fast before they really get the bit in their teeth. <laughs> you sure did last night. <laughs> well, it isn't over yet. You, Marshal Dillon... Yeah, I am. My name's Rance. Well, I'm glad to know you, Rance. I bossed the drag our herd up here from down around Matagorda. That's in Texas, Marshal. Yeah, I've been there. You have? Well, you better not go back. Oh? We might give you the kind of welcome you're giving us. What's your complaint, Rance? Buffalo and my men. Five of them come into camp this morning with blood in their hair. They said you'd done it. Yeah, yeah, I did. And if I hadn't, they might have been shot. Or shot somebody else. Yeah, it's a good thing for you. You took them on one at a time. I'd have taken them anyway. 
Look, Rance, this town was on the edge of a riot last night. I stopped it. And I stopped it without any killing. It's a man's own business. He wants to pull out his gun. Uh-uh. Not around here, it isn't. Marshal, I can't ask men to come up the trail the way they do and take to drinking soda water and talking in whispers. What kind of a town is this, anyway? It's a good town. And you and your men can drink and gamble all they want in it. But they can't shoot the mirror off the wall at the Alafraganza, and they can't grab town women on the street. They can't break the bartender's arm in the oasis, and they can't offer to shoot anyone that tries to stop them. It isn't that kind of a town. Well, sure, it may get a little frisky, but there's no harm in it, I can see. And sooner or later, it'll lead to killing. You know, i got to draw the line somewhere. So do I, Marshal. Huh? What do you mean? I mean I won't drive cattle to Dodge no more. Now I'll spread the words of no good town. And you people can live off sodbusters and buffalo hunters. This place will starve to death. I'm hired to keep the peace, Rance. Any way I can. Keep it, then. We won't bother Dodge no more. Goodbye, Marshal. You want me to go in with you, Mr. Dillon? Uh, no. No, Chester. You, you better wait outside. Okay, sir. What do you think they're up to, anyway? Well, Green told you it was a businessmen's meeting, didn't he? Yes, sir. And I expect they're worried about business. Ah, here we are. I'll, uh, I'll be out shortly. Yes, sir. Mr. Green. Hello, Marshal. Gentlemen. Hello, Marshal. Well, Mr. Green, you asked me to come here. Uh, yes, uh, we all did, Marshal. Uh, uh, Mr. Pepper and Mr. Howe and, and uh, well, all of us. Uh, practically every man who does business in Dodge is here. Uh-huh. I don't see Rance. He says he does business here, too. He sure does. That's what we want to talk about. Well, go ahead. <clears throat> well, uh, we've had a meeting, Marshal, and uh, we've decided you've got to go easier on these cowboys. No. Uh-huh. Why, gentlemen? We can't afford to lose all that business. That's why. That's right. Oh, there's always some trouble the first day or so after a herd reaches Dodge. All I do is buffalo a few of the wildest, and gradually the rest of the cowboys calm down a little bit. But they won't stand for your slugging men and, and, and throwing them in jail. Nobody got killed last night, did they? But th- that isn't the, the point. Well, according to the law, it's a pretty good point, Mr. Green. The law is a fine thing, Marshal. But we're also interested in business. That's right. You're scared. Because one hard-headed trail boss has threatened you, huh? They're not all like ranch, you know. Well, there, there, there's no use to argue, Marshal. We've we got our minds made up. You're just too rough with those men. Uh-huh. Tell me something, Mr. Green. Would you like to run this town? Why, I don't know. Of course not. No, not me, but, uh, well, we thought maybe if you'd kind of leave Dodge alone and do your work in the country, then we'd hire somebody the cowboys here'd take to a little better. Eh, uh, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do. It's a good thing for me I'm employed by the government, isn't it? No, no, Marshal, we're just making a suggestion, sort of. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. You know what, Mr. Green? You men are all acting like fools. You're the one. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But there's only one way you're going to learn. 
Well, gentlemen, I won't make any more arrests and dodge until you come and ask me to. It's your town, and you can blow it right off the map if you want to. Good day. I got mail, Mr. Dillon. What there was. Well, I'll look at it later, Chester. I'm going to have a lot of time. Yes, sir. But you just wait till the word gets out the Dodge is wide open. There's going to be nothing but trouble. Yeah, maybe. But this is the only way I can handle it. They won't listen to me otherwise. Excuse me, Marshal. Well, well, what for? Well, I I don't want to bother you none, but I thought I'd better come and see you. Well, you're not bothering me. I sure hope not. Well, what can I do for you? Marshal, you don't know me, but... I've heard about you. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people have lately. Uh, I know. M- Mar- Marshal, I... I... Well, go ahead, mister. There's nothing to be afraid of. <clears throat> uh, I'm the new constable. What? The the new constable. They picked me. I, I had to take it, Marshal. I'm so broken all. <laughs> you sound like you're apologizing. Well, I guess I am. Well, I didn't want you to be mad at me. I, I needed the money, and that's why I'm doing it. That's all right. Somebody had to take the job. I just didn't know they were going to call it constable. Well, they want it to sound as peaceful as possible, I guess. Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Well, what's your name, mister? Willard. Willard? Yes, sir. Willard Bann. Now, yeah. well, where are you from, Willard? Well, sir, I used to be a cowboy, but... And then I got so fat and all. I just sort of work around wherever I can. I, <clears throat> I've been awful broke. Yeah, you mentioned that. Yes, sir. How come you're not wearing a gun? Well, shucks, Marshal, I don't never wear no gun. I, I don't even know how to use one very good. Well, then you're a whole lot better off without one. I don't aim to get in any fights, Marshal. If there's any trouble, maybe I can just sort of uh, talk them out of it. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> Maybe. Well, well, then I uh, wish you a lot of luck. Well, thanks. I, I got to be going now, Marshal. I'm on pay already. So long. Um, uh, so long, Marshal. Uh, so long, Mister. Uh, so long. Oh my goodness, Mister Dillon. Yeah, I agree, Chester. They will ruin that poor fellow if he tries to stop him. Uh, he won't even raise his voice against him. But they sure might ruin Dodge. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, show a profit on your patriotism. Buy United States savings bonds. Buy them regularly at your bank or where you work through the payroll savings plan. If you're looking for an investment, what better investment can you make than one that makes your country secure? U.S. savings bonds help Uncle Sam foot the bill for defense, cut into inflationary trends, make purchasers equal partners with the government in running the country. Buy United States savings bonds, paying 3% interest when held to maturity, and show a profit on your patriotism. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. government paid for my office and the jail behind it, so I stayed there. I was sure that Constable Willard Band, broke and fat and humble, wasn't going to manhandle any randy Texas cowboys and throw them behind bars. And the first 24 hours passed peacefully enough. The drag our outfit was busy moving their herd across the Arkansas and didn't get into town. But the next day, a new herd arrived, and that night it seemed like all the Texas had come to Dodge. By midnight, no man, unless he was armed and ready to fight, should have been on the street. It was Doc who told us what it was like when he came into the office where Chester and I were sitting it out playing a little two-handed 21. Oh, it's a fine thing when the U.S. Marshal holds up in his office. 
when men are getting shot up and knived all over town. Well, I hope that's not true, Doc. It is true. I just come back from trying to save the second victim. The first one's already dead. Cowboys or citizens? Cowboys. If they'd have been citizens, I suppose those dundee heads would have been in here on their knees begging you for help. I don't want them on their knees. Oh, I know, Matt, but it's getting worse. Why, that last fellow, they wouldn't even let me bring him back to my office. They said he might as well die right there on the floor of the Texas Trail. They did? They sure did. And they ran me right out of there. They what? They took me by the arms and they half carried me as far as the door. Well, who is it? I called them everything I could think of while they were doing it. You think that man's dead yet, Doc? He will be soon. If I don't get into where I can work on him. All right, we're going over there and get him. Come on, Chester. Yes, sir. I told him I wouldn't make any arrests, and I won't. But nobody's going to stand between Doc and a wounded man. Uh You get in the middle, Doc. Yeah, I wish there was a tunnel under the street. I don't see one anywhere. He ought to be out here talking his head off if that's his plan. He's lucky if he doesn't get hung tonight. Watch your gun, Chester. Don't let anybody grab it. No, sir, I'm carrying my hand on it, Mr. Dillon. He's right over there, Matt. Flying in front of the bar. All right. All right, get up. Come on, make room here. Move, will you? All right, go ahead, Doc. See if he's still alive. All right. Let me, let me look at him here. He, oh. oh, he doesn't look very good. I thought you'd quit, Marshal. I haven't quit, Rats. What are you doing here, then? A man's dying. It was a fair fight. We believe in dying where we fall, Marshal. We don't need no help. I won't even argue with you, Rance, but the first man that interferes with Doc's gonna die on his feet. And if you can't understand it any other way, just put it to Doc's a friend of mine. Is that clear enough for you? Now, now, men, let's don't have no trouble in here. Let's talk it over and settle this thing peacefully. Yeah. Oh, uh, it, it, it's you, huh, Marshal? Hello, Willard. Well, uh, I'm having a terrible time, Marshal. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, Matt... How is he, Doc? Yeah, he's bad. But I just might save him. Okay, Doc. Willard? Uh, yes, sir. Help Chester carry the man over to Doc's office. Huh? Uh, sure, Marshal, sure. Leave him be, Constable. That's enough, Rance. Let him die in peace, I say. Rance, I'd throw you in jail, but I said I wouldn't make any arrests. And why don't you get out of here while you still can? Now get up! All right! Now I'll shoot the first man that touches a gun! All right, Chester, Willard, get moving. You lead the way, Doc. I guess all right, Doc. Let's hurry! That man won't live long if we don't. Two o'clock in the morning, and the crowd's thicker than ever, Mr. Dillon. Come over here and take a look. Yeah. Another hour, and they'll really be out of hand. Yep. Hey, look yonder, Mr. Dillon. There's Miss Kitty coming across the street. What? Wait here, Chester. Let's get out the street. Come on. Oh, phew. It's getting worse. Hello, Chester. Hello, Miss Kitty. You shouldn't have gone out in the street, Kitty. Oh, it's no worse than the Texas Trail. Then you ought to go home. I am. I'm all through till somebody put the lid on this town. That ranch is over there right now, Matt, getting drunk and calling for blood. There's been enough blood around here already. Uh, how is he, the one you got out of there? Well, Doc was down a while ago. Said he took the bullet out and he thinks he has a chance now. Oh, good. You say Rance is working up trouble? Yeah, he's trying. I guess he didn't take to your bashing him on the head. Well, it quieted things down for a little while, anyway. They sure got that poor constable treed, Willard, what's his name? Mm, he's a nice fellow. I hope they don't hurt him none. When I left, they had him dancing on the bar. He looked about to cry. Well, that's harder on the bar and tis on Willard. He's about the one fattest peace officer I ever did see. 
It's going to be fatter than ever after tonight. Every time he opens his mouth to talk, somebody pours a glass of beer down him. My. It's sort of pitiful, Matt. Yeah, it's worse than not kidding. I know. That's why I got out of there. You can kind of feel when a crowd like that starts to get real mean. Mm, I guess just listen to him out there. I'm not even staying in town tonight. I'm going out to Moss Snyder's. That's a good idea, Kitty. Uh, Chester, you go along with her, huh? All right, sir. I better stick around. Well, what's Mr. Green and Mr. Pepper and... Look at Willie. Uh, fellow beat me up. He beat me up bad. He certainly did. Uh, and, and Marshall, we come here to ask you... Wait a minute, Mr. Green. Chester, take Willie up to Doc, oh, son. Yes, sir, I sure will. Come on, Willie. Oh, thank you. And then come back here for Kitty. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Green. He wanted to ask me something. You've got to stop, Marshal. Another man's been killed. Mr. Howe's brother. He caught a stray bullet out back of the Longhorn. I'm sorry to hear that. I wondered why Mr. Howe wasn't here. Uh, he told me to tell you that he'll trust your judgment from now on. Uh, we shouldn't have interfered, Marshal. But we're all behind you now, ain't we, gentlemen? Yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll do something, won't you, Marshal? All right. It's pretty late, but I'll try. Oh, thank you, Marshal. And I'll start with Rance. He's the worst of the lot. I'll go get him and throw him in jail. But before I go, I want every saloon keeper in Dodge to put out his lights and close up. Now, you gentlemen will have to pass the word for that. I don't want to be seen till I go for a rant. Oh, we'll do it, Marshal. We'll do it right now. Yeah. All right, then get going before it's too late. waited for half an hour while Green and the others spread the word to close up the saloons. The lights gradually went out, up and down the street. And I left the office, alone. I found Rance in front of the Texas Trail, and I was able to reach him before I was recognized. Uh, Marshall's back. Let's shoot him, man. You better get out of here, Marshal. We ain't in no mood to fool. Neither am I. The street's closed, Rance. Now go on back to your camp. We ain't going nowhere. It'll open up again tomorrow night. Now you're welcome to come back then. There won't be no town by tomorrow. Yeah. Let's set it afire, man. Rance, shut up. I won't shut up. You're going to jail. I'm um, what? Leave him be, my... You want to fight, mister? Rance is too drunk. He wouldn't have a chance, but you might. He's right, Pete. I'd never make it. You draw on him. Go on, shoot him. Well, I'm waiting, cowboy. I ain't no gunfighter. Go on, you coward. No. Why should I die? This ain't my business anyway. Mm, somebody do it, then. I'll fight any man here. And I'll fight him fair. Not me. No, I don't mean me. Then I'll have to try it myself. Don't do it, Ranch. He'll kill you. Get out of my way. No, you don't. No, no. Give me that gun, Pete. I'll keep your gun. Give me it. Cut it out, Ranch, or I'll slug you. Now, that was smart of you, mister. But he's still going to jail. You got a lot of nerve, Marshal, bucking a crowd like this. I'm not bucking a crowd. I'm one man. Against any other one man here. You cowboys aren't built that way. I've been in Texas, too, mister. Mm -hmm. Guess you win, Marshal. Uh, it looks that way. All right. Now, do you want to take Rance to jail, or do you want me to do it? Well, his head might be less lumpy tomorrow if I do it, Marshal. Start walking, Rance.
Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Jack Crucian, John Daner, Joseph Kearns, Fred Mackay, and Vic Perrin. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Here, Van Heflin is one of America's most notorious criminals in a thrilling fact drama titled The Last Days of John Dillinger. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills, suspense, traces Dillinger's last daring escape, his desperate last resort of plastic surgery to change his appearance, and finally, his involvement with two women who brought him trouble and disaster. Hear it all on CBS Radio's Suspense, Monday night on most of these same stations. George Walsh speaking. You ride a real squad car with Night Watch, Mondays on the CBS Radio Network.